Ruby is a simple human, carefree, with no plans for the future. She lives in the moment, regardless of the consequences her reckless actions bring. At just 17 years old, the world and her future matter little to her, and it's all about having fun. Ethan, however, isn't human. He was over 500 years ago. His dark past haunts him more every day, and he fears that it will catch up with him. He refuses to consider humans as anything more than a piece of meat, they are worth nothing to him, not even a minute of his time. However, after their two worlds collide, Ethan will want to do anything to earn Ruby's trust. Can Ruby break all the walls Ethan has built in his long life? Will Ethan's past catch up with him? No matter how fast, you can never run away from your own past, however, does that mean you can't heal? Before you begin, I would like to invite you to sign up to my newsletter. You can expect to be noticed about new releases, sequels, bonus chapters, and even get free advanced copies. Click on the link down in the description. You can also find the links to the paperback and the ebook version of this book there. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, I will be posting new books every week. Without further ado, let's get this started. 01 Club, Sex and Alcohol. 02 Ethan and Nix. 03 A Dark Past. 04 Jealousy. 05 A Lonely Kid. 06 A Cryptic Message. 07 Bipolar. 08 Blood Link. 09 Captive. 10 Save Me. 11 Decisions. 12 I Can't Do It Without You. 13 Nightmares. 14 Harsh. 15 Monster. 16 Bloodbath. 17 Far From The End. ATERNATE -E Ending Part Number 1. ATERNATE -E Ending Part Number 2. 01 Club, Sex and Alcohol. Damn it, Ruby, this is all your fault, Minerva said to her best friend. Unfortunately, they hadn't been allowed into the bar for the second time that night, but still, Ruby wasn't going to give up that easily. She wanted to go out and get drunk. She want D to hook up with some hot guy. She WNTED to have the best night ever and nobody was gonna stop her. Relax, she tried to calm her down. We still have one more bar, it's only 1am and I promised Nix to see him there. She spoke brokenly since they have been walking through the dark streets since 40 minutes ago. Nix was both girls' best friend, the three had known each other for more than 10 years. Since the moment they first saw each other, they never separated again. They've had their big fights, but they would still never get away from each other from too long. Even thinking about not sharing fun moments together would give them chills. Nix's real name was Phoenix, but he didn't like his name at all, and every time the girls would ask him why, he just said, because, marking the end of the conversation. None of them made a big deal out of it, what's more, Ruby came up with a nickname for him, and all three loved it. How long will it take to get to that club? Axed her friend exhausted. She was already afraid of being on those dark streets, it was dim and deserted. It was definitely not the place for two young girls, wearing short skirts and tightened t-shirts, plus the fact that they both were wearing high heels, so it would be difficult for them to run if danger was present. Ruby didn't respond immediately, she just kept walking for a few more minutes, always steps ahead of her friend, not because she was mad with her or something, but to make sure they're in the right place and that her friend wouldn't scold her for getting lost. Five minutes passed, and Minerva was still waiting for an answer from her friend, already tired of waiting, she opened her mouth a little to call her name, but she was interrupted in the middle. We arrived. A smile was drawn across her lips. They hadn't even come in, and they could already smell the scent of alcohol and sex. That night was going to be the best of their life, and no one was going to take it from them. Ruby had already sent Nix two messages to meet at the club's door. He had told Minerva to come inside and enjoy the moment, and they would meet in an hour. Ruby had hesitated at first, but when she saw how a pretty handsome boy was entering, she completely changed her mind and sneaked in, but not before sending a look to her friend, telling her to check him out. It wasn't cold at all, but even so Ruby pulled the leather jacket that sheltered her closer to her body. She didn't like that place very much, but what difference did it make? 
Life was short and every minute was worth risking, as they say, good memories come from bad decisions. Why so lonely pretty? Nix's voice echoed through the club entrance. Ruby turned to face him and feigned a frightened face. Please. She yelled, don't kill me, mysterious stud. She pretended to faint and fell into Nix's arms, he just laughed and tried to balance with the weight of his friend along with his glass half full of vodka. Ruby took advantage of the moment of distraction of her friend and snatched the glass from his hand, brought it to her full crimson red lips and drank its entire contents and then winced at the burning in her throat. Nick stared at her for a few seconds, stunned, how could she have drunk all that and not be passed out on the floor? Ruby stared at him and laughed. Stop being so obvious, I know you were impressed. Years of experience. She joked. Let's dance. And with that, she grabbed Nix's hand and dragged him onto the dance floor. The three of them were already killing it on the dance floor. Ruby's alcohol was already creeping into her system. She felt slightly dizzy, not to say she felt like she was gonna fall at any moment, and on to of that, she had an incredible urge to go to the bathroom. I'll go to the bathroom, I'll be right back. She shouted. They both looked at their friend confused, clearly they had not heard what she had said. As Nix approached Ruby to hear her better, Minerva watched him closely. Nix was very handsome and his body, for a 17-year-old, was incredibly muscular and well-toned. He was quite tall, his strong arms could be seen from more than 20 meters away, and not to mention his hard abs. His fingers were covered in calluses and cuts, but he said it was from the sports he played, but that didn't make him any less cute at all. His dark blonde hair suits his deep amber eyes perfectly. And she couldn't help but to think how sexy he looked with his hair, all sweaty from the dancing, pushed back and sort of messy. She guessed that surely everyone, including herself, should be the same by now. Her best friend Ruby had her brown wavy hair tousled around her shoulders, from the distance she was standing, she could see they were pretty messy as well. They had already been dancing for two hours straight, in a place where you can barely breathe properly, due to all the smoke that made its way through the air. She could only pray that it was just tobacco smoke. She was so absorbed in her thoughts that she didn't realize that Nix was trying to talk to her. What? A nervous scream reached Nix's ears with an incredible volume. He smiled at her and replied, Ruby wants to go to the bathroom, but I doubt she will make it if she goes alone. Nix started yelling at Minerva, while Ruby amused herself by waving her hands. I'll go with her. Stay here, when I come back I want to see you right here. Nix was very possessive and protective when it came to them, he couldn't help it, they were like his little sisters. Ready? Nix asked Ruby for the tenth time. It was taking too long to just throw up all the alcohol that she had ingested. Has she fainted? Nix wondered. He couldn't hold his question for long as he entered the small bathroom, basically knocking the door, and there she was, she had literally fallen asleep in the corner, leaning against the wall. She shook her friend by the shoulders, and she woke up on the second try. What are you doing? You better be careful I'm a ninja, Ruby screamed when she felt the pressure on her shoulders. Her friend could do nothing but laugh. He laughed for a few minutes and looked at her. Seriously? A fucking ninja. He questioned her. Shut up, I was under pressure. She gave his friend one of her best smiles. Come on, Minerva must be worried. It was already five in the morning, and Ruby was exhausted. Nix had run off to find Minerva because she disappeared with an unknown boy, leaving her alone on the dance floor. She waited for him for a few minutes, but got tired of being alone for so long, so she had decided to go home. Why isn't there a taxi? She murmured to herself. She was already tired of waiting for Nix to show up with Minerva, and now she had to wait for a damn taxi to show up. Another 15 minutes of waiting. Angry and determined, she considered walking home. She doubted that she could get there without complications, since the alcohol basically prevented her from thinking well, but D-I-N-D-N-T care at this point. Maybe for the same reasons. Fuck it, she said to herself, and a tarted walking, trying to do it as straight as she could. She had already walked for about five blocks, and she was already lost. 
Her feet ached from the high heels that were already bothering her. She kicked off her shoes and walked slowly and cautiously. Equals I'd rather step on some odd glass or metal and die of tetanus than walk in those shoes for another minute. Shit. She screamed when she felt a glass embedded in her bare skin. Fuck. This can't get any better, can it? And just when she thought nothing could get worse, well it did. She sensed someone else's presence on the deserted street. Sneaking around, she found three men behind her, about twenty yards from her. She began to walk faster than normal, almost trotting, and noticed that the three men increased their pace, the same as hers or faster. She realized that she was going to get nowhere if she spent the rest of the night trying to escape, they would get her one way or another, anyway, she couldn't run and she was lost, she could not go to the safety of her home. She stopped short and turned around. What are you waiting for? Come grab me you damn pedophiles. She yelled at the three men and then raised her middle finger, an action that the men liked, since they were much more amused by a girl with personality than a shy one. They headed towards her, running at full speed like a cougar chasing a baby antelope. Ruby closed her eyes, hoping it would all end quickly. Just when she lost hope of her salvation, she heard a car engine speeding toward her location. She opened her eyes to find an Aston Martin, his favorite brand of cars but the most expensive at the same time, parked on the sidewalk. A young guy got out of this, he had dark jeans and a dull black tight t-shirt. You shouldn't have tried to do that or even consider it, the young man told them dryly, and then gave them a wide smile, showing his perfect white teeth. Ruby was astonished as a random guy, with about as much muscle and same height as Nick's, easily defeated three men with fast and precise movements, as if he was a complete expert at what he was doing. When he finished his task, he approached the weak and confused girl he had saved. What is your name? He asked her relaxedly. Ruby was surprised to see how his breathing was completely normal. There was no indication that he had undergone such physical movement seconds ago. A Ruby, she stammered. Well, Ruby, he started to say, my name is Ethan. They looked at each other fixedly, neither wanted to lower their gaze. I am glad to know you're okay, I hope we meet again. The mysterious guy gave his best smile to the still nervous and scared Ruby, and headed towards his car. Are you going to leave me here alone? Ruby yelled at him. She was terrified that men would regain consciousness in the absence of her hero. Your friend will be here any minute, and you will tell him that some policeman saved you. He got into his car and started at full speed, leaving Ruby alone with only the noise of the echo of his car engine. Just as Ethan predicted, it didn't take long for Nix's car to appear in Ruby's field of vision. Where have you been? Nix got out of the car quickly, looking genuinely worried and desperate, and ran up to his best friend. He patted her on all sides, making sure she wasn't hurt. The brunette noticed that Nix tensed just when he smelled her, but she guessed it was because of the smell of alcohol that she must have. Her friend moved a few inches away from her, looked at her doubtfully, and spoke. Who have you been with? He whispered, trying to make eye contact with the blue-eyed girl. Ruby was looking at the floor. She was in shock. She had never been so afraid in her life, she had never felt so helpless in the face of a situation. Tell me who has been close to you in the last minutes. Nix turned desperately to her, taking her shoulders with more force than necessary. Her friend tensed for a few seconds from the sudden scream and burst into tears. The young man, sorry for having scared her, hugged her tightly, putting Ruby's head on his neck. It's over. It's over. He repeated for a few minutes, until Ruby sat up. She removed the smudged makeup from her eyes, and said in a tone so serious that she was surprised even herself. I want you to teach me to defend myself, I will never go through something like this again. Nix nodded, understanding the situation her best friend would get into. What they did not know was that someone was listening to them, and that he had left happily with a remarkable smile on his face when he heard the last words of the human. She was strong and he loved that. O2 Athan and Nix My God, tell me everything. Minerva was yelling at Ruby excitedly. 
Both friends were in a cafe at the mall. The two were still exhausted due to last night, especially Ruby, but they had to gossip about everything that happened last night. I've already told you twice, Ruby complained, although she actually loved telling how Ethan saved her from those pervs, but she couldn't help feeling a little scared when she remembered. And what was that about Nix's reaction? Ruby had also told her what happened with Nix, that is, how he had gone crazy. He smelled her, dragged her to the car, and tried to convince her to sleep at his house. It is not that she has never stayed to sleep at his best friend's place, it is that suddenly, he looked really concerned and very worried. Ruby accepted. But still was very confused about his behavior. I don't know, she admitted doubtfully. But he didn't look happy at all, and when I woke up in the middle of the night, he was awake, thinking, and walking around like he was really nervous. Both friends fell silent when they saw their friend enter the cafeteria. He looked cute as always, tousled blonde hair, tight black shirt that highlighted his muscles along with some black pants. Nick's always dressed in dark clothes and they fit him really well. Minerva motioned for him to come closer, and he did so with a smile on his face. Were they talking about me? He erased the smile from the girls' faces, leaving them surprised, do you really think I don't realize when they talk about me? They both nervously laughed loudly, drawing the attention of all the people in the cafeteria. Minerva looked down in shame until Ruby spoke. Yes, Mr. Phoenix Hammond. She stuck her tongue out mocking him. Nix clenched his fists, furious. I was about to respond with some insult until the waitress arrived, with clear intentions to attract his attention. Good morning, she spoke in a seductive voice. Both friends looked at her confused, it was barely 12 o'clock, it was still early and the waitress was already flirting. Do you want something to drink? She stared at Nix, implying that the question was going directly to him and not his companions. Ruby noticed Minerva stiffen. Now a new and great doubt would haunt her head, did Minerva like Nix, and what's worse, she didn't tell her? That offended her at first, but after she thought about it, she might be ashamed to admit that she liked her best friend, that considered her like his little sister. Nix looked at the waitress for a few seconds, gave her a big smile that caused her to blush strongly. A coffee would be fine for now. He fixated his sight on the waitress's sign that said her name, Julie he murmured and shamelessly winked at her. The waitress basically ran off to make coffee, her face dyed red. The two friends burst out laughing, although you could tell that Minerva's was a bit fake, as she tried to hide her feelings with great need. Nix looked at them angrily and then laughed. The next few minutes were spent talking about last night until Minerva announced that she was going to the bathroom. Nix, Ruby began shyly. What happened yesterday? I mean, what had you worried like that? The blonde who was calmly drinking his coffee choked and started coughing like crazy, making his friend laugh at his situation. I, I was worried, I didn't know where you were and then I find you alone in a damn dark street and with three unconscious guys on the floor next to you. He smiled at her. That answer did not convince her much, but as far as she knew the reaction his friend had had was normal, or so she thought. I mean what friend wouldn't be surprised to find what they found? She was about to answer him, but he saw that Minerva was approaching so she quickly changed the subject, and when she arrived, she began to talk to Nix about a subject that the brunette was not interested in. Ruby was distracted in her mind, thinking about anything, not paying attention to the chatter of her friends. She felt that someone would not stop watching her and to her surprise, there he was. There was Ethan. She got up from the table and lied that she was going to the bathroom. Nix looked at her curiously and made a comment about the weak bladder women had. He left the cafeteria and walked over to Ethan. What are you doing here? Ruby's voice was barely distinguishable from all the hubbub of the people in the mall, so she had to get a little closer than she wanted to in order to hear his response. He was wearing a dark gray t-shirt, along with black pants and a black leather jacket. His black sunglasses made him stand out even more, since they were in a closed place where the sunlight was weak. Watching you. Neither of them expected that answer, not even himself. Ruby stared at him, surprised but amused at the same time. Instead, Ethan's facial expression was impossible to decipher. He was always neutral, 
to the point of looking angry. The young woman did not know what to answer to that, she thought for a few seconds, until she knew what to say to him. Yesterday I couldn't thank you for what you did. I don't know how you did it, but thank you. She gave him her best smile, waiting for some reaction from him, but nothing. He looked like a robot without feelings. Anyone would have done it, you needed my help and those idiots deserved it, he growled clenching his fists, as if that really infuriated him. Ruby opened her mouth to reply, but felt a pressure on her wrists, and saw Nix holding her tightly. His jaw was clenched, as if he was holding back. Or leaving. He stood in front of her, putting himself between the two of them in protective mode. The brunette saw Athan's expression, and it only showed amusement. A slight smile could be seen in the middle of the stubble of some days that he had, just like Nix's. She was stunned looking at him. It was the first expression she had saw in his face, and that was because he had seen her friend. But I'm talking to Ath. She was interrupted by the murderous glare from Nix. If you don't come, I'll carry you like a bag of potatoes, he threatened. I dare you. She challenged him. Bad idea. The blonde held her by her hips and lifted her into the air, supporting her on his shoulder with force, without letting her fall or escape. Regardless of Athan's powerful and intimidating gaze, he turned his back on him and began to walk away from the man. Now both friends were walking through the parking lot of the shopping center, with Minerva following in their footsteps, trying not to laugh at the situation. Nix was carrying Ruby like a bag of potatoes. She was screaming and shaking, but apparently people thought they were just a couple having fun and were just grinning mischievously. He put her in the passenger seat of his car and buckled her seatbelt. Minerva, you came in your car, right? He asks, reminding her that she was not coming with them. Damn, you're right. She replied, and as she walked away, she shouted again, See you at night. Good luck, I love you. And she left. Now they were alone in the car, and Ruby knew that now she was going to take on the scolding of her life. The journey was slow and uncomfortable. The brunette tried several times to bring up the topic of conversation, BU0T ended up talking to herself. Nix's fists were around the wheel, clenching it like he wanted to break it. His callous knuckles were white from exerting so much force. His jaw, like his knuckles, was also clenched. He was so angry and frustrated that I couldn't believe how we could get home before hitting something, or someone. Nix clearly knew something that Ruby didn't, and she wanted to know. What was so important that he couldn't tell her? He hit the steering wheel very hard, in a stupid attempt to shake off some of the frustration, scaring Ruby. Can you tell me what the fuck is wrong with you? She yelled to him, already very tired of the attitude of her best friend. I don't want you to hang out with that Athan anymore, he snapped from the effort it took to keep at bay. I'm not hanging out with him, she defended herself. He is the one who saved me yesterday, and today I saw him at the mall, a public place. She raised her hands in exasperation. At first he looked at his friend, confused as to why he had saved her. Of course it wouldn't cost him anything. But why had he bothered? He collected himself in the second, and looked at her seriously but with a tone of pure concern. He was so deep in his worries, that he didn't even realize that his friend had lied to him yesterday, when she told him that she had been saved by the police. Listen Ruby, he is evil. I don't want you to even see him again. She was looking at the road, avoiding eye contact as much as possible. Stop the car. Confused, Nix shifted the car to the side of the road so that no one hit it, turned off the engine and faced her. What happened? He was interrupted because his friend was hugging him stronger than ever. He hugged her back, confused, but returned it the best he could. She released him and stared at him. Okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. I'll get away from him and not talk to him ever again. But not yet. I will when you're ready to tell me what is going on, I want explanations. He crossed his arms with a tender frown. Nix couldn't be happier. Something good was finally going on, Ruby won't go near that creep. Of course, he will have to prepare a lie to excuse him, to explain why he did not want her to be near him, but something will come to mind. 
For nothing in the world will he let his best friend be with the vampire who killed his family. O3 A Dark Past Son, run, save yourself and remember not to look back for anything in the world. A father gave instructions to his little son. At just eight years old, he already had his baby brother, just two months old, in his arms, holding him tightly, prepared to protect him with his own life if necessary. The mansion where they lived was destroyed. The vampires had attacked them in the middle of the night. The Hammond family was the best known and most renowned family among hunters. They were the symbol of hunters, basically, but there they were, being attacked by the most powerful and largest nest of vampires. Little Nix was covered in blood, not his, but his father and mother's. His mother was fighting with three vampires at the same time, his brother, who was only twenty years old, was fighting alongside his father, against more than ten vampires. Phoenix run? His brother Blade yelled at him. The little boy tried to flee the house, but not without first visualizing a vampire who stood out more than the others. Everyone was running around the house from one side to the other, everyone was bumping into everyone except. Everyone avoided him and bowed as they passed him. Ethan, we have already finished everyone he saw a blonde smile at that vampire. No, not all of them. You have two left, but I want you to leave the little one alive, he will remember me forever, and every time he does, a feeling of pure helplessness will intoxicate him. That will be his punishment. All the vampires, who were about twenty, set out in search of little Phoenix and his younger brother. He just ran through whole forest, since his house was in the middle of it. The tears threatened to come out, but he held them back, he had to be strong for his little brother. Someone grabbed him by the neck and there he saw those huge dark red eyes. His blood went cold and a chill ran down his spine. Let go of me, idiot! The boy yelled, as he was so small and young, saying that caused the vampires to burst out laughing. I like this little one. Can we have it, Ethan? We could train him as one of us and when he reaches the right age, we would convert him, one pleaded. No. I want his brother killed. And he will live. No. The miner cried, kill me instead, you idiots. I am bigger and with more blood. Please. His little mouth strings were being ripped apart by the screams. A vampire approached, whispered, I'm sorry boy, and took his little brother away, leaving him alone in the middle of the forest without siblings or parents. Hey kid, are you okay? A man of about twenty-five years was walking through the forest in search of his dog that had escaped. He was not expecting to find a child in the middle of the forest at three in the morning and covered in blood, crying and with his dog by his side. The boy looked up and exposed his amber eyes, reddish from crying. They're dead. He whispered to himself. The vampires have killed them. He was sure the man was going to leave after listening to him, thinking that the boy had a great imagination or something like that. Where is your house? Take me there, he ordered. The little boy obediently led him towards his parents' grave. The mansion had the door open, and if you looked closely, you could already distinguish the liters of blood that were spilled everywhere. The man immediately recognized the house, he knew the boy's family. They were good people, he was close to the hunters, he's lived all his life in their presence, and their constant battles with the vampires were nothing foreign to him. If only he knew what has been going on, he could have looked for help. But it was too late. No one was saved from the vampires except this boy. What is your name? Phoenix, he whimpered. Phoenix, my name is Jacob and I will take care of you, don't worry kid. He hugged him tightly, expecting rejection from the boy, but he returned the hug with all the strength that his little hands could exert. Okay. He wiped away his tears and headed for his old home, leaving Jacob kneeling on the ground in confusion. Listen to me, Phoenix. I doubt you want to go in there, he advised, afraid that the child would end up traumatized by seeing his gutted parents, but he continued as if he had not heard him. The dog, on the other hand, happily followed his new master, giving him his support. Phoenix walked in and surprised himself by seeing himself in a mirror. He was no longer the little one who had to be cared for, for being eight years old, his gaze already showed by all that he had lived through. 
He kept walking through his old home, visualizing all the blood around him. There were only three dead vampires on the ground, two headless and one with a makeshift stake driven into his chest. He came to his room to look for clothes and then leave as soon as possible, and there they were. His mother. With a big wound on her chest, her eyes were focused on a lost point, she was already pale, her look that defined her so much was gone, she was no longer her, anymore it wasn't his mother. His father was hanging from the ceiling with a barbed wire tied around his neck, naked, completely humiliated. He had marks all over his neck, fang marks. His torso was mangled with cuts and bites. And finally he found his brother, watching him was what hurt him the most, since he was not dead yet, just severely wounded. He ran to meet him, grabbed him tightly, not letting go, he didn't want to, he couldn't. He put his brother's head between his legs, and whispered, that everything was going to be okay. Why why you have to get away from this life Nixie, his brother used to call him that since he could remember, he only called him by his full name in very few situations. Remember that we love you very much, be strong for our little brother Damon, you have him with you right? Haven't they taken him? Have they? As he saw that his brother was moving too much, and that caused the very serious wound in his stomach to open more, he lied to him. Yes brother, he's with me, calm down, we'll be fine, don't worry about- He couldn't continue speaking as his high-pitched voice broke into pieces, like his soul and heart. Blade smirked once again and then let go, a big smile on his face. I swear I'll find him. Whatever happens, he rested his brother's head on a pillow and got up from his pitiful place, grabbed a bag and filled it with his clothes, leaned him against the door, he couldn't take so much, he burst into tears. That's when Jacob entered the room, grabbed the bag with one hand and T-Kid's hand with the other, pulling him out of the room. Before leaving, Phoenix he stared at the bodies of his former family. I swear I'll avenge them. I'll find Damon and the bloody vampire who did this to them, he swore softly, making himself a promise that he would possibly want be able to keep. The little boy, his new father and pet, left the big mansion. Jacob quickly covered the house in gasoline, then lit his favorite lighter and threw it there. Everything was so fast that no one had time to process it. The mansion was already burning, everything was gone, there was no going back. Young Phoenix's parents, along with his brother, had died. His little brother had been taken by vampires and had surely died too. Now he had a new father, a new life, a new family. Him, his father, and his dog, a killer. Jacob promised Phoenix that he would teach him to fight them, and he did. He would help this boy no matter what, he would never let something bad happen to him. That night, after everything had happened, three promises were made. All three by different people, with different purposes. One would avenge his parents' deaths and find his brother. Another would care for and train his new son with body and soul. The latter would take care that in the not-so-distant future, the eyes of little Phoenix and his brothers meet again, but first he would have to make a change of roles. 04 Jealousy Here you go. Nix handed Ruby a cup of coffee. Minerva watched them from across her friend's room. She couldn't help but feel jealous that her Phoenix was giving Ruby more attention than her. But wait, what was he thinking? Her Phoenix? That was wrong, she couldn't feel that way about him, what's more, he considers her as his sister, his little sister, not as his girlfriend. As much as she wanted, that relationship would be impossible. The relationship between Ruby and Nix had grown dramatically in a matter of hours. On Friday at the bar, everything was normal, they were close friends, but now they were like paper and glue, nothing could separate them without one ending up broken. Possibly an exaggerated metaphor, but he couldn't help it. Nix leaned back in the chair, with Ruby at his side and Minerva at a safe distance. He already knew that his friend felt things for him, he had not told her, but she was terrible at hiding it. Not wanting to ruin one of his best friendships, he turned a blind eye and pretended as if he were unaware of her friend's feelings. There was an awkward silence, so Ruby decided to end it. What movie are we going to see Nix? They were at her house for that same excuse, although for Nix it was just a way to keep an eye on Ruby, but if she invited her alone, Minerva would get mad at them. 
W what? He acts confused at first, but he recovered the second. A horror, Owen? He axed after their friend's suggestion. Why not? Minerva smiled. That would be a perfect way to get closer to the blonde. And for him, that would be a perfect excuse to later invite the scared girls over for the night. He wouldn't lose sight of Ruby for the world. It was already an hour and a half after the horrible movie had ended. Minerva, who was about two meters away, was already completely glued to the blonde, and Ruby, due to the situation and the looks her friend was giving her, was getting uncomfortable. Her friend whispered secretly to her, winking eyes and threatening glances, to leave the room and leave her alone with her lover for a couple minutes. Obediently, Ruby broke away from the warmth of her friend's body and headed for the kitchen. I'm hungry, does anyone want something? Popcorn would be nice, Nick smiled. She immediately noticed that he was uncomfortable being so excessively attached to Minerva and had to clench her jaw to keep from laughing. If you want, I'll show you where I keep them. He started looking for an excuse to leave. No. Ruby yelled. I know where everything is in this house, especially the food, and that was true, Ruby basically lived in that house, just like Minerva and Nick's in her house. When he got to the kitchen, she met Jacob, his friend's father, even they were not alike at all. One's hair was jet black and the other's was platinum blonde. One had dark brown eyes and the others were amber, but according to them, Nix had turned out just like his mother, who had died in a car accident when he was two months old. Hi Ruby, he greeted politely. It seemed strange to the girl since he was on his back, playing with their old dog a killer. Good afternoon, she answered fearfully. She has been somewhat afraid of him since a few years, when Nix knocked on the door of her house, covered in blood and cuts, after he had gone hunting with his father. Animals. Of course. Will you stay to sleep? You could go to school together, tomorrow. You are always welcome, in fact, I think there's still some of your clothes in Phoenix's room from the last time you stayed here. Ruby blushed like a fat ugly tomato, not knowing what to say. Thank you, I doubt I'll stay the night, you know, if I stay here I doubt I'll really sleep next to them, and I am really tired. Actually, I'd better go home now, I'm already kinda late, she abruptly changed the subject. I see that's a shame, but know you're always welcome. He turned around, faced her and smiled at her. He really was a handsome man. I'll tell Phoenix to take you home. As sure, he stuttered. She never understood why so much formality in always calling his own son by his full name, especially if he knew he didn't like it, but who knows, maybe it was a hunter thing. T-H-R-E they were, already in the car. Nix with Minerva at his side, as always, and Ruby and T-H back. Before leaving, they had argued for them to stay over at his house. Of course, Nick said it was because they hadn't done that for a long time, and that he missed it, but they all had their double intentions, and although most were good, some are unclear. The latter turned on the radio and put on her favorite CD, Fall Out Boy. The three of them gave each other a knowing look, and began to sing at the top of their lungs the lyrics of their favorite song. We're here, Nick's warned the obvious, always with a smile on his face. Goodbye babies, see you tomorrow, I love you, Ruby yelled and ran into her house. It was only nine at night and she was too hungry. She called his favorite pizzeria and no one answered. Mom, Dad, I'm here. She exclaimed, leaning out of the stairs, I'll go buy a pizza, the delivery guy doesn't answer. His mother came downstairs, gave her money, and warned her to be careful. She put on skinny jeans, a loose pink t-shirt, and headed out on a pizza shopping mission. She had already told her parents to buy her a car more times than she would like to admit, but they just wouldn't agree, making her walk everywhere. She was already halfway there when she heard footsteps behind her. The boy behind her didn't bother to hide his presence, so she quickly turned around, and to her surprise, there was Ethan. I, I can't talk to you, bye, she admitted and continued on her way. Ethan laughed out loud, showing his amusement. Seriously? He stepped forward until he was next to her. You smell good. He wagged his nose like a dog and that image made Ruby laugh. She didn't flinch. Thank you, stranger. It took her a long time to say the last word, since she did not consider him as one at all. Stranger. 
He asked very confused. I saved you from being attacked D just two days ago, and yesterday afternoon I saw you at the mall and you greeted me. He showed her a smile for the first time, which almost made Ruby fall to her feet, almost. That's right, but my best friend doesn't want me to be near you. And I trust him. She looked at the floor, fearful that if she looked him in the eye, she would rush towards him. Ethan grabbed her by the hip and locked her between a wall and his big strong body. He stuck their bodies as close as possible, leaving no part untouched except their faces. But I do want to be near you, he whispered, pressing his lips against Ruby's ear, biting her earlobe and stealing a moan from her. I'll let go of me, she said firmly. Nix was very appalled at the simple fact that she met Ethan. what would he think if she let him kiss her? Ethan kept kissing her neck, biting every so often and running his tongue over the places he bit, but not hard. Ruby was pleading inwardly for him to keep going and not stop, but a bucket of cold water brought her back to reality, as Nix's look of despair reached her confused mind. Let go of me, she said, this time without stammering. Ethan was separated from her slowly, leaving her with a horrible feeling of abandonment installed in her chest. As you want. But this isn't over yet, he replied a little angry but at the same time amused, since a girl had never stood firm when it came to him, only his human could, and that made her look even more dangerous and tempting. Because after all, he knew that she was going to end up giving in. He didn't know when, but he was sure of it. And when she does, he would use her in every possible way, hurt her so much that when he leaves there will be nothing left of her, just her insatiable pain. That would definitely make the little phoenix feel powerless again, just like a few years ago. Just when he wiped out his mighty family. He just had to be patient. 05. A Lonely Kid if one took the trouble to pay attention while walking through the icy streets, one would see a little boy, only twelve years old, lying on the cold snow-covered street. His lips were cracked from the ice and purple from the cold. His body was turning hard and blue, like that of a dead man. One thing only differentiated it from the other, because it trembled from the cold, as if it were being shaken. No one could imagine what the boy had been through. No one wanted to imagine what he had lived through, but still no one helped him. Inside the little boy, each day that passed without help, his darkness and hatred increased remarkably. His innocent soul was already completely stained from years of torture on the part of humans, and sadly, he was one. The sun finally came out of hiding. Hours had passed, and the boy was surprised that his heart was still beating. But he didn't want that, he wanted to leave, he didn't want to spend another minute of torture in that disgusting and horrible place. He wanted to meet his mother and siblings again. His days were always the same. He would wake up, as he could barely sleep on cold nights, and would set out on his long and arduous path in search of someone to feed him, perhaps a good baker or perhaps a mother in a desperate attempt to get her sympathy, with Ath hope his sad aspect didn't turn her away from him. But everything changed one day. The skinny little boy was sitting in a street, with only a torn blanket over him, protecting him little from the cold. A man in his forties, who clearly was well-fed and possessed enough wealth to have voluptuous coats, approached the undernourished boy who was on the brink of death and wrapped him in one of his coats. He scooped him up in his huge arms and started on his way home. The boy did not open his eyes throughout the trip, he was very weakened. He also had a horrible bite made by what the gentleman believed to have been a dog, which was very badly treated. The man could not help but feel remorse for not having helped him before, and sorry for what that child had lived through. The days passed, and the boy had never been so happy. His new father took great care of him and loved him even more. He ate like the gods and in the long nights when nightmares haunted him, his father slept with him. But of course when one is happy, especially if it is the little one, something bad has to happen to him. It was always like that and he knew it, only he refused to consider that this time something bad would happen. One of the few nights when he slept well, and without the need to be near his new father, he heard a series of knocks and screams from a man. Since only he and his father lived in that house, it seemed strange to him that there were so many noises. He got out of his bed, leaving the warmth and comfort of it behind, entering the darkness and cold of the house. 
He walked through the long corridors that he already knew so much for a few long and tortuous minutes until he reached the last room in the corridor, which was precisely his father's. He rested his ear against the cold wood, waiting to hear some indication that his father was still there, or if the attackers were still there, but nothing. Behind that door was absolute calm. Very confused, he mustered enough courage to just open the door a little, just enough to peek in. His eyes widened as he carefully observed the scene in front of his eyes. His dear father was still as a rock in front of the already extinguished fireplace. His eyes are closed but he knows that he is not sleeping. He could distinguish a long hilt stuck in his chest, it had a series of scribbles that burned into his mind forever. Full of pain and sadness, he did his best to, to remember every single detail of it, to later have some clue as to find the murderer and be able to take revenge. He turned around and began to walk in his old steps, refusing to think about what happened, he just wanted to wake up and realize that this had just been one of his horrible nightmares, but he knew that this was not going to happen, this was reality. The harsh but true reality. Was that your daddy? A voice that came from the unlit sectors of the house echoed in the little ears of the boy. Without seeing him, the little boy already knew that this man was doing his best not to start laughing. Not really. His tone came out indifferent. He didn't know how his voice could come out as if this was not affecting him, when inside he felt like he was dying slowly and painfully. It was like reliving the death of his mother, who died of a strange disease, and the death of his little brothers, who died of hunger in the streets because they did not have anyone to take Cree of them. My real father abandoned me at birth. He made a bitter smile, not knowing that his words reached the stone cold heart of that man. My mother had to manage to feed me, my brothers and herself. I helped her when I could, but what could a six-year-old do? His eyes threatened to cry but he held back the tears. After a few months she felt constantly ill, she could barely get out of bed to go to the bathroom, and even less to cook us something to eat or work. In those days I was forced to become both the father and mother of my little brothers, who were only three years old. They were beautiful twins with smiles that melted your soul, he continued without being able to stop. He had never said this to anyone, and in doing so, he felt so relieved he couldn't stop himself. Since she was the only who worked, the money was barely enough to feed the twins, causing her and I to go without food for days. She was very weak and on one of those nights death kissed her lips, stealing her last breath, her last look. A tear slid down his little cheek. The vampire who had just killed his father was intrigued. It didn't take long for my little brothers to starve to death, because of me. I couldn't get a decent job, I couldn't feed them well. There are times when I don't understand why them and not me. They ate better and I used all the blankets we had to warm them up, which was not much but it should have been enough. It makes me so angry, but then I remember that if it had been me and not them, they would be living this, then I'm glad. He gave a laugh without amusement. Kill me, I have nothing to live for, do it. Kill me. He shouted angrily at the man who was hiding until now. I won't, the man in hiding advanced until he was next to the young boy. You will come with me, I will show you how we live, how we survive and how we feed ourselves he smiled sinfully showing two long fangs. The boy was not scared at all. He just smiled at him, the biggest smile his little mouth allowed him to make. You could tell that this man was strong, and therefore he would not die like all the other people he loved. How old are you? You look too young to support me. He lowered his head, sad to realize that he would surely bankrupt the man. This one should be in his twenties, too young and inexperienced to adopt a twelve-year-old boy. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, he showed a mischievous smile. Eventually you will understand, when you are like me, you will understand. And when will I be like you? When you turn twenty years old, he grabbed the boy by the shoulders and lifted him without difficulty over his own. What is your name? He asked shyly. Arthur. And yours? He laughed internally since he had adopted a boy without knowing his name, besides that he had just killed his father. Ethan answered the little boy excitedly. Without realizing it, both were entering a friendship that would not be easy to carry. 
They would have their ups and downs, but none will give up. The two would defend themselves against the others with nails, fangs, blows, and even go so far as to defend the other by sacrificing their own life. 06 A Cryptic Message Ruby come down already, reek fast as serve to for the love of God. Ruby's mother was yelling at her from the kitchen. She's already completely exhausted his patience. She had been waiting 20 minutes for her daughter to get up, but she seemed to be in a deep sleep. Her daughter opened one eye, then another and so on until she was fully awake. And when the sleeping beauty finally awakens, she finds that Ethan was in the corner of her room. How can you have such a heavy sleep? Can't deny you look pretty even when you sleep. His words were cute, but Ethan's facial expression spoiled everything. He was so serious, keeping all his emotions deep within him. Ruby bit back a scream that wanted to come out with all her might from deep in her throat. She covered her barely covered body as fast as her asleepy body allowed, but it was late, Ethan had been watching her for hours. May I know what you are doing in my room at seven in the morning? She questioned. You could tell that she was having a hard time keeping his voice steady, since inside he was dying of shame. You see, he began to take short but determined steps towards Ruby's bed. It was five in the morning and I still couldn't. Sleep. Word I went to find something to feed myself, and by chance your house was nearby. What better way to wake up a girl like I'm doing? He showed a smile full of arrogance. What the hell, get out, I have to change and I told you I don't want to be anywhere near you. Both of them knew that was not true, but Ruby just hoped that the perfect but mysterious Ethan left home before Nix or his mother arrived. Wait, she sat on her bed, always taking care that her revealing pajamas are hidden under the protection of the sheets. How did you get into my house? The vampire smiled and sat down on the bed, dangerously close to the girl. I have my secrets. Are you going to change or are you going to go in those sexy pajamas? He growled, changing the subject. Ruby's face turned crimson in a matter of seconds. She should have already changed and had breakfast, but there she was, sitting on her bed next to a boy she knew just three days ago, and who on top of that, made her terrified of the idea of her best friend finding out that he was on her bed. Excuse me? The fact that you go into the night wandering in people's houses, which by the way is very scary, is not my fault. Of course I am in my pajamas, what did you expect? Well I love that from all kinds of pajamas you chose those. She peeked under the blanket that protected her, and examined her clothes. She just had shorts that one could easily think of as her underwear, and an extremely short t-shirt to wear in public. Go away. She yelled at him, this time furiously. She didn't care that her mother had surely heard her, she would make up an excuse for her later, but now she just wanted her to go away. Ethan lay down next to the blue-eyed woman, barely brushing her body and whispered to her. See you in high school. She bit down on the human's earlobe and jumped out the window, disappearing in a matter of seconds. And then he told me that he would see me in school. She finished telling her best friend about the events that occurred in the morning. Oh my god, Ruby. Popping, she positioned herself in front of her. Does he go to this high school? We are already in the middle of the term, and we've never seen him. From the look that her friend showed, one could easily tell that she was nervous. I doubt that she will show up, just relax, she tried to calm her down. The bell rang announcing that all the students should go to their respective classes. Ruby and Minerva gave each other with a warm hug and promised to meet in the dining room at the end of the class. Ruby, who was deep in thought, did not notice how someone called her name repeatedly in search of her attention. Ruby, for God's sake, are you deaf? The black-haired guy questioned offended. She turned to see who was calling her, and the words stuck in her throat. Harry? Is it you? When did you come back from your trip? She hugged him affectionately. Neither of them cared that they were alone in the hall, since everyone else was in their classes already. Yesterday in the afternoon. I wanted to go to your house, but I didn't dare, he confessed. Harry was Ruby's ex-boyfriend. They did not spend long as a couple, 
since he had to move because of his father's job for two years, so they had to break up. They both swore that they would not hold grudges, since they loved each other very much, and before they formed a couple, they were very close friends. And I thought you had forgotten about me, she pretended to cry, stealing a smile from the black-haired man. The two stared at each other for a few seconds, there was nothing to say, they had been very surprised, and seeing each other so suddenly had left them confused. Well, I suppose I have to go to my class, he said, ending the talk. If not, the math teacher will kill me, he joked to break the new awkward silence. Yes, of course, go, she gave him a smile showing all her teeth. I'll see you after class. He walked with a carefree air to his respective classroom. Ruby started going back towards her class when she felt pressure from someone grabbing her shoulder. She turned around, tired of everyone calling her at the least opportune moments that day, but her annoyance was turned into surprise when she met Ethan's eyes. He did not show any happiness at seeing her, his face only showed contained anger. Ah, uh, something happened? She acts confused. Who was he? You could tell from a distance that he wanted to make you his. The effort to control himself was already evident, but he just couldn't ignore the fact that that guy named Harry gave off a smell of excitement when he saw his human, and that on top of him, she had said they would meet after school, which will never happen. He. She acts confused. It did not take long for her to understand that he was referring to Harry. Ah, you mean Harry, she smiled happily because finally Ethan showed a feeling, jealousy. Don't worry, we're just friends, nothing more. He stroked her face and then quickly removed his hand, realizing what he was doing. Well, he doesn't consider it that way, he answered angrily, and boy was he angry. You are mine, not his. What? I'm not yours. She separated herself drastically from Ethan. I hardly know you, and the fact that you have saved me does not give you the right to make me your property, she answered frustrated. It was a hell of a time being able to say those words so easily, for she didn't feel that way at all. She also felt that Ethan was his, and if some seductress dared look at him with desire, she was sure that she would throw herself on top of her and kill them instantly, of course the vampire noticed. You are mine and I am completely yours, or am I wrong? He smiled haughtily, grabbing her hips. Ruby was speechless. He lifted her in his arms like a princess while looking her in the eyes and carried her to the men's locker room. He put her against the wall of the place to start kissing her neck passionately, stopping just to control himself and not let her fangs stick out. Ethan, she moaned. E enough. He was separated from her in less than a second and looked her closely in the eye. Do you really want me to stop? Neither of them wanted that to happen. Ruby looked at him for a few seconds. She was confused, she didn't know what she wanted. On one hand she wanted him to go on and never stop, but she couldn't take Nix's gaze from from her head. Frustrated, she pulled away from him, pulling away from his body heat, not before accidentally groaning at the sudden separation. She looked at him embarrassed and almost ran to her classroom. With no trace of Ruby anywhere, Ethan sat on one of the many benches and spent a full hour thinking about what had happened. All humans are inferior, all and without exceptions. Why had he been hurt by being her reaction? She's a fucking human. He was 1,448 years old, 1448. He couldn't feel anything other than repulsion by a human, could he? No. Of course not. He had to stick to the plan. All this revolved around making Phoenix suffer and nothing else, nothing could go wrong in his revenge, it was strictly planned by him and Arthur. Everything would go as planned. You don't understand Arthur, it's different with her finally, after having spent the whole morning in high school thinking, Ethan decided to go with his father to ask him for some advice. If anyone knew what to do, he was definitely the right person. Arthur watched his son walk from here to there, his gaze on his hands, as if they came to have a life of their own. Of course he knew what was happening to his son, but he couldn't tell him, that's something he would have to find out himself. What I do understand is that since the day I found you, until today you've always hated humans. You have never felt anything other than disgust or anger towards them. This confuses me. 
He blatantly lied. Actually, the situation did not confuse Arthur at all. In fact, he had to do too much effort not to show it, since Ethan was the only person who knew him well enough to know when he was lying and when he was not. Hmm. What exactly do you feel towards this girl? Ruby, he interrupted, completing the sentence. Yes, yes, whatever she's called. What are you feeling? Ethan looked at him angrily, because he knew that it was very difficult for the boy to show his feelings and even more difficult to describe them to someone other than his father. But of course he was talking to him, so he did not know why it was so difficult for him. Well, when I'm not near her I feel alone and empty. When I'm with her, I feel like I'm the luckiest vampire in the whole world. He paused before continuing. The day I met her. I felt her fear and danger for more than 15 blocks. His eyes turned dark red when she remembered the smell of that she gave off. I never got so angry. I never got such a feeling of protecting someone. I don't even know how to describe it, shit. He hit the wall and accidentally broke it. Arthur looked at the boy and the wall repeatedly. He pointed to the wall and spoke. Then son, you will fix that, he showed a big smile. Follow those feelings and I think it goes without saying, it's not wrong to change your ways for the right reason, if that's what you want. He grabbed his shoulders and looked at him tenderly. I will be leaving for a few weeks, I have been called from London for a meeting of the leaders. There has been too many attacks from the lycanthropes and hunters recent tea. They now seem to be allies. He rolled his eyes showing his frustration. I will ask you to take charge of the nest again. Arthur was the leader of a nest of vampires, the same nest that had Phoenix's parents killed. Of course, over the years the number of members was reduced to six. Only two of the six were women, and they were the most respected. The letter would not allow weaklings in his nest. Of course I will, Ethan grinned. Normally the vampire nests stayed in a single place for their entire lives, obeying their leader, but of course Arthur was not normal. He loved his vampires too much to keep them locked up. So each vampire went on with his life, and twice a week they got together. I will, father. He looked into his eyes with an air of concern. When are you leaving? I should be at the airport by now, he smiled mischievously. If there is one thing that Arthur was, besides being one of the oldest and most respected vampires, it was his incredible reputation for being unpunctual. Ethan laughed and offered to drive him to the airport. No, no, I'm fine, the limousine is downstairs waiting for me. What's more, I don't want you to go out at this time, the sun is very strong and will weaken you. You may need to save your strength. Her son rolled his eyes, although he had a slight smile on his face. Dad, I have the pendant, remember? He pointed to the named object. Of course he remembered, that same pendant he had given him years ago, so that the sun would not affect him. They always laughed at how some idiot spread the word that the sun burned vampires, when it only gave them a slight fatigue, and with the right amulet, they did not even feel its effects. And thank the world you have it. He looked at the ground thoughtfully. I really should thank the witch you had making it, don't you think? He put his hand on his chin. Again his son laughed. He took his suitcases for him and went to the door. He got into the limousine, but not before hugging his son and saying goodbye correctly, when he whispered at Ethan something about a link and blood, but unfortunately he could not hear well. Despite having unprecedented skills, he could not prevent a truck from honking the horn at the same time his father was talking, preventing him from hearing it clearly. The only words he could understand were link and blood. Ethan thought he knew what he was talking about, so he didn't give it much importance. 07 Bipolar You're mine. His voice sounded more like an animal than a human this time, but well, he wasn't even human after all. Say it. He demanded as he bit her belly, stealing a groan from her. The sensations Ethan made the human feel were extreme, unreal. Ruby felt that at any minute, she would break into thousands of pieces. The human persistently refused to grant him the favor of agreeing to tell him that she was his, just to avoid satisfying him and give him that pleasure. No matter how much pain it caused her to resist, she would never say such a thing to him. I, I won't, she muttered with difficulty. 
The imposing man's gaze hardened and then turned neutral. They were in Ruby's room. All the lights were off, producing an air of darkness and danger, even more, if possible, since just with his presence any place would be filled with darkness and the feeling of imminent danger. They were both on her bed, which was moist from the sweat that the human was dripping, even if she was just sitting, her heart was beating as if she had just finished running a marathon. Ruby wanted to feel Athan's touch, she needed to become his desperately, his imponent body drived her crazy, and those piercing eyes and his handsome face were just the cherry on top. She wanted to get rid of the darned clothes covering those hard muscles, and she said so. Take off your clothes, she spoke so quickly and desperately that for a few seconds, she doubted Athan understood. The man was wearing black boxers and a white shirt that fit him perfectly, highlighting his imposing muscles. He looked at her in amusement and with a charming smile on his perfect face. Are you getting bossy? But I will listen to you this time, the human to Athan's amusement looked at him with hatred, or so he tried to do. He unbuttoned his shirt extremely slowly in order to despair and annoy the human because he loved to see her like this, desperate for him, with pleafing eyes. After a tortuous minute for Ruby, they had both already get rid of most of their clothes. Ethan kissed and licked every part of her fragile body. At first Ruby tried to suppress the moans and gasps as she bit into the pillow, but after a few minutes, she was already open-mouthed and panting freely. Pride no longer mattered to her. After having kissed each part of the weak human's body, he took off his tight boxers and positioned his member in front of her sex, rubbing it slowly against it. Ruby shifted between the sweaty sheets, impatient. Ah, do it already, she pleaded. Her body ached, she was exhausted, and she knew it was a matter of time before she fell down. Ethan moved to her lips slowly and seductively. He kissed the corner of these, and then bit with a little more force than necessary her lower lip, making a slight cut that sprouted a few drops of blood that came from his chin to his clavicles. From there it descended to her chin, licking the small but delicious drops of blood. It finally reached her neck, and Ruby leaned back when she felt something pointy in it. She did not understand what was happening but deep down she liked it, so she allowed him to take control. I love you Ruby, Ethan murmured, and Ruby was sure she would have loved to hear those words, had it not been for the fact that at that moment she felt two painful pricks on her jugular. She grabbed onto Athan's muscular arm and held onto it like a lifesaver. What she didn't know was that the vampire sucking on his neck was anything but a lifesaver. Without warning, Athan buried himself inside the human, who let out a cry of surprise and pleasure. Ruby, in a desperate attempt to release a little of all the sensations that flooded her, dug her nails into the broad back of the imposing man who was penetrating her, but only managed to excite him more causing his thrusts to be deeper each time. You are very impatient, did you know? He axed, as he separated from the bleeding neck of the human. Ruby didn't understand how she could like him to bit her like that, since she had never even liked vampire stories. They were very cliched to her. They kissed with excitement and despair. At one moment, Athan detached himself from the human's mouth and lowered it to one of her nipples, into which one of his fangs stuck, stealing a cry of pain from Ruby. Despite being dizzy from blood loss, hurt from the bites, and numb from the ovhamming pleasure, Ruby was fascinated to see that Greek god above her. The two were about to climax, but a deafening noise echoed through the room, snapping Ruby out of her slumber. Her eyes widened. She was extremely confused and covered in cold sweat. And to her surprise, she found herself alone in her bed. The fact that she had dreamed of Athan as a vampire amused her, mostly because it had managed to turn her on. Likewise, she was so ashamed of the fact that she decided not to see him, since she could not face him after having dreamed such things. She showered as fast as she could and wore a pair of denim shorts, a cropped white t-shirt and her favorite black sneakers. Goodbye mom, I'm going to school. She yelled, opening the door. She was not used to having breakfast, so her mom wasn't even surprised at this point. Have fun. She heard her say. Her mother was one of the great things that had happened to her in life. She was always there for her, ready to lift her up even on her darkest and most depressing days.
Her father, on the other hand, limited himself to making a few jokes that were only comical to him, and eventually QWK her about school, but she loved them both equally, and very much anyway. At this time, he should be traveling to London. Yesterday, they had called him from work saying that it was an emergency meeting and he had no choice but to go, leaving the two women of his life by themselves. Her cell phone vibrated. She looked down, taking it out of her pocket and smiled when she saw that it was Nick's. Hello, Mr. Phoenix, she said with a laugh as she started her father's car, who had lent it to his daughter, her, while he was away. I told you not to call me that. His voice sounded strange, which surprised her. Are you okay? You know that you can tell me everything. She suddenly put her foot on the brake with all her might. It had gone through a dog's head that it'd be cute to take a nap in the middle of the road, literally, as if the adorable bastard were the only one in the world. The car's wheels made a deafening noise as they skidded against the pavement of the street. Her head slammed hard against the steering wheel. The airbag did not activate, so the blow went directly to her head, with nothing to stop it. Ruby? Ruby? What was that noise? Nix yelled from the other line, where are you? Are you okay? The human tried to answer him, but the words didn't come out of her mouth. Hey. Hey. A voice was heard in the distance, whatever you do, don't close your eyes. Open them. Ruby reluctantly obeyed and checked that she was in her father's car, or what was left of it. It was turned over, she was upside down, and the only thing preventing her from falling against the roof of the car was the seat belt. What the? A bolt of pain shot through her head and neck. Shit, it hurts. She wanted to bring her hand to the part that hurt, but the man's voice stopped her. No. Don't move, we don't know what injuries you have. I already called the ambulance, they will come soon silence reigned for a few minutes. Ruby didn't know what to say to him, plus she couldn't speak. My name is Marcus, what is your name? Our Ruby, she stammered. It was already difficult to stay awake, the darkness struggled to win. It was a matter of time before she falls asleep, and probably never wakes up. Marcus, from outside the car, realized one way or another that the girl who was inside the car was dying, so he broke the window, and then crawled until he had put half of his body into what was left of the car. Look at me, Ruby. You can't die, not now that I've found you, he told her in an extremely frustrated tone of voice. What did he mean by that? Now that he found me? Ruby took a deep breath and caught three smells. A. The smell of burning metal coming from the car. B. The smell of blood coming from herself. And C. An indecipherable smell for her. It was extremely sweet and addictive, as if it were a mixture of the most attractive smells in the world. H. How E. E. Is that there is S. Equals such a nice smell. H. Air? It was incredible how difficult it was to articulate those simple words, so as he knew immediately that he had hit a part of her brain that involved speech. She turned her head just a little to see the man, and was surprised to see how handsome he was. He had a bit of a beard like Ethan, brown eyes, like his hair, he had something that made him look as striking as Ethan. He just smiled and then made a face. I'll be back, don't fall asleep please, and like a lightning bolt he went backwards, getting out of the car or what was left of it. Ruby thought she heard a fight, but she was too weak to be able to stay awake any longer, and she allowed herself to be carried away by the darkness, with the simple hope of waking up again. The brunette opened her eyes slowly. She didn't know where she was, except that the room she was in was unnecessarily large. Instinctively, she brought her hand to her head and was surprised to find that she had absolutely nothing. It was completely healthy. Wanting to know her whereabouts, she easily got up from the gigantic and comfortable bed to realize that she was not wearing her clothes, but a black t-shirt that reached above her knees. You are finally awake, Ethan spoke, watching her sitting in a dark armchair diagonally from the bed. Ruby was surprised to hear a male voice, but as soon as she realized it was Ethan, for some strange reason she calmed down. Although the remnants of her dream continued to haunt her in her mind. I didn't realize you were here, she admitted. What am I doing here? I was in my car. I crashed, and my head hurt a lot, little tears began to gather in her eyes. She had been so scared, she thought she would die. 
She tried not to cry, but she couldn't hold it for too long. She couldn't pretend that nothing had happened when he literally felt the kiss of death brush her lips. Shush, he stopped her as he walked towards her. You're fine now, nothing will happen to you, not while I'm here, Ruby hugged him tightly, casting shame deep in her mind. Until a name stood out in her mind, forcing her away from Athens' hold. Someone was with me. She forced her mind to remember that man, who had helped her not to give up. Marcus. She yelled, happy to have been able to remember it. She smiled, pleased with herself, but Athan's expression of disgust gave her to understand that he didn't like the fact that she knew the man's name. Him, he murmured, clenching his fists at his sides. Who? He saved me, Athan, she replied, pretending to be confident, when in fact he had no idea how she was not Ebven hurt. He didn't. He looked at her with intensity. He didn't save you, it was me. He just waited for an ambulance to arrive while you were dying, his strong hands filled with a liquid, but it wasn't sweat, no. It was blood. Athan! exclaimed the brunette, surprised and worried. She approached him again quickly, wanting to see if everything was all right. You're bleeding, my god. Look at your hand. Atham, you need medical help, that's not normal. As much as the idea of imagining someone bleeding like that terrified the human, seeing Athan do it only gave her an irresistible desire to hug him and comfort him. Quiet, it's nothing. It's normal. He gently pushed her away. Ruby didn't know what world that man lived in, but the one she lived in, clenching your fist until it bleeds like that was clearly not normal. Don't push me away, she demanded, standing inches from his face. Her chest ached, she demanded to console him, to put away his sadness, but she could not hug him as if nothing, she did not feel the confidence, or maybe she did, but she did not want to admit it. Can I hug you? The brunette nodded, so Ruby didn't wait another second to jump on him. He positioned his face on his neck, and upon perceiving a delicious aroma, he inhaled strongly, trembling at the smell of that beautiful girl, something indecipherable and delicious at the same time. Bordering on the mysterious. You smell so good, he murmured with his lips still glued to her neck. Ethan laughed softly, sending vibrations to Ruby's lips. Why was he laughing? You really do, he stated, then took a very deep breath, tickling her with his breath. That's because I wear perfume, you idiot, she replied a little amused. No. That's because you're mine. The brunette tensed in his arms. His. Just like he demanded in his dream, no. It couldn't be. She decided that answering her questions herself would never get to the truth, so she dared. What are you talking about? Athan slightly separated. Enough to see her beautiful blue eyes. We are linked by blood. You are destined to be with me for all eternity, she remembered her dream again, where he drank her blood as if it were an immortal vampire, and when she remembered it her face was dyed red. Hard to believe for her, listening to that did not seem to her like something illogical or crazy, it was even believable. And a part of her accepted what was said with happiness, while another disapproved, as if she were betraying something or someone. Athan seeing the blush on the human's cheeks raised a confused eyebrow. That was not the reaction he expected. What's going on? He acts, not hiding his confusion. Nothing, he answered quickly. Why did blood come out of hand like that? She changed the subject very drastically. She couldn't let Athan find out about his strange and perverted dream. You don't want to know, he murmured in a cold tone, plus a lopsided smile spread across his lips. Despite what was said, Ruby did want to know, plus she already had an idea. A crazy one, but an idea anyway. When he saved her from the three men, who looked quite strong, he defeated them with no effort, showing that he had inhuman strength considering the appearance of his physique. Now there also was the fact that he had saved her from the accident, she still did not know how, but thanks to him, she did not die and that was more than enough. Without naming that, he had literally had the strength to make his own hand bleed. And her dream. In her dream he drank her blood like a fucking vampire. She took a deep breath and said, I know what you are, Athan. He looked amused. I doubt that, he smiled bitterly. Humans aren't normally smart enough to you know, 
draw such conclusions. I mean, they are all so clueless and dumb, not to say that they are extremely weak, to handle a truth like that. Ruby froze in place. How could he say that, after all? She couldn't deny that the vampire's words didn't hurt. Her ears at first refused to believe that they had heard correctly, but they did. She abruptly separated from him, she didn't even want to be near him, she wanted to go home, her mother should be worried by now. Plus what if she already knew about the accident? Ruby never knew how to control her feelings. She always hid them deep in her chest and held them or hid them. She was pretty good at it. But this time, it was impossible. She didn't want Ethan to know that his words had hurt her, but she wanted him to know that she was furious. You are arrogant and narcissistic, she spat in his face without a hint of remorse. His eyes showed that he did not care about the human's words, and that he even found them funny, or so it seemed to her. It's a pity that you have such a beautiful body but remain so rotten inside she went to the exit with her head held high. She wouldn't let a fool like him know what she felt. For some reason Nix warned her about him and she, like an idiot, ignored him. Before reaching the room's door E, she saw her clothes covered in blood and dirt piled up on a chair. She just grabbed her shorts to check that her cell phone was there, and to her surprise it was. She thought it had been wrecked but it just had a big scratch. Apart from that, the cell phone was in perfect condition. She hit the contact for Nix and began texting him as she searched for the front door. Less than less than I need to talk to you, where are you greater than greater than? She sent the text and from that moment began the horrible and eternal wait for the message to be answered. Nix never checked his messages, he only handled calls, but if his theories about Ethan were true, he might reply. Less than less than Ruby? Where the hell have you been for the last eight hours, greater than greater than? The human couldn't even see or hear her friend, but knew beforehand that he was furious. Less than less than long story. Come find me greater than greater than, she put the cell phone in the small pocket she had, and continued looking for the exit. He didn't bother looking for the address of Athens, because she easily sent him her location. A few years ago, the three friends had installed a GPS app because poor Nix went crazy looking for both girls at every outing, so now the three of them used it to camo where they were in every moment. As long as they have their cell phone on them. She found the front door and without hesitation, she left the enormous house, and he dedicated herself to waiting for his best friend. Ruby was now at Minerva's house, being interrogated by the hostess and Nix. I've already told you everything, she sighed exhausted. Although of course she omitted the part where he almost died in the car, saying that she had only gently hit her head, no one had seen the car, so they did not know how bad the crash had been, and almost everything about Ethan. Nix nodded, not so pleased, unlike Minerva. Have you already told your mother that you crashed? That poor woman is going to infarct, Nix told her. Yes, I already told her, and no, don't worry, her heart is still beating the three laughed, but Ruby, unlike them, felt a horrendous emptiness in her chest. What day is it today? I am somewhat lost. Minerva laughed, and was then joined by the blonde. Today is the day we go out to a good bar, the blonde girl mimicked a perverted smile. We haven't had fun in a long time, she growled. Did you just growl? Ruby laughed and pretended that it didn't hurt at all to be away from Ethan, when in reality, she wanted to be in her bed crying and eating ice cream right now. But she couldn't, her pride wouldn't allow it. Nix had warned her. Where are we going? You tell us. The blonde gave her a smile, and Ruby noticed that Minerva was tense. She really was in love with Nix. To a place where there's a lot of alcohol, he smiled. He should forget about Ethan, at least for one night, that was all he acts. Sounds good to me. In an hour, will you pick us up? Ruby looked at Nix. Sure, see you in an hour. He hugged her and pressed his mouth to her ear. You still haven't escaped from my questioning, I don't believe anything. The brunette paled two tones when she heard it. Could it be that Nix knows what Ethan was? No, he wouldn't hide such a thing from her, would he? Does Nix know that she was linked to Athan, or does he think it was just a whim? She had too many questions for her poor brain and heart. 
but she would take care of them another day. See you in an hour, he murmured. Both girls had already been looking for something to wear for about 40 minutes. Ruby settled on a tight red dress that was too short for her taste, which was no small thing to say, but she didn't care much. She wanted to have fun, and if she had to hook up with 20 guys to forget about Ethan, she would. How do I look? She asked Minerva, who had just finished putting on her makeup, and her mouth opened so wide that any bug could have entered. You look beautiful, why didn't I put on that dress? Ruby lowered her eyes in shame, since that was practically her friend's dress and not hers. If you want, I'll give it to you, she began to say, but the blonde's murderous look silenced her. Do not even think about it. If you want to piss off that Ethan for having offended you, this is the way she smiled. Ruby applied makeup in record time and corrected her friend's makeup. She really liked putting makeup on other people as much as she did on herself, and she was good at it. She was in charge of making Minerva look beautiful, and making her wear a dress not as short as hers, pitch black, so dark that highlighted her blonde hair, and make it her look so good she could cause a heart attack. Nix parked the car and stood in the door like a statue as he saw his two best friends looking dazzling. See, come on. He stuttered, opening the doors for them as he managed to get out of his astonishment. Step on it, Nix, we don't want to be late. They reached the bar in a matter of minutes. Ruby and Minerva smiled when they saw how many people there were, especially guys. I'm leaving you here, see you around later, take care, he said as he got out of the car. Ruby's heart was beating like crazy and her stomach was a bundle of nerves, she had to calm down one way or another. She spotted the bar and strode away. The one who served the drinks should be a couple of years older, had blonde hair almost yellow, and his eyes were dark brown. Anyway, the boy attracted a lot of attention, which Ruby liked. Hi, what's up, how can I help you? He asked with a dazzling smile, to which Ruby returned it. It's definitely not my day and I don't want to bore you with my problems, she sighed, never losing her smile. I'm fine with tequila, but lots of tequila. He nodded and poured her an extra large glass, laughing on the inside. He liked that attitude she had. Thank you, she started looking for money, but the blonde stopped her. No, it's on the house. Oh, thanks. Then L guess I have to take advantage of it. She poured some salt into her hand, and the blonde looked at her with a raised eyebrow. No way could that little girl drink all that tequila in one gulp. To the surprise of both, Ruby licked the salt and drank all the tequila, feeling the burning in her throat and held the lime that the blonde handed her to absorb the juice. Impressive, he admitted. Thank you very much, she mimicked a bow, laughing and stepped into the crowd. She wanted to dance. Time flew by. From a large shot of tequila she went to three, then four and thus managed to forget the possible vampire. She moved sensually between people, easily drawing attention, but she didn't care. What's more, she liked it. She was so drunk that she watched as some people accidentally elbowed her, kneed her, and even kicked her, but she didn't feel anything. The only thing she felt was his scent. He was at the bar. And without hesitation, she went to look for him. She knew it was wrong. She knew that she should not go to him that she should go the other way, but she did not care. She was drunk and all she wanted to do now was cry. She reached the men's bathroom and without hesitation entered as if she were the owner. She heard moans coming from one of the cubicles and felt anger and rage running through her veins, in addition to the clear effect of alcohol. Ah ah, a female voice moaned. Aethan, oh gee god. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. She didn't even know why it affected her so much, well, yes, maybe they were destined, but that didn't mean they were a couple. She didn't have to feel hurt. Tears began to come out, thus altering her makeup that had been so hard to put on. Despite the fact that everything pointed to him being there, she wanted to confirm that it was really him. She believed deep down that maybe he wasn't the one who was fucking that woman. Oh, Ethan. She moaned I'm so close. A deep masculine laugh filled the room. Ethan's laugh. Someone is listening to us, baby. The door finally opened, revealing the image Ruby dreaded so much. 
Ethan's sly smile faded as if he had been slapped. Ruby's condition was deplorable. Her eyes were red from holding back tears and crying them, leaving her makeup smeared. She brought her hand to her eyes and with her fingers brushed off as much eyeshadow as she could, enhancing the makeup very little. I'm sorry, I entered the wrong bathroom. Andy she ran away crying because of the unpleasant scene that was taking place in front of her beautiful eyes. He stepped out of the blonde and quickly pulled up his pants, basically laying the girl down naked. And run to get Ruby. He grabbed her by the hand as soon as he reached her. Equals weight, are you okay? Yes. I hit myself when I was dancing. She said, trying to cover the obvious fact that she was crying because of Thay's painful scene. Do you need anything? Ethan said quickly, concerned tattooed on his face. Now he cared about her. After having done all that to her. The mood swings on his part were incredible. Ruby even thought he might be bipolar. He took two steps towards her while the brunette took two steps back. How could he be her destiny? How could he be the person she was supposed to be with for the rest of her life? No, she said dryly. I'm perfectly fine, I don't need anyone's help, she snapped. I never needed it and I never will. She turned around, and with moderately high pride, she headed towards the exit, not without first grabbing a cigarette from someone's hand. There she was, on the outskirts of the bar crying, with a bottle of alcohol in one hand, and a lit cigarette in the other. It was sad, she did not even smoke, she only did it because he was in a bad mood and didn't care anymore. She couldn't believe how it affected her so much that Ethan had been with someone else. She got up from her miserable, pitiful place and ran into some bushes to vomit. Not only because of the alcohol, but because of his disgust at the scene of Ethan with another woman. Fuck. She threw the bottle away and it smashed on the street floor, scattering small pieces of glass everywhere. Due to the movement, the lighter cigarette fell to the ground, and when she grabbed it, ironically, she cut her finger against the glass she had broken herself. It wasn't long before blood began to flow from the small wound, so she brought her finger to her mouth and sat back down in her pitiful place. She breathed heavily and sighed. And suddenly, she felt a presence watching her. Did life not get tired of ruining her night already? What could even make it w worse now? What do you want? He spat angrily. Ruby? It's me, Marcus. Do you remember me? The brunette turned quickly. She couldn't believe he was here. He looked like he was in his early thirties, how could he be in a bar like that? She hid her face between her bare legs, embarrassed to be in that state for a miserable man. Are you alone? She acts still with her head between her legs. Isn't there anyone else around? Um. He turned around, checking that they were alone. No why. That only meant one thing to the poor, shattered human. The smell that Ethan gave off, that smell that drove her crazy and addicted to him. Marcus had it as well. Could she possibly be linked to Marcus and Ethan? 08 Blood Link The human froze. She couldn't believe what was happening to her. Was it possible that she was destined for two people? That handsome, charismatic and kind man Marcus had the same scent as Ethan, that sexy, dangerous and depicable man. What what if Ethan had lied to her? Could Marcus smell in her the same as he smells her? There were too many questions that had no answers, and Ruby couldn't deal with them. The uncertainty was killing her. Are you okay? Marcus acts, looking at her with a special twinkle in his brown eyes. Ruby felt it was the first time anyone had looked at her like this. Could she be imagining everything? It did not matter. She had to get out of there, one way or another. If her doubts were true and her finger was still bleeding, both her and Marcus were in danger. What? He asked in confusion. She was so deep in her head that he had barely understood the words of the man who stood before her eyes. Yes, yes, I am perfect, with her words she added a weak smile to show more security. Immediately, the look of concern that the brunette had softened, but it did not go away. Is it true you can be destined to be with someone? She asked herself. 
she could feel the tension that was between their bodies. Every nerve in her anatomy begged to jump into the arms of that man. Her blue eyes surveyed the brown ones merging with them. They were beautiful. Would Marcus accept her hug? What are you doing here? It was the only thing she managed to say. Marcus was too old to be at that bar, but to be honest, she just wanted to change the subject. His chestnut's cheeks turned pink, and Ruby thought it was the cutest thing she had seen in a long time. It's a bit embarrassing, but I live a few blocks from here, and I was bored, so I decided to walk around the block, and I was lucky I guess, he smiled. So he was happy to see her, she thought, with a certain hint of happiness that she was not going to show. Well, I think I should go home. She got up with difficulty, wincing. Her back ached since all the hits she took on the dance floor. It hurts a little, said the brunette as he approached her, losing all the shame he had suffered seconds ago. Now he exuded confidence. Ruby took a few steps back. The fence made everything worse. The scent intensified, and she accidentally let out a sigh of pleasure. Marcus looked at her pleased, with a perfect smile that made his eyes look slanted. He placed his large, masculine hands on the girl's back, inspecting that nothing was broken and at the same time, enjoying the innocent little touch. Ach, she laughed as she tried to lower her nerves. His touch made her reach the sky, it was a delight. She started feeling an intense heat inside, it felt like she was in an oven, she wanted to throw herself into his arms and kiss every part of his manly body. But she couldn't. She was just figuring out what is going on, didn't even know if Marcus was aware of the bond they shared. You have a horrible bruise, he whispered gravely as he placed his hands on her small waist and turned the girl to face each other. Ruby felt her control diminish every second, she felt that the brunette was looking at her as if she were unique, special. Quite the opposite of how Ethan looked at her. At this point, the only thing that prevented her from throwing herself at the brunette was her insecurity. What if everything was being made up by her? What if Marcus just wanted to hook up with a girl at the bar, and she was the only one available? The brunette began to close the distance between them with tortuous slowness. Their ragged breaths mingled and they both desperately wanted more. The brunette didn't want to just kiss him, she wanted to get closer until she could no longer get under his skin if possible. What he felt had no words to be described. With one hand on the brunette's waist and the other on her cheek, he brought her face closer, guided by those beautiful and captivating blue eyes. She was about to kiss him, there were only a few millimeters left, until she thought of Athan, her dream, and a feeling of guilt invaded her to the bone. She thought he was going to move away but he didn't, he didn't want to. She reminded herself that she had seen Ethan with a whore in the bathroom a few long minutes ago and allowed herself give in to her strongest desires. She launched herself and finally met with the hot guy's juicy, tempting, rosy lips. She never experienced such sensations. She felt like a fire inside her was igniting with such intensity and force that she knew immediately that it would never go out. Marcus's pink lips moved with such precision over hers that they both felt it hadn't been their first kiss. They knew each other's movements, their tastes. Ruby had the luxury of gently biting Marcus's lower lip, and Marcus could only moan and squeeze her waist more intensely in response. She put her small and fine hands on the nape of other to avoid falling after so many sensations, it seemed unreal. She tugged at the surprisingly soft and short brown hair. He couldn't fight what they were both feeling, and the kiss confirmed that he wasn't the only one who felt that way. Everything was perfect, just as it should be, until a voice echoed across the street. What the hell are you doing? The voice sounded raspy, aggressive, and detonated imminent danger. Like seeing a plane on the verge of crashing and knowing that there would be no survivors. The brunette quickly separated, trying not to feel bad after seeing the look of surprise and pain that Marcus gave her when she pushed him away. Ethan approached, taking strong and determined steps towards Ruby, and she feared for Marcus's safety without thinking, Ethan had shown to be incredibly strong, bordering on the supernatural. Despite her fear and concern for Marcus, he placed her behind him in a primitive, instinctive way. Her body was squandering tension. I'm not going to repeat myself, what do you think you're doing? 
Ruby closed her eyes. Her dizziness from the alcohol had completely disappeared, being replaced by cold terror. Ethan could tear Marcus apart, he was a vampire, and Marcus just a human, was he? What do you think you're doing? He axed with determination. The human closed her eyes, she couldn't watch Ethan tear Marcus apart. The question is, what are you doing? The girl's former savior answered confidently, surprising her. Sorry. He gave a cold, empty laugh. You're the one who was making out with my girl. Yes, she is mine. The aforementioned opened her eyes wide. Your girl? She is nobody's. I told you I'm not yours, remember? She couldn't help but bring out her impulsive personality, though she felt pathetic as she was standing behind Marcus's broad back, eyeing Ethan cautiously. Because I am dumb and weak. She quoted him and watched with pain how Ethan's face was transformed for a few seconds into a sore one. She stupidly wanted to go and comfort him, but she couldn't, not after all the damage he had inflicted on her. You are mine, he gasped because of the rage that ran through his veins. No, she is not. Marcus intercepted. She's not yours, you fucking moron. He spat furiously and the blue-eyed woman gave him a hug him from behind. Ruby felt so confused. She was in the middle of a fight between the men that she was almost certain both were her destiny, she could not encourage either, nor could she stand still and see how they both suffered. Her mind and heart would end up driving her crazy. Let go of him. He stared at his human, and she observed how that face that she had seen so many times as an unbreakable iceberg, was broken. She clearly is with the one she wants to be with. She is anything but yours. He already wanted to sweep the floor with the chestnut and, that last phrase was enough to end with Ethan's patience. Marcus pushed Ruby back as gently as he could and lunged toward meeting Ethan, as this one was heading his way full of anger and with his fists clenched. The human gasped as she saw those two collide and heard grunts, broken bones, and groans of pain. Stop it. Her scream was directed towards the possible vampire, but he just ignored her. You are going to kill him. She cried. Seeing that none of her screams had an effect on Ethan, she looked at the cut that decorated her finger. It had stopped bleeding a few minutes ago. She thought for a few seconds what to do, until she made up her mind. She brought her finger to her mouth and bit down with all her might. She stretched his skin as far as he could, trying to ignore the sharp, concentrated pain. The man she had just met and who was also her destiny was in danger and couldn't let something bad happen to him, despite the little time she had spent with him. Finally, a few crimson drops began to gush from her finger, and that was enough to get the attention of the supposed vampire. He pounced on her and laid her on the floor with little delicacy. She felt his back vibrating with pain, her legs felt like jelly and not to mention how sore her head was. She felt like she was losing her mind but still looked at Ethan. His eyes were red and two sharp white fangs protruded from his lips. She no longer had any doubts. Ethan was definitely a vampire. Has he hurt you? He hissed in her ear, causing the human to shiver. She shook her head. No, I didn't want you to hurt him so you didn't give me a choice, now I'm sure of what you are. What I am? He asked amused. It entertained him to see how a human tried to decipher what he was without losing her head in the attempt, although he knew that she was incapable of losing it. She wondered what had happened to Marcus, so she turned her head and found an image she never expected to see. Marcus was lying on the floor, motionless, as if he were dead. Her eyes widened in terror, and she looked at the vampire above her. You're a fucking monster. She screamed in pain for the death of Marcus, a man she had only just met but who had given her too much hope. He tried to get rid of the vampire, but her attempts were in vain. You have murdered a guy for the love of God. Her eyes were covered with tears. The emptiness that had gripped her chest was unbearable. She needed that man in her life, that man she hardly knew. And she also needed Ethan, just imagining losing one to be with the other filled her with pain. But there was no escape. 
She had already lost the charismatic brunette who had soothed her in her car accident. She would not tolerate losing the self-centered vampire as well. Even if he was an evil monster, she could not control what she was feeling. Make the pain stop, she begged, unable to stop her tears. He gripped the vampire's shirt tightly and pulled him closer. She needed his touch, no matter how toxic it might be. Pain? He asked with nerves in his voice, and Ruby recognized the fear in his eyes. Has he hurt you? He grabbed her head with both hands and forced her to look at him. He didn't hurt me, on the contrary. A tear slid down her cheek, running the long way to her neck. The only one who has hurt me is you. Is it possible that she has two ties? Athan's voice echoed through the room, awakening the human who upon hearing the word, ties, was forced her to wake up and listen to the entire conversation by her brain, W. Guile maintaining the appearance of being asleep. I know dad. His tone of voice surprised Ruby. It was not his typical cold tone. So it's impossible for someone to have blood ties with two people, but this human somehow has? Shit. He kicked an object with force, Ruby did not know what it was since she could not open her eyes. No, I didn't kill him, he said dryly. Ruby automatically felt those four words stir chills through all of her nerves. Was he referring to Marcus? He W wasn't dead, after all. She was thinking anxiously. Okay, bye. He ended the call, and that's when Ruby decided it was time to wake up. She slowly opened her eyes and saw him sitting on the side of the bed, resting his hand right next to his thigh. His top was removed, leaving him naked from the waist up. His eyes showed a sadness that she had never seen before, and she wanted to comfort him. You sleep too much, have they ever told you? Ruby was in her room. She was only wearing a dark shirt and her underwear. She immediately knew she was wearing the shirt that he had before. He finally placed his right hand on her bare thigh, and his left placed it on her cheek, caressing her. Yes, she did her best to smile, how did I get here? His gaze hardened but instantly changed to a smile. Last night you passed out from the pain at the thought that Marcus had died, and he didn't. His tone of voice showed that talking about the subject was not something he wanted to do, and Ruby wanted to let him know that she did not like the idea of having two blood ties either and that she would never have chosen him. Can you explain to me what is going on, please? He doubted it for a moment, but it did not take long for him to agree. Of course. If you don't understand something, just let me know, she smiled at him. You were right. I'm a vampire. I doubt you want to know how many years I've been in this world. Ruby's face turned into a curious grimace, and then he added. I am 1448 years old. I was converted by Arthur, my father, at the age of 20. He is not my biological father, I never met my real father. He was the one who adopted me and changed my life. It hasn't been easy though. I have done a lot of things that I regret, and I always will. His gaze turned cold and distant, but in a second he recovered, as if nothing had happened. Any doubts so far? What things have you done? She asked fearfully. She was always a girl with great a curiosity, not to mention that her impulsiveness did not help her at all. If you don't want. No, he interrupted, scaring her. I don't want to talk about it, and I never will. He cleared his throat, closing that topic. I see humans as food because they are, and since they made my existence miserable me for my entire human life, I will treat them the same way for my entire vampire life. Ruby stayed in silence for a couple seconds, and then acts. I see, now, talk to me about those blood ties, he took a moment before speaking, thinking about how to explain the situation as best as possible. For millions of years superhuman creatures, so to speak, such as lycanthropes, demons, witches, and many others, have had their destinies marked by two gods. Aphrodite and Eros, the goddess of love and the god of desire, according to legend. In short, each one of us is as destined to have a twin soul, who which will share our existence with. It has always been in a way that two supernatural beings are the ones meant to be together, never of us, with a human. But your case is different, for two damn reasons. When he didn't speak, Ruby added. And those are? Ruby. 
He smiled wearily, as if his own situation amused him. You are a fragile human, and you are tied to two supernatural creatures. Not one, two. The brunette felt her heart stop. Has she heard correctly? Had Athan said two supernatural creatures? Marcus. What is he? She murmured, terrified by the answer. Marcus is a fucking lycanthrope ruby. And lycanthropes are our fucking enemies. Arr. Why do you talk like I'm like you? They are not my enemies, they are the enemies of vampires, she whispered in a small voice, but with determination running through her veins. Oh dear Ruby, you will become one of us, you will be a vampire, and that is, whether you like it or not. O9 oh, Captive What? I don't think so. I'm perfectly fine being human. She got up from the bed, looking for her clothes with her eyes. I don't want to live forever? I don't even have a future planned for my short life. He shook his head. Ruby, he mumbled, trying to keep his patience. There was no way he was going to let Ruby die, much less let that idiot Marcus take advantage of the situation. I will not let you be a weak human, even less let that idiot transform you into one of them. He can turn me into a wolf? Oh God! She said in a confused tone. None of that was easy to process. She was a little fond of vampires and werewolves, not much because of the cliches, when she thought they were just fantasy. But because it was very different, imagine being around them, after being aware, they were a reality. You will never be a wolf, never. His tone of voice detonated determination and coldness. I'll never allow it. Not even ten wolves could go against me. He crossed his arms, watching her wander around her room, looking for her clothes, ignorant to the fact that he had thrown them away. You, you so arrogant. It is not arrogance, pretty, it's reality. He walked towards the closet and took out of it a long beautiful black dress. Here, he placed it on the bed, put this on, we'll go out for dinner. We'll have company. Marissa will come, she's my sister, so to speak. Your sister? She asked in confusion. I never would have thought that this cold and beautiful man had a family. And why is she coming? We had a pending meeting. My father started a vampire nest almost a hundred years ago. You could say it is a group of people who were transformed by the same vampire and share that bond in common. We, however, do not live together. That's why we have meetings a few times a month. At least my father goes to those meetings. Family reunions are not my thing. He waved his hand dismissively. Can you just skip them? Just like that? Of course I can. I can do what I want. He stared at her. I was his first son, so to speak, and technically I am the most powerful. And thus, no one can tell me what to do. He looked at the dress, remembering something. By the way, Marissa is a hairstylist and makeup artist. I'm sure she'll like your style. Do all of those vampires think the same as you about humans? Can they harm me? He approached his human slowly, the soles of his shoes echoing against the hard wooden floor. He placed his cold hands on her cheeks and gave her a chaste but long kiss on the lips. My father would never hurt you because he knows who you are, and if my brothers put a finger on you, I would kill them in the blink of an eye. With no mercy. Nobody touches what is mine. He smiled. Marissa. In less than two seconds, a woman, about twenty-five years old, extremely beautiful, made her entrance. Her black hair fell to the height of her hips, her blue, almost white eyes attracted attention, as if they were a pair of captivating lanterns. Her skin seemed to be made of fine and fragile porcelain, but she was not fragile at all. Ruby felt like a mess compared to that cold and beautiful lady. Wow. She is very beautiful, she walked to Ruby, but her words were directed at her brother. You've gotten yourself a very pretty human. Don't you have any siblings by chance, darling? Ruby shyly denied. What a shame, you look so appetizing, she flashed her long thin white fangs just to scare her, for she wasn't suicidal. In less than a second, a crack echoed through the room, chilling Ruby's bones. Marissa was on the ground, motionless. 
Ethan had broken her neck as easily as you would crack your fingers. You killed her. Ruby screamed, horrified by the ease with which the vampire had killed her. I didn't kill her. He started as he walked towards her. She wasn't even alive to begin with, she will wake up in a few hours. The scariest thing is how pissed she'll be when she wakes up. He waved his hand with a gesture of dismissing it, before calling his servants so they carry her body away. Why did you do it? I am sure she just wanted to scare me. Are you sure? She was thinking of biting you. If she hadn't do it today, she would have keep teasing you until she does. I couldn't allow that. She had to leer you belong to me. I'm not yours, Ethan. I am not a mere object. Yes, you are. He closed his eyes to calm himself as he inhaled deeply and then exhaled. Why do you want so much for me to say that I belong to you? I don't belong to anyone. You don't get it, do you? For us to be told that we belong to each other is much more than a mundane phrase, it's more than claiming our ownership over the other, and it's much more deep than a simple I love you. He brought his lips close to those of the human, and without prior warning he stamped them with ferocity, seeking to suck a few drops of that crimson liquid that drove him crazy. As quickly as it started, he pulled away from her, leaving a tiny wand on her lip. I think you better rest, go back to sleep. Ruby opened her eyes and the first thing she noticed was that she wasn't in her room, but Athens. She looked around, observing the handsome man reading in an armchair in the corner. What happened? Weren't we supposed to have dinner with your family? Change of plans, we'll go tomorrow, he replied without taking his eyes off the thick book. Why? He got up with difficulty from the bed, but not before feeling a ray of pain in her back. Shit, she muttered. What was that? He got up with impressive speed and held her, helping her sit up on the bed. Nothing, just my back, it hurts since yesterday. She looked at his deep, piercing eyes, they seemed beautiful to her. You have not answered my question. My father will be here by then, he's on a business trip right now. It would be better to just wait until he can be with us. That'll also give Marissa the chance to attend. Maybe this time she'll behave. Ah, your friend Phoenix has been calling you all day, well, since last night actually. Shit. She cursed. She had completely forgotten about her parents and friends. I have to leave now. Where are the clothes I had on yesterday? The vampire cleared his throat uncomfortably. I threw them in the trash, they were very dirty, he lied. Ruby got up and checked the first drawer to the right of the closet. All her clothes were there, absolutely everything. What is this, Athan? Um, your clothes? He answered as if it weren't the most obvious thing in the world. Yes, exactly, my clothes. She looked at him angrily. Yeah. I. I forgot they were there. Oh, you forgot. Said Ruby in an incredulous tone. Yes said Ethan, for the first time showing a hint of nervousness in his expression. For the first time, that dangerous cold guy was acting in a cute way, even if he wasn't aware of it. Ethan Ruby scolded him. All right, I put them there. It's just that? I didn't want you to leave. Ethan, I can't live here. She grabbed her clothes and went into the bathroom to get dress. Of course you will, more so now that there's a fucking lycanthrope wandering around trying to steal you from my side. He sounded annoyed. Ethan, even if you don't know it, before I met you, I already had a life, you know? You are not the center of the world, she replied, frustrated. She couldn't leave her home just like that, her parents would never allow it. Am I not? He said casually as he looked at her with a charming face. Ah. Uh, I will not spend energy answering that. I'm going home, and I want you to return all my clothes to where they were. If that's what you want, he said, amused. Yes, that's exactly what I want. He smiled. Your heartbeat tells me otherwise, you are so obvious. You don't understand? Ethan, I have a life, I have to go to school, my parents would never allow me to leave my house, even less to be with a stranger, what would I even tell them? Make a family dinner, he muttered, leaving the human stunned. 
Was a vampire really telling her to make a family dinner? What? Are you? Sure. Do you really want to throw the hell of my father's questions? Of course, why not? It will be fun. She looked at him incredulously. Okay then, eight o'clock? She asks, hoping the vampire would refuse. Sounds great. I'll be there and you'll see that I'll convince them, he smiled to calm her down. We are destined, Ruby. Once we meet, we cannot be apart. It would be painful to us. Don't tell me you haven't felt it. Ruby believed his words completely. She liked being with Ethan no matter how much he scared her at times. Her heart was happy when she was with him. You better behave and don't ruin it or else. She tried to threaten. Or else what? Remember that I am bigger and stronger than you. Ethan, you are 1448 years old. What could an old man like you do? She whispered amused as she approached him. She still wasn't 100% sure she was doing the right thing, but she wanted to take a chance. He placed his hands around the small waist of the human, eliminating the distance that separated them, and connected their lips in a soft beat. They built for a few minutes slowly, enjoying the moment. Let me show you what I can do. Slowly Ethan made his way to the bed, sitting on it, and Ruby took the hint, so she climbed onto his lap and sat down comfortably. Her heart was pounding with nerves and anticipation. I think you'll love what this old man can do, he spoke between kisses, stealing a smile from Ruby. I have to go, Ethan. She parted his lips with one last kiss and headed for the bedroom door. How are you going to go? You don't have a car, he said, worried. I'll walk, she said as she found the exit door. The house was gigantic, elegant, almost colonial, and perhaps a little ghostly as well. You won't walk alone, I'll take you, Ruby. His voice came from behind her, determined. Ruby looked at him from top to bottom, he looked like a Greek god, he was so hot he made her go crazy. His tall, well-built body was unmatched. His veins, thick under his translucent skin, were marked like rivers, but what was that red mark that he had on his clavicle? Fuck. It was lipstick. He still had the fucking lipstick from that whore in the club marked in his body. She felt her blood boil inside her. There was no going back, she couldn't pretend she didn't see it. I don't need your fucking help, I never needed it and I never will, she exploded as he opened the door, confusion and surprise painting Ethan's face. Why don't you go help that whore from yesterday, huh? The confusion disappeared from his face, being replaced by guilt. I'm sorry, I didn't want to. I wasn't in my right mind. Fuck off, Ethan. Her eyes filled with tears. Why hadn't he removed her lipstick? Did he want to hurt her? You still have marking right on the fucking collarbone, she pointed out. Instinctively, he brought his hand up to the spot, feeling bad for hurting Ruby. He had never felt like this, guilty. He didn't like it at all, he felt weak again, he felt human. I told you I am sorry. If you don't want to listen, I should just go to hell, right? He snapped angrily. He couldn't help but not get defensive, not after feeling almost human, was he terrified of how Ruby was changing him. His words stabbed into the human's wounded heart. You're an idiot, you and that bitch can go fuck wherever you want, you have my full support, she lied. We will. He spoke, pretending to be indifferent. Rebellious tears trickled down Ruby's face. She was about to leave without saying anything more, but her strong pride and impulsiveness came to light, wanting to hurt him for hurting her. Have fun, just like I will with Marcus. Ethan's eyes widened, not expecting that. That man does know how to kiss. She smiled triumphantly and slammed the door. Where the fuck is it? She murmured as she searched her pockets looking for her phone, she could have sworn she had grabbed it from the nightstand. Why did Athan's house have to be in the middle of the forest? Why? At least, she was lucky she had a couple more hours of sunlight left. She had been walking for minutes when she stepped on weak a branch accidentally, and the moment it broke, she fell to the ground hard, cursing in annoyance. Hey! Are you okay? A friendly voice echoed behind her. Her icy hands began to remove the grass that had stuck to her body due to the fall. She could not answer him, she was afraid. Has the cat got your tongue? 
He turned her around and positioned her in front of him. He didn't look friendly at all. He was extremely pale and had an English accent. He smiled showing two long fangs like the ones vampires had. I don't know you, excuse me. She pushed him away, feigning indifference. No, but I do know a man who recognizes you as his ruby. She stayed static in place. Did he know Ethan? It shouldn't matter to her. She didn't matter to him anyways. I don't care. She kept walking until his hand stopped her. I do. He smiled sadistically and then stuck his long fangs into the human's neck. Curiously for Ruby, this was the third time she woke up in a place that she had no idea where she was, and it frustrated her, because she was getting used to it. She got up from the cold floor, but not before wincing at the pain in her neck, and began to feel the walls looking for a way out. You won't be able to get out of here, no one can. A male voice echoed through the small dark room, scaring the human. He turned quickly and could barely see a man sitting against the wall, naked from the waist up and his hands chained. Who are you? Are you okay? SHR ran to help him. My name is Arthur, he coughed. I've been better, he smiled weakly but it looked more like a grimace. What's your name? She fumbled with the handcuffs, looking for a way to remove them, but he couldn't. They are special, my dear, you won't break them that easily. They are made of silver, ideal for a man like me, he said sarcastically. Your name, dear, tell me. Ruby, my name is Ruby. All trace of pain that the man carried disappeared as if he had been slapped. Ruby, why are you here? I don't know. And stranger attacked me in the forest while I was going home. That's all, remember, how are you sure there is no escape? Same thing, dear. I don't know why they have chained me here, but I do know who. He looked at her. What were you doing in the forest by yourself? Do you want the truth? She asked, and the man nodded. I fought with my boyfriend? Well, I don't even know what we are, but I know he's a fucking arrogant moron, so I ended up in the middle of the forest alone after I left his house, and that's where that strange man appeared, dot in, he bit me in the neck with his two fangs. He was immediately silent. What if Arthur didn't know about vampires and thought she was crazy? It wouldn't help her. He did what? Who was that fool, tell me? His tone sent a warning. Ruby knew immediately that the man must know something. I don't know. She looked at the ground, inhibited. Drawing strength from within, the man lifted his hands off the ground, burning his skin against the silver, sending shivers through Ruby's body due to the noise and smell of burning flesh. Despite the pain, he did not stop until the cuff on his neck started burning too much. Shit. He dropped his hands, more exhausted than before. Oh God, are you okay? She acts scared. Let me see your neck, it must be hurt. Ruby. Ethan, and... Marcus are going to be angry when they know, he muttered with difficulty before collapsing. Ruby's mind took a sharp turn. Did that weak and injured man know her? Did he know about her blood ties? Who was he and why were the two of them there? In a vain attempt to find calm, she drew as much air as she could into her lungs, catching a faint trace of that scent that drove her so crazy. How was it possible that she could smell his destined ones being in that dungeon? The only one there was that man. She moved closer to him and inhaled, brushing his neck with her nose. He was definitely the source of that smell, or at least it was pretty similar. That man smelled of Ethan. How? How was it possible? It took hours to find an answer, but she couldn't come up with one. She ended without energy and with strong waves of pain in her neck. Without thinking about the consequences, she leaned over the injured man carefully and tried to sleep. Her only comfort was waiting for this unknown man to help her, placing her trust in him and her sense of smell. She inhaled and appreciated his scent one last time, before falling asleep. 10. Save me. As far as her poor mind remembered, Ruby had already been in that horrible dungeon for at least five days. Twice a day a plate of food would appear in front of her, if it can be called that, as all it had some strange semi-liquid substances. 
Her skin was whitish, almost cadaverous due to poor food intake and complete lack of sun. Arthur was no better. As the days passed, he spoke less and less, not because of his whim, but because the simple act of speaking involved too much effort for what little energy he had left. It hadn't been too difficult for Ruby to discover that this handsome, weak man was a vampire, and that, in some way or another, was related to Athan, her vampire. Drink from me, she insisted again, she had already lost count of how many times she had said that phrase to him, you need it, you need it, after the harm those silver chains caused you please. No. The weakness was palpable in his voice, although the strong tone of decision did not give rise to hope. And stop tempting me, he shook his head repeatedly, trying to convince himself more than the human. You will die if you don't drink from me. He gave a hollow laugh, devoid of feeling. Die. Ruby, I'm almost two thousand years old. I'm immortal. He swallowed hard. I can go decades without drinking blood without dying. I would lose all my motor functions but technically I would still be alive, in my mind. Since she had discovered the truth about Arthur, Ruby had not stopped processing all the information that that vampire gave her. You are very weak, and when I plan my escape you will have to help me, I cannot do it alone. Our kidnappers are vampires for God sake. Ah. He grimaced in disgust. Don't even remind me. You are right anyway. He was silent, thinking, struggling. After what seemed like years, he responded. No. Definitely no, I can't. He flatly denied. What? She questioned, disappointed, trying to find a position that doesn't hurt her stiff limbs so much. Why not? I can't do that to Ethan. He looked at his chains, sorry. Ruby sighed. Her head ached, and she couldn't tolerate so much mystery with such a headache. Just tell me the truth. What are you for Athan? I know him, that's all. No, you are something more than that. That is why you care so much about me, and why you risk your well-being for him. You are, you are his father, aren't you? His creator, he finally admitted. I am who made him what he is today. Ruby was about to reply but fell silent when she heard murmurs behind the door. She crawled toward the corner, enduring the pain that position gave her knees. Perhaps this was an opportunity to escape. The wide silver door opened and a large man entered. The room was very dark and the shadows could hardly be distinguished, but even so Ruby pounced on the man without hesitation twice, she had to escape from there. She grabbed him by the shoulders, and then started pulling his hair with all her might. Enough for God's sake. Ruby it's me. An extremely familiar voice screamed, and she felt her heart stop and her lungs expel all the air they had inside, to replace it with the sweet scent that drove her so crazy. With trembling legs, she got off the man. And Marcus. She said stuttering. A dizziness took her by surprise, and before she felt herself fall, his strong arms held her, preventing her from falling and giving her the emotional security she needed in those moments. God Ruby, he whispered, his voice cracking. You don't know how much I missed you, he hugged her tightly, and the human couldn't hold back the tears any longer. She cried on his shoulder for a long time as the werewolf assessed her body by touching her, looking for wounds, until she remembered that Arthur was there too. You lost weight, Marcus acknowledged, unaware that insecurity invaded Ruby's body as if it were dust. That doesn't matter now, you're safe. Let's get out of here. He held her tight, but Ruby managed to free herself to run towards Arthur. Help me get him out of here, the chains are made of silver and he couldn't break them. Get out of here, Ruby, the vampire muttered with difficulty. I'm just a delay, you go. My entire pack is here, capturing those who did this to you. No one will hurt neither of you, Marcus clarified as he broke the chains with great ease. He put one of the vampire's arms over his shoulder and carried him, while with his free hand he held rubies and directed them towards the exit, towards freedom. As soon as they left the cell Ruby had to suppress several wretches, she could not tolerate the strong smell of iron, of blood. If it hadn't been for the fact that there was no light in the dungeon, she could have perfectly seen all the corpses in the cells, scattered on the ground, surrounded by pools of blood. She promised herself to look only at Marcus. 
The place was full of transformed lycanthropes, but they were not simple wolves as she had thought. They were big creatures with blue and yellow eyes, covered in fur. They had sharp claws and fangs, but still one could distinguish that human trait. A chill ran through her from head to toe. Will Marcus look like this? Can Marcus scare her if he's transforms? The answer was no. Things were different with Marcus, just as they were with Ethan. Ruby, she heard someone say her name. Ethan. Her pulse quickened like never before, and even with a pulse of pain from the last time she had seen him, she ran towards him, without even thinking about it, her legs acting on their own. She dodged the corpses and the blood as best she could, and leapt into his arms, feeling more secure than she had ever felt having his strong big arms wrapped around her. Tears sprang to her face again, she couldn't stop herself. Despite feeling Marcus's discomfort from afar, she didn't pull away. She did not want to. You left me, she whispered close to his neck, still crying. He just held her tightly without hurting her, while stroking her dirty hair. I would never do that, you know, Thag. He gave a laugh that turned into a sob in the middle. He had been so scared without her. How are you? Are you hurt? He gently separated her from his body and visually inspected her, tensing as he reached her neck. His features immediately furrowed, and his eyes turned redder than Ruby had ever seen. His body was covered in other people's blood, Ruby noticed and got tense. Who bit you? How many times? He axed angrily. His irises weren't the only thing that wasn't red. The color had spread throughout his eyeball, corrupting everything, polluting, spreading like a deadly plague. I, I don't know who bit me, she admitted, it was him who kidnapped me in the forest. She looked down, embarrassed. He grabbed her chin and forced her to look into his eyes. The red had returned to his iris, responsibly to the human's shame. You don't have to be ashamed. It wasn't your fault. He smiled without showing his teeth. Ruby was surprised to see him so calm, but she knew there must be some reason. Athan. A whisper interrupted his moment. Arthur, lying on the floor, getting weaker and weaker. Dad. Athan yelled fearfully. He grabbed hold of Ruby and walked over to him, pushing Marcus out of the way. Bring me someone's blood, now. Sir, this location is more than three hours from anywhere where there are humans, approached a fearsome werewolf. He won't last that long, Athan wailed, scared. He told me he can't die, Ruby intervened, confused. Athan stared at her for a split second, then looked down at his father. He will starve and dry up, he will not die, but it will take a century for him to return to his original form. A century unconscious, a century of nightmares and his mind hunting him. He muttered. It is one of the worst tortures. Nightmares? Vampires don't dream, Marcus questioned, earning a murderous glare from the vampire. Believe me, yes, we fucking do. There is nothing worse, he whispered sadly. I am fine, son. Arthur spoke as best he could, but obviously that was a lie. I want to give him my blood, Ruby interrupted determinedly. No. Ethan and Marcus exclaimed in unison. I am going to decide what to do with my blood, and I want to do it. Arthur helped me a lot these five days, more than you two have helped me in these ten days, she replied with annoyance, and both creatures fell silent. He crouched over to where the two vampires were, and looked at Marcus. Cut my neck with one of your claws, please. No, there's no way I'm supporting this ruby, he crossed his arms, doubt marking every expression on his face. He stopped me from being abused, Marcus, Ruby cried, destroyed. Even with the silver chains hurting every part of his body, he prevented a vampire from abusing me. The atmosphere became tense, no one dared to speak until the werewolf left the doubt behind, and then had no choice but to start cutting Ruby's neck with extreme care. Ethan couldn't speak, he had been dumbfounded, looking nowhere in particular, thinking about all the torture he was going to do to that damned vampire who did this. Come on, Arthur, she placed his neck as close to the vampire's lips as possible, hoping it wasn't all in vain. A few minutes passed, and Arthur was still drinking. Ethan tried to separate him from her neck, but he couldn't, he was very strong. Arthur, you're hurting me, she murmured to stop him, beginning to feel fear creeping through her body. 
Do something. Marcus yelled. If you don't do something I'll kill him myself. Dad. Stop. Now. It was the last thing Ruby heard before surrendering to the open arms of darkness. 11 Decisions She felt extremely relaxed, all her worries had evaporated from her system, taking all the weight off her shoulders. He could only hear the sound of her heavy breathing and that of her own heart beating slowly and deliberately. She heard voices and screams but far away. She couldn't make out the words that those emotionally charged voices were expressing. It took a few seconds, hours to her perception, until she managed to open her eyes. She was in a room designed in such a way that it seemed from another era, saturated colors, old-fashioned furniture, a dark wood floor. For some reason, she felt like she was in the vampire's room, Athens. The bed she was in was the largest size you could find, so soft that with her own weight she sank considerably. At her side, sitting in an armchair that looked just as comfortable as the bed, was Ethan. His head was lying on the bed, right next to Ruby's legs, who could not see his face due to the strong arms of the vampire getting in the way. She turned her face and found Marcus, sitting on the floor with his big back leaning against the wall. She took a calm breath, feeling how the essence of not just one, but of her two destined men entered through her nostrils, making her experience such a degree of pleasure that she never thought she would achieve with just her nose. Her breathing began to rage, shaking, turning her cheeks a rosy color thanks to the shame that possessed her. Both men shifted in their places, unconsciously perceiving the change that their girl was undergoing. Ruby, how are you feeling? Ethan questioned, watching her as she lifted her face from the overstuffed bed. She stared at him, stunned by his beauty. His features were sharp, his expression was almost like that of a feline. His deep eyes seemed to be lighter than usual, making him look so good. His lips, pink under the thin layer of facial hair, stood out, demanding of attention. Ruby gulped before answering. Well good, I think. I'm sorry I woke you up, he apologized, aware that because of her the vampire must have undergone great amounts of stress, adding to havoc in his sleep. Vampires don't sleep, Ruby. He smiled faintly. He was genuinely glad to be able to have her under his protection again. His mistakes had put her in too much danger, but this time it will be different, because now he is sure of how he feels about her. The week where he didn't have her, where he didn't know her whereabouts, it had been really hard both for him and Marcus. Neither man is confused regarding Ruby, not anymore. And that's an imminent danger, because they now both know what they wanted, and they both know what it would take to be with her. The human tried to get up, believing that she was already well enough to do so, failing catastrophically. However, before her weak anatomy collided with the cold surface of Athan's room, Athan held her firmly. Nothing would harm the human anymore, he would always be there to protect her, although he still did not know if he could protect her from himself. Ruby thanked him modestly, feeling Marcus's gaze fixed on her, almost as if he was recriminating something. He walked over to her and hugged her tightly, without hurting her though. He wanted to convey all the love he felt towards her, to show her that he could take care of her and himself, because he is not like vampires, cold and soulless, he is a wolf, a direct descendant of the moon. They live for and by their herd, always watching their backs. Ruby responded to the hug as best she could, overwhelmed by the essence of both men, then she would ask Athan to open a window. Without warning, a stabbing pain, similar to that of a needle, attacked the human's throat. She broke away from the werewolf, scared that she didn't understand what was happening to her. Ruby, look at me, Marcus demanded, never losing the sweetness so characteristic of his voice. What's wrong? Simple. Ethan stepped between the werewolf and the human, using his very own tone of voice, deep, determined, and intimidating, without even noticing it. After all, he was like that and he wouldn't change for anyone. The fact that he wanted to protect Ruby even with his own life was not going to change because of his miserable way of expressing himself. It is normal. Normal? Ruby questioned, looking at both men with fear tattooed on her pretty and not-so-innocent face. Why do I feel this? What is it? She paced to the other end of the room, struggling to establish as much distance between those two men. 
My father. Arthur, he drank a little too much. I am sorry, Ruby. He began to approach her, nothing would prevent him from being close to his Ruby, absolutely nothing. He needed to have contact with her skin, 24 hours a day, every day. You were dead for a few minutes, quite a few. He needed to take measures so we could bring you back to life, and it had a cost. Please try to understand Ruby, Marcus mused, desperate to ease his loved one anguish. We had no other choice. He wanted to say something else but held back, he couldn't be so selfish to say how much it had cost him. We really had no choice, pretty, Ethan said with the look of, of guilt in his eyes. No choice? What are you talking about? Ruby, you're not human anymore, Marcus answered her question, guilt always emanating from his gaze, genuinely sorry for the situation. Am I, am I a vampire? Something like that, Ethan said casually. He felt no guilt, no anguish. If he didn't like something about that situation, it was that stupid Marcus with his nasty wolf smell was present. Besides, he would be struck by lightning before letting Ruby be alone with him. W what, what is going on? Explain it to me right now or leave right now, she threatened, and when she saw how her vampire wanted to hug her she screamed. Stay away. Tell me what is going on, Ethan. Ah. You are a vampire, you probably already assumed that but you had died, and a perished being cannot become immortal, we had to carry out desperate acts. The wolf spoke clearly, trying to choose his words as accurately as possible. What did you do to me? Marcus gave Athan a look to keep him silent. He didn't want him to tell her in his very particular and blunt way of speaking. We had to contact her a very powerful witch named Demasia. She owed me a favor, because I saved his life maybe fifty years ago. Fifty years? Ruby doubted she had heard correctly, Marcus hardly looked thirty years old. Stop, she demanded. How old are you? Marcus looked at her with pled in his beautiful eyes. That same witch made me immortal, Ruby. I'm almost eighty years old, I was twenty-nine when she cast the spell. Oh wow. Okay. I'm going to need more time to process all the that. She warned. Keep telling me and please hurry up, the thirst is becoming unbearable. Ethan stiffened beside her. He wanted to give her everything she needed. He would even give her his own blood if she needed. Demasia turned you into a hybrid, Ruby, the vampire interrupted bluntly. He wouldn't let his loved one's thirst get any stronger, just because of trying to explain things to her with unicorns and rainbows. Things are the way they are, and it was better to face them. Ruby will have to mature. She was strong. She could take it. Equals you are one of the few hybrids out there. Ruby's soul fell at her feet. Not only was she a vampire, but she felt like she was some sort of experiment, created by the two men who made up her love life. Who do you think you are to make such a decision about my future? She questioned, reproach marked in her blue eyes. You've ruined my life. The last thing I want is to drink blood, and I don't want to live forever. She fall to her knees on the cold wooden floor. She looked at Marcus. She was not surprised that Ethan had committed such a selfish deed, after all she knew he was like that, it was his essence. But Marcus, why had he done that to her, she thought differently about him. She has two blood ties and could only be with one of them, hurting the other and herself by choosing one, but how could she be with either of both after what they did to her? She couldn't stay in that room, overwhelmed with her new knowledge, overwhelmed with their sense, which she now perceived even stronger than before, it was too much. She walked to the exit, determined to go and get some fresh air. There was no way she was going to drink from someone. She wasn't like that, and if she had to fight her own nature, she would. Don't you want to know what kind of being you are? Ethan asked, hitting the spot before Ruby even touched the door handle. She knew he was enjoying this. I'll find out myself, thanks. With that, she withdrew slamming the door, feeling automatically better as she left the room. She believed that once she accepted that she know was a supernatural being, she could control her new gifts, but far from controlling them, she could not notice any difference, she couldn't even run like her vampire did.
However, it all would change the moment she stated getting thirsty, a thirst that she's never felt before. It was almost like she had never truly felt thirst before. But now she did. Did she need blood? Water? She didn't know and wasn't sure she wanted to know. She wandered the streets for what she thought were hours until she found a little bar on the corner. People were crowding at the entrance to enter, so she decided to hide among a group of girls and maintain her position until she could enter with the rest. Once inside she would think about what to do, whether to choose a victim or ask for a soda. Not many minutes passed, and Ruby was already at the bar. The lights were almost out, the music was at the highest point of the night, and in a few minutes they would turn on a smoke machine. It was the perfect setting to avoid attracting attention. I love your contact lenses. A girl about her age came over and took her arm. She looked totally drunk and to confirm it, she noticed that she was carrying an empty glass in her hand. Her breath smelled of cherry and vodka. She resisted the urge to walk away, choosing to look at her in confusion. Where do you get those kind of lenses? They are incredible. Although the color red, if you allow me to give my opinion, tends to look a bit too fake, I like the amber tone better. Ruby scowled at her, taking stern steps back. Red? Amber? What the hell was that girl talking about? She backed away as far as possible, facing for the ladies' room with her eyes fixed on the floor. She didn't want anyone to look at her. Once in the bathroom, it took all her effort not to let out a cry. Her iris, which used to be a wonderful sky blue, were completely corrupted by two colors, red and bright amber. The two merged in a kind of deadly dance, giving her the appearance of a complete monster. No. She yelled, slapping her knuckles on the mirror as she fell back into reality. Ethan and Marcus transformed her into themselves, half vampire, half lycanthrope. She dropped to the dirty floor, almost catatonic. Her mind could only think that she was only a strange monster to the human world, or even to the supernatural world. Ethan himself said she was one of the few that existed. She was now immortal. An immortal being with two ties. How could they do this to me? She whispered. She was dancing among all the sweaty people, completely put of her mind. As the minutes passed, she felt weaker and weaker. She had a hard time assimilating the idea that her body was now asking for human blood. About half an hour ago, she tried to quench her thirst by drinking water. Three whole bottles later, she still felt awful or even worse. So there he was, in the middle of the dance floor, thinking that she should choose her victim, carefully, it must be both delicious in taste and aroma. Having recently come out of a locked room with her two soulmates worked against her, as both of her men had a fantastic smell that drove her crazy. Her eyes, still under the effects of the transformation, fixed on a boy, he was alone at the bar, he should be in his early twenties. His hair was blonde and he had a nice muscular body, he was not bad at all, and he smelled good, he was perfect. She approached him and without further ado took a seat next to him, confidently. When she was still in the bathroom crying, an overly kind girl approached her, worried. She was wearing a black lace dress that unfortunately for her, Ruby liked it, and was now wearing it. How's it going? She asked feigning innocence, while without him noticing, she adjusted the stolen dress. The blonde looked at her too, surprised by Ruby's confidence and beauty. It was not surprising as the transformation changed her physically, as is to be expected, but also mentally the thirst and her new instincts were now taking over. Her hair looked healthier than ever, her skin was glowing, and she had an intense look in her eyes that would captivate anyone. It was in the nature of vampires to be attractive, after all, they had to somehow seduce their victims. Nice to meet you. He returned the greeting and motioned for the waiter to bring Ruby a drink, but she stopped him with a lopsided smile. His throat felt like a carpet with a million needles, she was not to waste time. I'm Steve, you? Ruby, he replied, stroking the boy's chest slowly. You are very handsome. How about we go talk somewhere more private? Steve? The human smile widened, almost like a clown, and he nodded without hesitation. Murderous. That's what she was, or what she had become. He felt it until the last second of his poor human existence, wanting uselessly to cling to life. 
and worst of all, she enjoyed it, she never felt so powerful, she had never felt so many emotions at the same time, it was terrifying, but unlike a few minutes ago, she was no longer afraid. In fact, she wanted to feel it again. Isn't that why vampires didn't feel bad for murdering people? Perhaps it was because nature itself inclined them to. For Ruby, from one second to the next, she was not interested in anything but the pleasure of drinking. She separated her fangs from his neck and pushed the limp body away from hers. Steve fell to the ground with a thud, one more dead corpse in a dark alley. You weren't as tasty as I thought, she whispered, disappointed. She was not an idiot, she knew that despite having to experience so many emotions, she should also at the very least enjoy the taste of blood. And she did, just not as much as she thought, for moments he even felt sour. You want to know why? Ethan appeared behind her. He watched the scene with hints of amusement in the gleam of his dark eyes. He wouldn't deny that watching Ruby drink from a man turned him on as much as it infuriated him. His target turned to face him, giving him one of her worst glances. You're still upset from what I see, he added in a tone of obviousness. He knew the anger wouldn't last long. She was his destiny after all. Well, enlighten me, Ethan, she replied reluctantly but interested. Two reasons. First of all, you were created by me and Marcus. You are used to our scent. Nothing will ever be more delicious than the blood of your creator. A simple human could never compare. Second, coincidentally we are both linked to you, and the blood of your destined is. How to say it so that you understand? He pretended to think for a moment, always with a smile on his lips. Ruby meanwhile was staring at him, trying hard to hide everything her vampire made her feel. Well, you feel better than a junkie taking one of their lines, Ruby. Without stopping to think, Ruby took two steps toward him, wanting to taste his blood and see if he was telling the truth. Ethan stepped back, stunned. What are you doing? He shook his head, then fixed them on his hybrids. I see. If you want to actually enjoy this delicious blood, then you'll have to play by my rules. What are those, huh? She grunted, hunger devouring her. You can only drink from me, never from that filthy dog. Drink only from me and I will be all yours, whenever and wherever you want. Ha! If that's what you want, we have a deal. And without further ado she lunged to meet his vampire's neck, showing him for the first time the abnormal dimension of her fangs. A perfect mix of both species. Ethan kept the half-smile as Ruby drank from him, ecstatic. There is no turning back. 12. I can't do it without you. Enough, was all Eddie took for Ruby to separate her gigantic fangs from his neck, as much as her instincts screamed at the top of her lungs to keep drinking that cold, delicious blood. As she removed her fangs from the smooth skin, Ruby heard Ethan moan. She looked up at him with a raised eyebrow and a lopsided smile, pleased to provoke such feelings in him. Of course you provoke such sensations in me, you are my partner. As if his words were poison, Ruby quickly pulled herself out of his arms. Partner? After what happened, she did not know if she would be able to forgive him, much less think about a future at his side. I'm not your life mate, or at least I don't want to be, she said, impenetrable before the vampire's indecipherable gaze. After what happened? I'm not sure I still want to be by your side or Marcus's, if we are going the path of the blood ties. You belong to me. I don't belong to anyone, Ethan. Even less now. I am not an object, and now I am not human either. You will not be able to force me to stay by your side. I would never force you, he replied. Ruby rolled her eyes, they both knew that if she hadn't accepted it, he would have. He was a vampire, after all. One lacking in feelings and respect for humans or as he used to call them, meat bags. Anyway, we'll see how long that stupid idea that you don't belong to me lasts. In just two steps, he was already at her side, holding her by the waist with his characteristic superhuman strength. He drew her to his body and without further ado he stole a kiss, one that at first swore to be an innocent one, but with the passing of the seconds the temperature rose more and more. Ruby kept repeating to herself that she had to separate, nip the kiss in the bud, so she barely parted, taking great breaths of air even though she no longer needed it, 
The scent of her vampire was like torture for her now that she could feel stronger and more irresistible now, as it should be. Enough, she was the one ordering this time. She made a promise to Nix and she wouldn't let her down, especially when she hadn't made contact with him for so many days. Ethan's eyes gleamed, promising Armageddon. I know you want to go on, he said, his voice hoarse and a lopsided smile. I know I am always here. He pointed his index finger at her temple. The hybrid swallowed hard, her vampire not mistaken, but she couldn't screw up with the promise to Nix. She would have to speak to him and earn his blessing, in case she still wanted to be with Ethan. At the end of the day, she did have more important things to figure out. You're right, I do want to continue, she admitted in a seductive tone, observing his surprise and curiosity, but I made a promise, and until I clarify my feelings regarding you and Marcus, you'll have to be patient, handsome. Ruby watched as the vampire frowned, confused and annoyed at the idea, but it didn't affect her to watch him like that. Yes, her words hurt him, but he deserved it. She was still angry at his selfishness, just like with Marcus. Okay, I guess I understand, Dot, but let me tell you something. And what is that going to be? She asked using an amused tone, delusionally believing that Ethan would make some sexual comment or something similar. You'll end up forgiving me, Ruby. Your heart will always return to me. His eyes locked on hers, two great lanterns in the middle of the night. She will always return to your vampire. Those words hit her like a truck. Ruby, wake up. Her mother's sweet voice crept into her renewed ears. You're late for high school. School? The very idea of going and pretending to have a normal life made her want to laugh and go to a mental hospital. I'm up, she said and got up from her comfortable bed. Her throat itched, it was as if his flesh had been replaced by a dirty and worn carpet from the fifties. Without giving too many detours, she went to take a very hot shower and ignore it. Even for a single day, she would pretend to be an ordinary teenager, no vampires, werewolves, and bleeding humans. Once ready to leave, she sneaked through the kitchen, hoping her parents wouldn't speak to her. She wanted to be alone for the rest of the day, which, by the way, has only just begun. You look so pretty today, Ruby, her father said, his head nailed to the morning journal. Who do you want to impress? Ha ha. Oh wait, I thought you were joking, she replied reluctantly, thus attracting the attention of her mother, who knew her well enough to notice that something was wrong. Aren't you going to have breakfast? Her mother asked when she saw her grab her bag. His eyes scanned her up and down, and no doubt noted the grimace she made at the mere mention of human food. I'll have a coffee for breakfast on the way, I've gotten up with a queasy stomach, she lied, starting to face for the exit. Her father whispered a few words to her mother, tired of seeing his daughter hungover on weekdays. Unlike him, her mother knew that this time it was not about the alcohol and the parties, but that the problem went further. Ruby. Is everything all right? Yeah, she looked into her eyes and forced a smile, it's all great, my stomach is just a bit upset. Without giving any more room for unwanted questions, she left home. Her legs were shaking. Lying to parents never gave her the famous guilt, but this time it was different, she was also lying to herself. Acting as if she was okay, pretending to be a human, pretending not to know that sooner or later her parents, her friends and her entire family would find pass away, while she wouldn't. She would bury each one of them, body after body. She wiped her tears with the sleeve of her coat and walked to school. Where have you been all this time? The incessant voice of her friend Minerva brought her out of her reverie, her narrowed eyes looking at her from head to toe, just like her mother that morning. Of course, both women noticed something strange about her. She made room for her on the dining room bench, and Minerva accepted it gladly, roughly setting down her tray full of food. She made no comment when she didn't see Ruby's tray, who was quietly writhing on her nerves, racking her brains to give her a credible excuse. She was with me all weekend. A deep voice, accompanied by a sweet scent, joined the dining room table. No need to look in his direction, Ruby already knew who was next to her. Ruby. You haven't told me anything about. 
Marcus, my name is Marcus, the werewolf introduced himself, as charming and full of life as ever, so, so different from the vampire. We're just friends, she cut him off reluctantly before letting him spread his web of lies. The werewolf's grin suddenly faded, and Ruby had to suppress a triumphant smile. She was still mad at both of them, and they had to know she wouldn't let them go easily. Oh, I thought you were with Ethan all weekend, the blonde muttered confusedly, not noticing the hybrid's murderous stares, demanding that she keep quiet. No. Ruby watched as Marcus clenched his fists under the table. She was with me, I don't share. Not caring the context they were in, she got up from the table with speed. I'm not yours, Marcus, she snapped, noticing the anger boiling her blood. How many days had passed since she last drank? Two, three. It had been days since the last time she drank from her vampire, and truth be told, she no longer felt a mere carpet as a throat. Now the carpet was on fucking fire. Why the sudden change in mood? Marcus acts, staring into her eyes, and Ruby had a fit of anger as she imagined hitting him for being so direct in front of her friends, ignorant of the supernatural world. Why was he so proud? A voice inside her head laughed at the inconvenience, for that voice was more than aware that the hybrid was indeed more angry with the wolf than with the vampire. It was more than obvious, anyone with eyes would notice. I'm thirsty that's all, she confessed and the wolf's gaze forked. He guessed that the idea of a thirsty hybrid, which no one knows what it's capable of, was not good. Do you want my soda? Minerva offered, stealing a genuine laugh, but with slivers of irony. If only she knew what he wanted to drink. What did I miss? Nix placed his tray of food on the table carefully, taking a seat across from the wolf and the blonde, oblivious to the previous conversation. As he fixed his eyes on the wolf's, his expression turned serious. Who is he? Ruby pursed her lips at this. She could almost taste the jealousy and possession in his words. He's my friend, nothing more, she replied, ignoring the way the wolf stiffened beside her. Marcus got up from the table and looked at everyone with a fake smile, even though only Ruby recognized it as fake. Unfortunately, I have to go. Nice to meet you all. He smiled at both friends, then fixed his gaze on her. Goodbye, Ruby. Once the three of them were alone, Nix and Minerva were talking about their weekends, while Ruby remained in what appeared to be a catatonic state, expending all her energy to hide the desperate thirst that dominated her. Ruby. Marcus's voice sounded like it was next to her ear, but she knew it wasn't. The wolf should be at the other end of the school by now. All her senses sharpened, despite the screams from the cafeteria, and she could even hear his heartbeat. We are friends, for now. She had no idea why she was in the mansion, she only knew that despite her efforts, she could not fight her instinct that was crying out to be in that same place. Ethan, she whispered as she walked carefully through the long luxurious corridors. It did not seem strange to her having entered the mansion uninvited, after all, the vampire was her destiny, and not only that, but he had made her into a rarity, so he owed her. Also, even if he got angry at the meddling, just to see it Ruby would be considered a victory door him. Clearing the thoughts from her head, she entered several rooms until she reached one that stood out from the rest. It was an office that at first she thought was empty, until she spotted her vampire's creator himself, Arthur. Hi, she stammered, not knowing how to react. Just a few days ago, she was killed by the vampire that stood before her eyes. Thanks to him, she was now a hybrid. But she couldn't blame him, given how things happened. The vampire turned to face her and gave her a warm, forced smile. He was equally uncomfortable. We need to talk. I know, he replied after clearing his throat. The burning only increased with the passing of the seconds, but she was determined to ignore it, she had more important things to do. Talking with Arthur was one of them, and then it was Ethan's turn, regardless of the consequences. It's my fault, Ruby. I don't know how to thank you for what you did for me, although of course I'm not the best at giving thanks. I mean, I nearly drank all your blood, he said, his eyes roaming the room to avoid making eye contact and letting out a small nervous laugh. I should have controlled myself. Suddenly a coughing fit assailed the hybrid, taking them both by surprise. Ruby fell to the ground, coughing non-stop and nervous. 
What was happening to her? The pain in her throat shot through the skies, she no longer had a burning carpet, but the whole fucking carpet store burning to the ground. In a stupid attempt to hold back the cough, she put her hand to her mouth, covering it. She immediately noticed the moisture on her lips, so HSE looked down and her world threatened to fall as she watched the crimson liquid on her skin. Ruby! The vampire exclaimed, rushing to meet her. What happened to you? You're bleeding. Ruby's conscience began to waver, too weakened by the events. She heard someone else slam the door into the room, at the same time that she felt the sweet and bitter scent of his vampire. The coughing seemed to stop at the smell of him, calming in the presence of her destined one. Athan, she managed to whisper, expending all her energy, staying afloat. Her vampire's strong hands held her tightly, lifting her effortlessly off the ground and carrying her into his big arms. I am here, Ruby, I'm not going anywhere. Don't worry, my love, I'm here with you. How are you feeling? The vampire's deep voice echoed in her ears, effortlessly stealing a smile from her. Regardless of the situation and the tone of voice Athan used, Ruby would love it anyway, because it was his voice, the voice of his destiny. She carefully opened her eyes, straightening up on the mattress. In front of her eyes was Athan, leaning against the wall of his room, looking carefree with his hair slightly messy and his arms and legs crossed. He took a deep breath and smiled at her delicious scent. Like a truck hit me, he joked. She peered at Athan, who walked over to her bed and took a seat on the mattress next to her. How long have you been without drinking? Ruby swallowed hard, aware of her mistake. She underestimated the situation, prolonging the hour to go feed herself, despite the continuous alarms of her body. Since I was with you the other day, she replied, shrinking into place at the disapproving gaze of her vampire. Oh, Athan was furious. There was no reason to put off drinking for so long, to put herself in danger like that. Why didn't Ruby drink? Why did she submit to such an extreme that her own body started to fail? That was three days ago, he growled, getting up from the bed. Ruby followed him with her eyes, wishing she could get up and follow him, but she knew her body wouldn't be able, and that she would fall flat against the ground just trying. I thought I could control it, the possibility of ending up coughing up my own blood never crossed my mind, ha ha, she muttered, looking down and breaking eye contact. She was tired of pretending that Ethan didn't care about her, that he was just one more man in her life, and she's had a couple. Just looking the worry in his eyes, making its way through Athens' usual coldness and indifference, made her realize how important she really was for him. The vampire managed to sneak into her heart and mind, transforming into an important part of her life in no time. She loved him, she wanted him by her side, with his absence, even if it was for a couple hours, came anguish and a strong feeling of missing him deeply. She wouldn't hide it, she couldn't anymore, so she steeled herself and added, I've missed you these days. I didn't want to drink from someone other than you. Ha ha, I like the idea that your blood could be the last one I drank. You were right, nothing compares to it. Ethan looked at her in surprise, barely managing to believe the hybrid's words. Suddenly Ruby opened up to him, confessing her feelings with complete honesty and without ulterior motives. Ethan didn't know how to react. No one ever felt that for him, women disappeared from his life in a matter of days, fled in terror, screaming that the monster would devour them in their dreams. His past was full of betrayals, of people showing fake emotions to get something in return, a reality full of ulterior motives. How should he now act, when he finally met someone who did not have the idea to use him in mind? He noticed that he had been deep in thought for too long, so he cast his fears and insecurities as far as possible, locking them in a safety box within his consciousness. Without giving it much thought, he walked towards her once more. Drink from me, he said, demanding eye contact, begging inside to see the blue orbs and how they were devoured by the dilated pupils and those mesmerizing colors. He noticed the way the hybrid's breathing was uneven, and how her throat struggled to swallow, suddenly dry and with renewed thirst for blood as she sniffed it. Are you sure? I just drank from you recently, I don't want to harm you. I would love for you to drink from me again, Ruby, don't worry, I can take it, he replied, tilting his head and sliding his shirt away, leaving a free access to his neck. 
The blood was pumping. It wasn't hot like humans, but at least its temperature didn't spoil the taste, not at all. He felt the way the thick fangs pierced his skin with ease, desecrating everything in their path. Then the suction came, and a sigh passed her lips. He closed his eyes and transferred his weight as best he could, conscious not to collapse on his hybrid. And then the pleasure came, bathing his body and materializing in a kind of mist through his mind, appeasing his pain, his insecurity and most importantly, his past. Ruby drank from him for a few minutes, and once she realized it was enough, she forced herself to stop. They both observed each other in silence, letting their bodies answer for them. Words were unnecessary, they did not need them, they understood more with a glance than they could with words. Without thinking twice, Ruby licked the remnants of blood that remained at the corner of her lips, an action that unleashed an irresistible temptation for the vampire, who lunged to meet her lips. They kissed passionately, both still submerged in the remnants of the haze of pleasure. Ruby was fascinated. She was never in such an intimate situation with a man for whom she had feelings. Whenever she was with him, pleasure was the only leader, but not in this case. Now she could feel what she thought was love for the first time. Ethan was not far from her situation, except that in the past, in addition to pleasure, he also shared a bed with the feeling of being used by his power with the certainty of later being rejected by the fear of his companions. Ruby took off his shirt with ease and began to kiss each of his tattoos, her lips, soft and expert, ran over his smooth skin, feeling each of his hard muscles. After a few minutes, in which they both got carried away, Ethan decided to take command. With a docile movement, he placed the hybrid on top of him and drew her towards him after having removed her shirt and bra as well, gluing both torsos now naked. He grabbed one of the round breasts in his hand and began to devour it, slowly and tortuously, hearing the moans of his hybrid that were music to his ears. Without beating around the bush he dug his fangs into the aureole, and it took all his self-control not to lose his sanity when he heard his name whispered by Ruby. Ah. Ethan. He never felt so good being half-naked with a woman, running his hands over her body and drinking from her breast. The sweet blood flowed down his throat like the same elixir that made him feel alive, an elixir that would be able to make his heart beat after so long. Suddenly it stopped. Ruby watched him with confusion creeping over his expression, not knowing what had changed between them. Ethan, she whispered his name, seeking a reaction from him, but all she received was an emotionless look, isolated from her being. The vampire released her breast and removed his hands from her body. He lifted her easily and laid her on the bed, half-naked, her chest still stained with blood. He jerked his shirt down and left the room, slamming the door shut. Ruby held her position, frozen with surprise. What had happened? What changed between them? What went through his mind before he ruined the moment and left the room? All the questions swirled in her mind, without giving her respite. But one of them stood out among all of them, etching itself with a fire so scorching that it left her breathless. Was she falling in love with Ethan? Hello? Her voice lingered in nothingness, disappearing like the echo. She was in a horrible place, littered with broken stretchers and machines, covered in dust and mold. The place lacked artificial light, and the few windows that there were provided no sunlight. No moon or stars outside, there was nothing. Her vision was back to what it had been when she was human, it was impossible for her to see more than a few meters ahead, and her head was itching from the effort. Once again she felt like a human, and contrary to what she thought she was, she felt useless. Being a hybrid had its downsides and advantages, and for some reason, she started to hate the lack of power even more than the burden of eternal life. Athan? Marcus? She called out, noticing with surprise how something in her chest was trembling, her own heart which was beating again. She didn't like the feeling at all, she had gotten used to the void in her chest. A current of cold air ran through her body, evidencing the existence of an open window, an escape. She walked as fast as she could, trying not to step on the various shattered pieces of furniture that were scattered around the hospital. Her eyes locked on her exit ticket, and she jumped on her feet on the edge of it. Don't think you'll get away so easily, hybrid. You can't escape me, 
A chilling voice sounded behind her, and without further ado, two gigantic hands pushed her from behind, throwing her carelessly out the window, into a guaranteed freefall. Ruby began to scream in horror, imagining the way she would hit the ground. Everything was so unreal, every feeling, every thought, she couldn't escape. The burning in her back increased in intensity and the end of the fall did not seem to want to come, although she knew that once he stopped falling, death would be assured. All her bones broke at the same time, creating a kind of terrifying a cappella. Some even came out, piercing her muscles, tendons and skin, others just splintered in her. His skull almost turned to mash, crushing his brain. In a desperate attempt to live she took one last breath of air, the most painful she ever experienced, her lungs were pierced by her own ribs and blood was pouring from her mouth. You you can't escape me. No. Please no. She screamed desperately, getting up from the bed and running to the corner of the room. Her body shook from head to toe in panic, not knowing what to do to ease the pain in her back and remove the sensation left by her broken bones. It was just a dream, a simple nightmare, she repeated like a prayer. Ruby. Her vampire entered the room with his red eyes transformed, in a real rage and searching the entire room for danger, but Ruby was alone, in a corner holding her legs with her arms. He walked over to her, careful not to make more afraid, and crouched down. What happened? A nightmare, she whispered softly, accepting the hand Ethan gave her to get up. Her back ached at the movement and her expression transformed to pain. Something hurts, she said, not as a question, more like a statement. They both went to the bathroom and Ruby took off her shirt shamelessly, looking infected when she was examined by the eyes of her vampire. A gasp came from her lips as she looked at her back in the mirror, managing to give Ethan goosebumps, who watched her stunned. Two large hand-shaped burns rose on her skin, right where the mysterious man pushed her in her dreams. Ethan took two steps toward her and wrapped his arms around her, pressing his bare chest against the fabric of her shirt, being careful not to touch the damaged skin. What exactly did you dream of, Ruby? He demanded carelessly, loosening his grip and watching as the hybrid put her shirt back on, at all times muffling the expressions of pain that struggled to come to light. Just a random nightmare, she insisted, as Ethan formed both hands into fists at his sides. This is serious, you're not healing. Tell me, we don't have all day. Ruby let out a soft sigh, after all, her vampire was right. Without beating around the bush, she proceeded to narrate everything that had happened, without omitting any details. She told him about the way he whispered behind her, that she was human in the dream, and how her bones broke leaving her in complete and tortuous pain until stealing her last breath. Ethan's expression remained void throughout the entire explanation, driving him crazy on the inside. That's when I woke up, she finished, with her blue orbs stuck in the vampires. I'm scared, I don't know what that was or who wants to hurt me. I haven't done anything wrong, Ethan. He just wants to kill me because I'm a hybrid, I know it. She cried desperately. She was very scared. She watched him swallow hard and finally give up to take her into his strong arms once again. I won't let something bad happen to you, Ruby. I've had my mistakes with you and I'm working on them, but believe me, nobody will ever hurt you, nobody. She didn't know what to think, could she trust Ethan? She couldn't be fooled, what if it was all a hoax, what if he only uses her for her condition as a hybrid and for her blood? She shook her head in an attempt to stop those thoughts. Stop it Ruby, stop thinking I'm lying to you, he told her with a weak smile and laughed when he saw her so confused. How do you know what I was thinking? In response he laughed louder and caressed her face lovingly. You are my soulmate, we are linked by blood, I can tell just by looking at you. Maybe you can do it one day too, he explained patiently, and after a moment of silence added. I'm sorry about before, when I left. I needed a moment. You don't have to explain anything to me, Ethan, she said hastily, clearing her throat uncomfortably, still in his arms with her chest exposed. You don't owe me anything, you can do whatever you like, I won't bother if you suddenly don't want to be with me like THT, that's fine. Her vampire watched her silently, showing no emotion but feeling everything inside. He has never experienced anything similar. Not knowing what to say, he chose to respond with a chaste kiss on the lips and a crooked smile. 
I guess you won't want to go back to sleep for a long time, he muttered humorously, to which the hybrid hit his arm gently. It's not funny, Ethan, she replied, but a smile gave her away. Do you want to take a bath? He acts, and before the hybrid got down on him and felt pressured, he added, Alone, just you, prepared by me. This time Ruby was the one who laughed and kissed him on the cheek with a big, genuine smile. If we do it together, I won't complain. I need you with me, Ethan. Now more than ever. I can't do it without you. The vampire looked at her with a raised eyebrow, not understanding what she meant. Do what? Live. Thirteen Nightmares The weeks passed, and time took care of slowly healing Ruby's resentment, who with each day accepted a little more the fact of being an immortal creature. As she spent more and more time with her twisted blood ties, she began to understand why they converted her without hesitation, because she would have done the same if she had had to save them, and without thinking twice. At first it was difficult to convince Ethan to spend time with Marcus, they had their discussions where she had to remind herself that her vampire was striving to change and be more patient, but that she could not push him to the limit every night either. Her parents, on the other hand, began to get used to seeing Ethan at their house every night, happy that their daughter was starting to show them a bit of her private life. They never believed that the day would come when she would settle for just one man and put aside her nightlife, they were both very happy. Besides, Ethan seemed to be a good man, perhaps too mature for his daughter, but they didn't really care. Everything seemed to be working out perfectly, didn't it? Unfortunately, there was something that took a bitter pill on the hybrid every night, and yes, it was the continuous nightmares that never stopped to haunt her sleep. Since the incident at Athan's house, where she dreamed of the man pushing her from that abandoned hospital, her dreams turned into genuine horror movies. Every night after that, she relived the death of the person he had the most affection for, Athan. The dream began with her vampire wandering through some abandoned corridors, looking for her, and after a few minutes, a completely dark figure appeared and slayed him with no mercy. Some nights he cut off his head, others he set it on fire, and so on. Some of the nights she dreamed of the same scene, except that the roles reversed, she was the one who was murdered by a dark male figure. Why the sudden nightmares? She did not know and neither did his beloved vampire, because Ruby decided not to tell him that she suffered from them every night and that as the days went by, they became more and more terrifying. Despite her desire to tell him the truth, she refused to do so. He had enough Ethan with the fact that he is not her only tie, she could not give him more problems. Who could love a hybrid with so many issues? Ruby believed no one. Then there was Marcus, who was always very perceptive, and noticed that something was wrong with his loved one. More times than he could count he tried to get information out of her about what was wrong, but each time Ruby pretended to be oblivious, swearing she was okay. Lastly Minerva and Nix were left, both still ignorant of the world around their best friend. Ruby was very meticulous about hiding them. She drank from her vampire every day to avoid the symptoms of thirst, she did not allow Nix to see Ethan, and Marcus was ordered not to appear at the school so as not to raise the alarms. Nix's blessing to be with his vampire remained pending. Yes. But she wasn't interested as much as before. Since her conversion, her bond with her vampire increased, reaching levels she never believed it would reach. Drinking from him and spending every night together strengthened the bond, despite the constant nightmares. What are you thinking? Ethan's voice echoed through her room, surprising her so much that she ran at high speed to the other side of the room. A few minutes ago she had woken up, sweating and with her heart in her throat, with the spitting image of her vampire murdering her. This started to become usual. No matter how many times a day she denied it, a kind of irrational fear of her vampire began to form, but also a stronger love once she woke up to her reality. That night in her dream world, Ethan stalked her like a lion about to attack its prey for more minutes than she could count, causing her a great irrational fear, as well as mistrust. Once he caught her he began to torture her, producing countless cuts across her body, ending with a cut to her throat which of course was not enough to end her life. Ripping her head off was his final decision. Favik Ruby, are you okay? 
He looked at her wide-eyed, moving closer to her, but for every step he took, Ruby took two steps back. Suddenly he stopped and looked at her, stunned. Are you scared of me? How did we go from loving each other to you being afraid of me? The other night we almost made love. I wasn't rude, I don't understand. What have I done to you? He screamed, losing control in despair of not knowing what was happening to her intended. Ruby leaned against the wall and sat up, her arms grasping her legs, which were now glued to her chest, and tucked her head between her knees. She couldn't break down and reveal the truth, she just couldn't, she didn't want to face the reality that could be Li Ying behind those dreams, plus she couldn't worry Ethan even more. He had enough with the fact that every other day, he had to wait worried at home, hoping with his heart in his throat, that she would not change him for Marcus. Nothing, she managed to articulate, berating herself for being so scared. You haven't done anything. She forced herself to make eye contact, trembling at the blank gaze of her vampire. I can't hear what you're saying, he said, dropping to the ground, resting his back against the wall. Only six feet separated them, but they felt like many more. Last night I tried, I thought I couldn't since we were physically connected, but now. Why can't I, Ruby? Neither of them understood how they had reached such an extreme. Ruby had never felt so much fear and love for someone at the same time. What was it about Athan that had her so bewitched? Destined or not, no one could bear as much fear of someone as Ruby was doing, much less having a werewolf around her. I don't know, she admitted, equally puzzled. Well, me neither. His eyes turned red, just like the ones in her nightmare, and she was sure that if her heart kept beating it would come out of her chest. Acting on instinct, she tucked her head between her knees and stifled a sob, she couldn't feel more pathetic. She was supposed to be one of the most beautiful and powerful creatures in the world, why was she so scared then? And even worse, why did he have such dreams? It was clear that it was not normal, is someone implanting the nightmares? Why? For what purpose? Finally, Athan realized that his hybrid was genuinely scared, even if she didn't want to be. What happened? Before they were in such a good place, even the days that Ruby came back from seeing Marcus, he still felt that everything would be fine. Now all the happiness seemed to have gone down the drain. Shit, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell at you. He approached slowly, as if he were trying to grab a wounded animal from the street. After a few tense moments, he managed to reach the wall his hybrid was leaning against and took a seat next to her, letting out a sigh of relief he didn't know he was holding back. Can you tell me what the hell is happening to you? I can't see you like this, see how you fear me. His voice almost broke near the end, it was difficult for him to pronounce that his destinied one was afraid of him. The hybrid tensed, not knowing what to answer. What could she say to him? The truth? That would only make the vampire worry and get angry with her, for always being a nuisance, a problem, one more burden. She would not tolerate the look of contempt that Athan was surely going to give her. And nothing, she stammered. Why was it so hard to talk lately? Ruby, he raised his voice one more tone but immediately calmed down. He wouldn't risk scaring her away again. Tell me the truth, you never stuttered in your life and now you can't speak without doing it. This time Ruby made sure not to stutter and reply firmly to convince him not to ask her more, as she was sure she was going to give up and reveal the truth to him. Oh okay, I, I just had another nightmare, she explained, and accompanied the explanation with a wave of her hand, indicating that it was not important. What did you dream of? Athan's gaze watched every movement of her face, trying to notice even the slightest of changes so she would know if her hybrid was lying to him. Spiders, she thought of her first childhood fear, but just by thinking of fear, automatically the vampire's face appeared in her mind. She got so scared that he suddenly turned away from him. Ethan looked at her hurt, confused and angry at the same time. Spiders. He asked with a hint of mock amusement. Sure, it all makes sense. You dream of spiders and you fear me. He knew the hybrid was lying to him, but what could he do? He wouldn't force her to tell him the truth, she would have to, right? I, I'm sorry, Athan, really, she stammered again, and a rebellious tear rolled down her cheek. 
B, but it is that I can't tell you. Hey, he caught her eye and his hands cupped her face in a protective and loving way. I'm not going to hurt you, ever. Okay? You are the most important, the most valuable thing that I have. If something were to happen to you, I don't think I could survive. Are you serious? She smiled slightly because it was the first time Ethan had spoken such words to her, and her fear seemed to drop a few notches when she heard him speak to her like that. Of course I am, do you think I am not? He raised a teasing eyebrow. Ruby actually smiled, a sincere happy smile and not the farcical happiness she'd been pretending for the past few weeks. And so a sense of calm filled every corner of his dead heart. I believe you, vampire, he smiled sheepishly, to which Athan returned it. Shall I accompany you to school? Although you would already be arriving twenty minutes late. He started to say, but was interrupted by her. Actually, I do want to go to school. I haven't talked to Nix or Minerva in a long time. Also, her high school library was known to be one of the best in the city. Maybe she could find some information about her nightmares. Are you sure? I can miss a few meetings, stay by your side and verify that nothing happens to you, he offered, warming Ruby's cold heart. You will not miss work for me. Although if I'm honest I didn't know you had it, she was sincere, to which Ethan chuckled. Where do you think I get all the money from? Well I do not know. They both laughed for a few moments when they felt that everything would return to normal. It's not a big deal anyway. I own some companies, multinationals, so I don't always have to be present. A few years ago I started with nightclubs. That's why I heard you that night. He admitted, and Ruby was silent for a few minutes, assimilating that Ethan was telling her details of his private life and talking about the night they met. Wow, I never thought of that. I thought you listened to me because you were just passing through, you know, fate, she whispered, not really knowing what to say. That's right, it was fate. His dark gaze seemed to lose itself in memory, but he recovered immediately. Okay, I'll let you go to school on one condition. He got up from the floor and helped her do it, knowing that Ruby could get up on her own without any discomfort, but he wanted to hold her hand. Which one is that? At the end of the day you will tell me the truth, he replied seriously. At first panic flooded every organ of the hybrid's body, she had to gasp a few times, not because she needed to, but in futile attempts to relax. But her vampire was right, she couldn't go on like this suffering horrible nightmares every night that her prayed would never come true. Ethan must find out, one way or another. And honestly, she didn't want it to be the wrong way, as neither would benefit. But maybe they are just nightmares and nothing more than that, without consequences. Just a joke her brain was playing on him. Or not. She couldn't be sure until her vampire knew it. But she had to be honest, the simple fact of thinking about her nightmares made her feel an atrocious fear, what will happen when she must narrate them? A few minutes ago, he had asked her why he couldn't hear her thoughts. Giving more evidence that there is something more than nightmares going on. She thought about it for a minute, it took forever, but she made her decision. Agreed. She forced a smile that even the vampire realized was not real, but he forced himself to ignore it, he would talk about it later. The morning, although it started a little badly, was passing quickly. And Ruby kept thinking about how to tell Ethan about her condition. How will she even tell him? How will he react? Will he hate her? Will he see Jir as a dead weight, a burden? Her his head was already hurting from thinking so much. Her friends were sitting across from her having lunch surprisingly quickly, which at first made her laugh, but now it made her gag as she watched them eat something other than human blood or tissue. Her stomach lurched exaggeratedly, and she rose quickly from the table. In the afternoon, at my house after school, it's time to see each other out of this jail, the silence broke, and they both nodded enthusiastically, since they had been waiting for that for days. It was about time, girl. See you there. Minerva replied with a smile, which Nix nudged. Swallow before you speak, men. Ruby forced a smile and ran as fast as she could in a human way to the bathroom. 
She rushed into the nearest cubicle and vomited all the blood Ethan had given him the night before, absolutely all of it. It was like she hadn't assimilated none of it. She stood inside the cubicle, her face almost pressed to the disgusting toilet, wondering what was wrong with her. The tears were not long in coming, but she held them back. Surprised, she left the bathroom and looked at herself in the mirror. She watched in horror as her vampire stood behind her, bloodshot eyes, staring at her coldly. She screamed in full panic, nearly smashing her tiny lungs. Then she noticed Ethan moving swiftly and with certainty through the lady's room, kicking her to the floor, and positioned himself on top of her. He positioned his hands around her slender neck and began to exert force, a lot, actually. Hey, Ethan, you're s hurting me. He did not respond, but increased his strength to the point of completely suffocating her, with a sly smile between his lips. No, stop, Ruby screamed desperately, putting her hands around her neck, crying like never before. She felt herself propel herself forward and realized that she was in a car, Athens, who was looking at her with wide eyes and with his foot to the bottom of the brake. What the hell? You were sleeping, calm down, it was a nightmare. He went on to say, explaining with all the calm he could muster. Ruby froze, still leaning against the back of her vampire's car. She had been dreaming. What day is today? Ethan, please tell me what day it is today. Monday morning, you were asleep for a few minutes, he replied, confused and concerned. We left your house just ten minutes ago, little one. What was that scream? The whole high school scene was a dream. Lunch with her friends, biology and history classes, and her murder in the bathroom, but that wasn't what tormented her the most. The fact of not having differentiated the real world from the dream world was what destabilized her the most. Not knowing when she dreamed and when she didn't. So she was not wrong, nightmares did have consequences. 14 Harsh In less than the blink of an eye, another week came to an end, and Ruby still hadn't confessed the truth to her vampire. She could barely stay a full day at school without leaving early and Minerva, along with Nix were beginning to notice it, as were Marcus and Ethan, who found themselves leaving before their obligations so as not to leave the hybrid alone at any time. They were both worried, almost in a sick way. The werewolf could not sleep and spent whole days talking to witches to get a cure, but the only thing they could tell him was that only whoever had bewitched the hybrid could remove the nightmares. Apparently, his magic was incredibly powerful, on a whole different level. On the other hand, there was Athan, oblivious to Marcus's theory, thinking that it was not a spell but a consequence of having two ties. Despite their different theories, neither shared them with each other, as both distrusted the other. Not to mention that none of them knew the truth about the nightmares, none of them knew that her nightmares were about her murdering Athan or vice versa. Ruby, how are you feeling? The wolf's calm voice snapped her out of her reverie. She was spending too much time lost in her thoughts lately, even though she tried hard to prove otherwise. She was with one of her destinies, in his home, the werewolf's base. At first, she was afraid of finding herself in the same place as those horrible creatures that scared her so much the day they rescued her, but then she understood that she was part of them, and that she should not fear them. Also, Marcus's father was the alpha of the pack, so no one would hurt her. She leaned back after letting out a long sigh, leaning back in the green grass next to her wolf. This place is beautiful, she said, ignoring the question. She did not want to talk about her feelings or her current state, she knew that her destinies were racking their brains day and night to help her, and she did not like to see in fast motion how they both neglected each other for her. She didn't think she was worth it. It really is, he agreed with her, giving her a genuine smile and leaning back as well. Ruby took a deep breath, a mischievous smile on her lips. The scent that Marcus gave off drove her crazy. The fact that she could smell a scent so similar to that of her vampire, but not feel the overwhelming fear, renewed her without a doubt. In front of them there was a beautiful crystalline lake, where the pack used to submerge when they were in their animal form, usually at celebrations or anniversaries, it was their own tradition. At some point you're going to have to be honest with me, Ruby, he broke the silence after a few minutes, to which the hybrid glanced at him. The evening light illuminated half of his manly face, 
causing the typical sensation of butterflies inside her. Marcus was so natural, so sunny, so alive, while her vampire was the opposite, but at the same time as charming as him in his own way. I've seen the way you behaved with Ethan when he brought you here, you're not like that with me. He straightened easily and looked into her eyes. Ruby, is he hurting you? You're afraid of him. And you don't know how it hurts to see you scared, I feel it here. He took her by the hand, bringing her to his own strong chest at the level of his heart. Her soul sank to her feet when she heard her wolf and felt the strong and viforous palpitations of his heart. His chest was so warm. She could tell how concerned he was for her well-being that she felt she didn't deserve to have someone like him destined to be with her. Well, like Ethan as well, at least the way he was most of the time lately. She took a few minutes to answer, thinking her words to leave no doubt in the werewolf. She knew that if Marcus got into his head, he would think that Ethan was hurting her, and he wouldn't stop until he pushed her away from him and do something even worse. She knew it was time to tell him the truth. The nightmares. They're about him, him, and me, she confessed, and for the first time in what felt like years she could shed her tears, feeling a weight rise from her shoulders. Marcus looked at her in surprise and didn't hesitate to hug her. Some nights I kill him, I torture him, and I can't stop. Marcus. You don't know what it feels like to dream that, it's so real, she sobbed as the wolf stroked her back surrounding her with his other arm. Shush, you don't have to worry, let's figure this out, he muttered, not really knowing what to say. That's not all. The night's where I don't murder him, he's the one who murders me and tortures me. It's like we take turns almost. Ethan hasn't been able to feel my thoughts for a week now, I'm not going crazy, Marcus. I swear I am not. Say managed to say through tears, feeling like she was starting to have a panic attack, but the wolf acted quickly and let her lie against his chest while he covered with his strong arms, knowing that his scent would reassure her, and it did. A small smile fought to appear on her rosy lips, further stifled her. While he was glad that his scent managed to calm his hybrid, he couldn't be calm because he had to calm her first. We're going to solve this, don't worry, he assured, sure that if necessary, he would give his own life for her without a second thought. Ethan may have spent more time with Ruby as he bonded with her first, but he wouldn't give up. Little by little with their fleeting encounters, he would win her, he was sure. She had come to school in her vampire's car, which was parked outside. They had spent the night together, and as much as there had been dozens of proper moments to tell him the truth, Ruby couldn't. She believed there was a possibility that he would get mad at her for giving him nothing but trouble. Something happened. Have you had another nightmare? He asked with a frown. Ruby didn't wake up screaming in the morning for the first time in days, but that didn't take away the possibility. No, of course not, I don't have them anymore, she hastened to say, knowing that each time she buried herself more and more in the lie. Ruby, he interrupted, but without losing his smile. His dark gaze exuded tenderness, affection and love, but all Ruby saw was that if she told him the truth, he would lose all those feelings for her. I know you, don't lie to me. He may care about the hybrid like he never did with someone, but he would never tolerate lies. You're right, she agreed. If the day before Marcus took the truth so well, why wouldn't Ethan do it? But then a voice in her head reminded her that the two were as opposite as the sun and the moon. We'll talk when I get back, I want to see my friends. Ethan felt a spark of fury, he did not want to leave her at the school and come back in a few hours to pick her up. He didn't tolerate being apart, especially in this situation, but now apparently, he did not tolerate being together either. He knew their dependency was unhealthy, but he didn't give a damn. If he wanted to be with her hybrid 24 hours a day, he would be, damn it. However, he controlled himself and cast all his fury away, he would deal with it later. You know that whatever happens, you can call me, he said what he said every morning, aware that in a matter of a couple of hours, he would find himself leaving another meeting to go in search of her, but it didn't bother him. Of course I do, that's what I've been doing every day, she whispered, a little annoyed with herself, but she managed to smile and give her vampire a chaste kiss on the lips. 
Once out of the car, she took a long breath of air, knowing that if she had a beating heart, it would have suffered a heart attack already. How could she be so afraid of someone, but at the same time not being able to establish a distance? Quite the opposite, actually, she needed him near her. It was unbelievable. Inside the car with Ethan, all her instincts screamed at her to run away, to stay a hundred miles away, but once he was gone, all she could think about was being in his arms, and a tightness in her chest took her breath away. There, she was decided. She will tell Ethan everything she knows, but first he would find out about her condition. Although her vampire was doing his research about nightmares, he did not know what they were about, and perhaps that information was vital. She decided to skip the first few hours to go to the library and look impatiently for a book that talked about dream disorders or reality distortion. Finally, she found a book called Nocturnal Distortions and opened it, glad to have been able to find it in such a large place and in such a short time. She searched the index for something that would tell her about the chapter on sleep, and indeed after a few seconds, she found it, only she immediately regretted it. The book she held in her hands did speak of humans, it didn't spoke about supernatural creatures. It wouldn't be enough to find a solution. She went ahead and looked into the occult section, and after a few minutes, finally, Ahe find a book that claimed to include everything about supernatural creatures and the way they operate. The book was called A Witch's Bestiary. A little harsh per his, but she still was happy she found it. She browsed trough the index and found out in no chapter did it talk about hybrids, as these technically did not exist, she was one of the few if not the only one. Fearful, she opened the page on the chapter dedicated to vampires and began to read with excitement and fear, Eu suddenly, she heard a few footsteps behind her. She ignored them, she was so focused that she paid no attention at all. Hello, a young boy's voice echoed in her ears. She jumped like a cat from the chair she was sitting on and fell in front of him. Instead of looking at her in surprise, he was looking at her normally, as if he was already used to it. Who are you? She asked carefully, too stunned to ask a useful question. He looked at her with a crooked smile, one she didn't like at all. My name is Tristran, and I am like you. Ethan, I'm 100% sure they're just nightmares, nothing more, Arthur assured him, trying for the tenth time in weeks to calm his son, but he couldn't. They're not just nightmares, believe me. He exclaimed, exalted. Yesterday I left her with Marcus, the damn wolf, and she went with him happily, without fear, it is only me that she fears. He dropped into one of the expensive armchairs, almost without hope. He had postponed all his meetings for the day so that he could be on his phone, in case Ruby called him in emergency. Wait. Arthur stopped what he was doing to look at him. Does she fear you without you having done something to her? I am behaving well, father. When I'm with her, anger seems to disappear, he admitted, moving his creator, since for many years he had lost hope that Ethan would feel something for someone other than one of the two. If I'm not mistaken there are spells that could cause that, does Marcus know any dark witches? Not. I already checked, he's clean. In fact, he's looking for a cure as well. He sighed and after a few seconds added, spells for what exactly? To make someone go from love to hate, using the dream world as a means, he replied seriously, to which Ethan responded watching him almost blankly, too stunned to do anything. Seeing that his son was in no condition to speak, he continued. Obviously someone does not want you to be with Ruby, because if she only fears you. That person will be dead, no one will separate me from my Ruby, he growled and his eyes transformed without his consent, acting on instinct. She belongs to me and I to her. Ethan, he called him. His son saw him rise from his place and placed his hand on his shoulder. Can I be honest with you without making you angry? Of course you can. I'm surprised Ruby hasn't left you anymore. I mean, that spell is very powerful and old. Only ancient witches or sorcerers would know how to conjure it. Surely she must be more afraid of you than ever. If the nightmares started when you tell me, that means she must be in the last stage. Stage? Wah, what the fuck are you talking about? He inquired, feeling his world shake around him. 
His father seemed to think about it for a few seconds, deciding to go to one of his many libraries and search, very focused. Here it is, he exclaimed, picking up a book almost as fat as the Bible. Seeing the expression of his son, he clarified, It is a book of spells and if I am not mistaken, Ruby has been cursed by a spell called Amor et Odium. Love and hate, he translated to himself, to which Arthur nodded. There are four stages, he read, his tone of voice turning sour, as if preparing Athan for a hit. Tell me, he demanded. The first stage is insomnia. She's already lived it. The second are nightmares that lead to irrational fear. She's lived it too, he completed, a tightness in his chest grew like a vine. He didn't want to get to the end. The third is reality distortion, not knowing if she is dreaming or not. Loss of contact with reality. That too. He replied, remembering that day in his car where she asked what day and what time it was. Is it the last one? There are two more, or well, it depends on the personality of the victim. One would be that she killed the protagonist of her nightmares, believing that it was a dream, when it's not. He was silent. Tell me the last one before I get mad at you, he threatened. Suicide Athan, he answered simply, leaving her son speechless. The second outcome is that, that he reaches such a point of fear that she takes her own life. A deathly silence settled in the great room. Neither wanted to break the precious and fearful silence. Both minds worked quickly, searching for a solution, but each of the options that occurred to them were a dead end. I have to go, Athan stammered as he ran toward the exit. Arthur stopped him, despair in his eyes, wanting to make his son see reason. If she sees you, you will only make her fear worse, you will push her to the limit, he warned. You don't know how we are, you don't know how deep our bond is, he defended, and with a docile movement, he was already heading in search of her hybrid. I have no idea what you're talking about, she laughed nervously. What do you mean you are like me? I am a hybrid. Just like you. Ruby froze at that moment and didn't know how to react. What? What are you talking about? I am not a hybrid, as you say. He stepped forward and held her hands, making more contact than Ruby wanted. I know you're lying, Ruby. I know your story, I know Dora fact that you are a hybrid. No, I'm not. She snapped and took two steps back, crashing into the wooden table, I'm not a hybrid, nor half-wolf, nor half-vampire. I never said what halves you were, he said with a lopsided smile. What? She acts, not believing the way her mind had betrayed her, seized with exhaustion. I'm pretty sure you heard that right, Ruby. Don't lie to me, he replied, and his gaze hardened. And what about you? She counterattacked. Half witch, half vampire. To prove it, he showed his long fangs, unaware that Ruby would take it as a threat, showing him her own fangs that were twice as wide and long, next to her amber and red eyes. Hey, hey, I don't want to fight, take it easy. What do you want? I don't want you to die, he answered simply, sitting down in the chair she had previously been in. Sorry? What the hell do you mean? She acts, taking a seat in the opposite chair. You will die if you stay with Athan. He looked at her hard and decisively. You will have to come with me, why do you think hybrids supposedly don't exist? Because they never survive. She ventured, not sure. No, Ruby. Hybrids survive, but not always. The correct answer would be, because we hide from the world. Hiding our identity. What? Why? We are twice as strong, at least. Yes, absolutely, but we are rare. There aren't many of our kind. We are like relics, rare collectibles. I don't understand, she admitted, to which Tristran rolled his eyes, annoyed at having to repeat the same thing. Let's see, let me explain it to you in another way, he mused for a few minutes how to speak to her. Yes, we are strong, but in the same way that vampires build nests and werewolves packs to protect themselves, we gather to protect ACH other, as we are too vulnerable by ourselves even if we AR strong. I was lucky to find you so easily, it is not common for there to be more than one of us in the same state, imagine the chances of sharing a city. Listen. 
You are very cute and definitely very smart for your age, but I'm not interested, Tristran. I'm fine here. My destiny is here, she admitted, keeping Marcus's existence to herself. For some reason, we knew that the hybrid boy would not sit well with the fact that she shared more than one blood tie. I knew you were going to say that, so I anticipated and acted beforehand, trough nightmares, it was me, Ruby, because of me, you're afraid of Athan, I couldn't risk you not coming with me, we need someone like you, he confessed simply, while Ruby never wanted to murder someone so much. What? She managed to mutter, once more transforming her eyes and revealing her fangs. It is very dangerous for you to be with him. You had to be destined for the fucking dark vampire, older than war, please Ruby, you need to listen. She hissed venomously. Being with him will only get you killed, or worse, you will have a child with him, he spat in disgust. Have a child with him? Tristan, that is impossible. Vampires are infertile, they are dead. Do I have to remind you? You are half-wolf. You can have children, but you shouldn't. Shut up. The hybrid's hand went to his mouth, covering it to stop his screaming. They will listen to us. Do you think I just walked in here? It is more than clear that I cast a spell so that they would not listen to us. He explained, which made Ruby return to the subject. Athan is not a hybrid, he couldn't get me pregnant. She looked sadly, somewhat surprised. Since when did she like the idea of having children? The bond with Athan had definitely changed her. I'm sorry to tell you, but... I'm afraid he could. Ruby's eyes lit up. But he shouldn't. Not if you don't want him murdered. Why would they do that? My god, you're slow. He muttered angrily, and earned a murderous look from the woman. How to say it? Since the beginning of the existence of hybrids, they knew that if they had children, they would be like super strong and unhinged because, well, they would also be hybrid. Stop, don't shout, plus that doesn't matter, I'd control them and take care of them, she stammered. Please take the spell off me. No, he hissed. I will not do it. You will not have children with Athan. You are both very powerful. Imagine a spawn of yours. It would be four times as powerful and dangerous. He spoke harshly, very determined. They would wipe off cities, they would kill without giving a damn. An immortal being, extremely powerful and without conscience or regret. Without any human feeling. A monster, he said this and disappeared into thin air all of a sudden, leaving a strong smell of sulfur in the room. Ruby frowned in surprise. Fuck. She screamed, filling every corner of her body with rage and helplessness. She tossed the chair Tristran had sat on, but never heard its fall. She looked up and found his vampire holding the chair. Athan, she ran to him, waiting for him to hug her, and he did. I will never let you go, she heard him speak in her ear, and then she felt him insert his hand into her chest, reaching her heart, and then slowly ripping it out. Goodbye, Ruby. No. Stop. It hurts. Suddenly she found herself in the library, asleep on the book she had previously picked up. She was in the same chair in which she was sitting in her dream. There was a smell of sulfur in the room. Her meeting with Tristran hasn't been a dream, has it? She sniffed again and could only smell that only the scent of his vampire and Marcus emanated. She could already distinguish Athan's smell. It was a bit more bitter than that of the werewolf, which was definitely sweet R, but still, Ruby loved them. Hey, Athan? She stammered. I, is that you? Yes. Her vampire was staring at the ground, leaning against the door, his aura was one of pure sadness. W, we have to talk. Fear barely let her say a few words, but she fought it. Sit here. He pointed to the chair she had thrown in her dream. His vampire listened to her. Never looking at her. He sighed. I know, Ruby, I know you're afraid of me and I know why. The hybrid soul chilled when she heard those words. Fear flooded her, but not fear that he would hurt her, but that he would abandon her. D, do you hate me? It's okay if you w you want me to go, to disappear from your life. I just... She started to get up, but Athan wouldn't let her. No. He yelled. 
I don't want you to leave me. I'm really sorry. I couldn't protect you. His body drew her and forced her to sit on his lap. I'm really sorry I couldn't take care of you, please forgive me. Her eyes turned red with tears. Okay, she replied, stunned and incredibly happy, Ethan didn't hate her, and in fact he blamed himself the same way she did. The realization of her feelings for her vampire hit her like a truck, and not wanting to hold back any more feelings, she added. I love you, Ethan. The vampire looked up from the hybrid's neck, where she had hidden her face. You do. I'm not someone who deserves your love. He contented, believing his words, to which Ruby smiled even more. I love you, my bipolar vampire, more than you could imagine she laughed lovingly and kissed him with tenderness and passion, forgetting her constant fears. I love you more Ruby, much more. The vampire murmured on his lips. The timing was perfect. Finally, Ruby was slowly getting over her irrational and fictional fear of Ethan. But she couldn't help having a bad feeling, like something bad was going to happen to them, something very bad. You will not have children with Ethan. You are both very powerful, imagine a spawn of you. It would be four times as powerful and dangerous. Tristran's words flooded her head. An immortal being, extremely powerful and without conscience or regret. Without any human feeling. A monster. Fifteen monster. What do you think will happen between you and Ethan? Minerva asked Ruby. Both were in the House of the Blonde, finishing the history homework. A few hours ago, Nix had told them that he would join them, but he did not respond to their messages or calls after that, so they assumed that he was on another of his surprise hunting trips with his father, Jacob. What are you talking about? She looked at her surprised, she thought her friend had already forgotten about Ethan, because she made sure to never name him, not after the party where she found him with a woman in which she met Marcus for the second time, and they kissed. What are you, you know, what part of the relationship you in? She replied with a mischievous smile, and seeing how Ruby played the disengagement, rolled her eyes. I am your best friend, do you think I would not realize that you are in love? You offend me. My only friend who happens to be fascinated by playing with men's feelings, finally falls for someone's charms. It is an amazing feat, I must admit that I admire this Ethan a bit for having won your heart. Do you want me to be sincere? She acts and swallowed hard as she saw Minerva nod so determinedly. She looked happy, glad that the door to answers to her questions was finally open, but Ruby knew she wouldn't hear what she wanted. It's complicated. Minerva's gaze spoke for itself. Ruby was surprised by her ability to express her thoughts without the need for words, as she was basically telling her to fuck off and explain anyway, no matter how complicated. Yeah Ruby, now stop holding what you didn't tell me, she laughed. I'm your best friend, come on. Ruby looked around her. There was no one who could listen to them, they had the house all to themselves, it was her opportunity to confess what she is and what happened to her the last week. You won't believe me. She mumbled as she put her things in her bag. If you never try, you'll never know, Minerva melted as she rolled her eyes. Um. How can I say it without you calling me crazy? She pondered for a few minutes and decided on the most direct way. Ethan is a vampire, over a thousand years old. Apparently we're bonded, so yes, I have to be with him, but also I'm bonded with a werewolf named Marcus as well. Anyway, a few weeks ago I was kidnapped by Athan's vampire enemies, where they locked me in a cell with Arthur, Athan's father also a vampire, Obvi. She paused to look at her friend's face, which was disfigured from the laughter Shish was holding, since she sure thought it was a joke. That's why I was missing for five days, but anyway, Athan and Marcus found me, but by then Arthur was very weakened and was at risk of something very ugly so I gave him my blood, but since he was very strong, and since he is over 2,000 years old, he drank all my blood till I died. I woke up being half wolf half vampire, and then more things happened that I will tell you later. She finished and seeing the time added. Nick still hasn't answered you? He told me he had a surprise hunt. She replied with a smile, glaring at her with fake annoyance. Come on Ruby, tell me the truth. 
I'm not an idiot. Minerva, I swear it's the truth. Okay, then, show me, she teased, thinking that Ruby would keep quiet, but she didn't. Okay, if you want. Just don't panic, she said, and without further ado, showed her red and yellow eyes. The beautiful blonde hopped like a rabbit. She pulled back, putting as much distance between herself and her friend as possible. Ruby could hear her heart pounding, and she could even smell the terror in the air. Minerva. Relax, I'm still me, she warned, holding up both hands to show her that he wouldn't hurt her. And no you're not like that, T, this is a joke, isn't? She stammered, tears gathering in her eyes with such speed that it astonished the hybrid. I'm serious, it's not a joke. But you must know that I would never hurt you, she insisted, rising from her place. She tried to walk towards her, but Minerva immediately started screaming. Ah no! She shouted. Get away from me. Please. I don't know what you've done to Ruby, but get away. Minerva, it's me, it's Ruby, she whispered incredulously, but she listened and walked away. The look of her friend would never be erased from her mind, she looked at her as if she were a murderer who was going directly for her life. Leave me alone, go away, get out of my house, and don't ever come back, you monster. Without knowing it, the last word was burned into Ruby's mind, who lately found herself with less confidence than she used to have, she was more susceptible than ever. She closed her eyes and a single tear slid down them. Minerva was right, she was that, a bloody monster. She needed to see Athan, she needed to get as far away as possible from everything that represented her human life, including Marcus. She grabbed her bag quickly and ran off, still hearing her friend's screams and cries. Once outside, she concentrated on her vampire and the bond that bound them, she needed him to feel her and come to her rescue. Athan, please, she sobbed, sure it was working when something inside her stirred, Athan's feelings responding to her state. She waited a few minutes for him to arrive, but he never showed up. Despite her being shattered inside, Athan never showed up. She reluctantly released the body of her fifth victim of the night. Not only had her best friend yelled her out of her house, but her destinied one ignored her cry for help. Definitely in her past life, she was some kind of kitten killer, because otherwise he couldn't explain her bad luck. Anyway, what could she do? She had to tell Minerva the truth, she would end up finding out one way or another. Now she could only hope that when she told Nix about it, he would react in a better way. How do you feel? She heard Marcus behind her and sniffed the delicious scent he gave off. Only a few days had passed since their last meeting, but she had missed him terribly. She spun around as fast as she could and stared at him with a gawky smile. Marcus would always be her weakness. Come here, he asked as she released the inert corpse and the two fused into a warm embrace. Without the slightest difficulty she heard him take a great breath of air, filling his lungs with his own scent. She smiled. Where have you been all this time? There was a problem in the pack, something serious, but it's controlled now. How have you been my little hybrid? He asked as he released her from the tight hug, but they did not separate, but kept their positions closely. I see you've been busy. He pointed to the pile of corpses with his eyes. Ruby looked at the ground, saddened. Her friend considered her a monster, her best friend, and she, without knowing how to react to such an emotional blow, was going to behave as one, letting herself be carried away by her dark instincts. When she had a cool head, the simple act of hurting someone made her gag, but with her blood boiling trough her system all he could wish for was to end a life. Fortunately, Marcus understood. He knew he couldn't expect entirely wolfish behavior in her destiny, as he had to put up with her dark tendencies as well. Hey. He held her chin and looked up to meet her eyes. Tell me what happened to you to make you act like this. I told Minerva everything thinking that she was going to support me since we have been best friends since we were born. She smiled wistfully, but apparently I only scared her. She called me a monster, you know? She felt her eyes turn both colors and then close them tightly. She awkwardly pulled away from Marcus and stood in front of him at a distance. Do you know what is the worst? She is right. I'm a monster. Not only for the normal, but also for the supernatural world. She screamed in despair. Besides, Ethan didn't show up, Marcus. 
He didn't show up when I needed him most. I knew he would walk away after the nightmares, it was to be expected. Stop it Ruby, you're not a monster, he tried to get closer to comfort her but it was of little use. He was surprised by the vampire's behavior, but he wouldn't get hung up on it, he cared more about getting the dark thoughts out of his hybrid's mind. You are not what you think. You think you're a fucking freak but you're not, you're a beautiful powerful hybrid, who when she learns to control her powers will be invincible, the best creation in the entire fucking world. The only thing that makes you believe that you are monstrous, is the fact that you drink from humans, but that is because of your dark instincts, it is not you. You are nothing beyond a good person, you are not what you think. Yes I am, you only say that because we are linked. She was screaming more and more angrily. Her eyes were already corrupted by both colors, but she cared little, they were just in an alley behind an old bar, no one would find them there. She fell to the ground and hugged herself. I'm a monster, even for my best friend. A monster like me doesn't have any friends, he doesn't have a partner either. Tears fell down her cheeks. Ruby please, he managed to say after a few moments. The hybrid's last sentence had hit him with the force of a truck, I'm sure Ethan had a reason to disappear. His reason is that he doesn't want to have a hybrid as troublesome his soulmate. Both beings, the hybrid and the werewolf, heard footsteps approaching them with speed. The wolf inhaled heavily and tensed completely. Ruby, I know you're very sad but we have to go. Now. He lifted her off the ground and found she could barely stand, so he carried her onto his shoulder. Damn girl, help me out here. He exclaimed desperately when he saw that the hybrid was not helping at all, not even to keep a firm grip on his shoulder, causing Marcus to have to be holding her so that she does not fall to the ground. Stop, I'm sleepy, she murmured drowsily. But that was impossible. Of course she could sleep as a hybrid, but she could never be sleepy. If she wanted to sleep, she would lie on the bed and close her eyes, end of story. Her body shouldn't ask her to sleep. Hey! Shouts from two men were heard behind them. Marcus spun on his heel and found two men, armed to the teeth and dressed in black. They began to whisper among themselves, then the wolf sharpened his hearing. There are the bled humans, said the one who he thought was the oldest. Why is he carrying her? Is he human? Is he a vampire? Why don't they run away? The one who appeared to be the youngest asked so many questions that it made him dizzy. They were hunters and they were beginning to approach, he backed up until he hit the wall. The alley had no way out. Ruby, he whispered, wake up now really? This is not the time to sleep. He couldn't fight both hunters and protect his hybrid at the same time. If he were alone maybe he could get out alive, not unscathed, but alive. The hunters advanced to such an extent that the light from a lantern illuminated them dimly. One of them, the tallest and the one Marcus thought was the oldest, had black hair, as were his eyes, and a look as cold and hard as steel. The other had very light blonde hair, with greenish amber eyes, and his gaze radiated self-confidence but leave no doubt, it was more than clear that he was a beginner, maybe he had been hunting for two or three years, he was a novice. Marcus did have hope to get Ruby out alive. He didn't know if he would survive, but maybe and just maybe Ruby would make it out alive. 16 Bloodbath The werewolf shook the hybrid once more, his mind spinning hundreds of times, trying to come up with a logical explanation. Why didn't she wake up? Why was she in such a deep sleep? It was impossible for her supernatural body to ask her to rest, and no answer came to his mind, so he filed his doubts deep in his mind, to begin to devise a way to escape alive with Ruby on his shoulder. The hunters were getting closer and closer. To his right five corpses were piled up on top of each other, they would have no excuses, they would both be seen as murderers, hunters don't axe, they just act. Although as much as he tried to hide it, Marcus noticed that the blonde hunter was nervous, his racing heart and scent of bitter anticipation revealed the truth. However, the dark-haired one exuded dislike and assurance, he was evidently a very experienced and confident hunter, one who would be very difficult to fight with his loved one on top. Ruby. He whispered. If she only woke up, everything would be easier, and they could even make it out alive. 
but maybe it was better that she was asleep. They could not reveal their nature to the hunters, because they would lose their only advantage against them, since he doubted that any of their weapons would be as useful if they didn't know what species they belonged to. He struggled to remember all his defense and attack movements, but they would be useless anyways, he could do nothing with Ruby on his shoulder. In addition, it was neither his destiny whose life W.S. at stake, someone he cared more for than himself. So, shall we attack? He heard the blonde without the need to deepen his hearing, they were so close that it was not necessary. Come on Ruby, don't do this to me, he asked once more under his breath giving her subtle slaps on the cheek. He only got stammering in response. Jacob, the blonde insisted again, to which Marcus rolled his eyes when he heard him despite his nerves. What are we going to? Silence, he abruptly silenced him, raising his hand. His dark eyes sparkled with curiosity, one the werewolf detested. This is interesting. The girl he's holding is unconscious, but I don't think she's human since he's trying to save her from us. Let's see how that works, he laughed. Suddenly Marcus recognized who they were, or at least who the blonde was, as he saw him that day at his hybrid's high school, chatting with her since apparently they were best friends. If he wasn't wrong, it was the blonde with a strange nickname, who, if he wasn't wrong again, wasn't aware of Ruby's new situation, and he was sure this would be the worst way to find out. Not knowing what else to do, he chose to show his yellow eyes and let out a deep growl. For a few seconds he succeeded in his task of intimidating them, as both men took a step back, upset at his change in behavior. Furthermore, his growl was so throaty and deep that it caused the windows behind them to crack. Although unfortunately the effect did not last as long as desired, since it was impossible to remain threatening when he had a fainted girl on his shoulder. He glanced behind him, sideways so as not to take the hunters out of sight, and stared at the wall that closed off the street, hoping he could step over it, but no. Not with Ruby on top. He heard the weapons being loaded. They weren't going to end well, he couldn't allow them to harm Ruby. He hadn't seen Ruby all day and all thanks to his father, Arthur. He prisoned, in the basement of his own mansion, chained to the wall with silver handcuffs that burned the skin of his wrist, keeping him weak so as not to escape from the chains. Arthur was determined not to allow his son to ruin everything by seeing Ruby and worsening the spell, risking that one of them would end up dead. A few hours ago he felt his hybrid calling him, being able to perfectly notice her overwhelming sadness and desolation. It was there that he went mad and smashed the chains, and when his father wanted to stop him, he wounded him. He bitterly recalled the situation, before his father was forced to weaken him further. She won't be able to kill me, father. I have been alive for more than a thousand years because of the hatred I have inside me. He screamed angrily. His red eyes quickly appeared, and in a rage, he tossed all the books that were sitting comfortably on the older vampire's desk. What can a rookie do to me? She barely reached three months after being converted. No, 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 he denied as he gathered up the books, patient but serious. She's not just any rookie son, and you know it. No. I don't know it. He replied, finding himself unable to compose himself. Why don't you explain it to me? Since you're so, so smart. He scoffed, choosing to fold his arms and lean against the wall. Arthur grimaced, but immediately regained his smile. Follow me, he asked, and without further ado they headed for the basement. Ethan followed behind him without making a sound, like an obedient ghost, while he, inside, repeated over and over again that he would go to hell for having deceived him. Once he reached the area where he was tethering his enemies, he turned to his son. So, where are the answers to why I can't see my own soulmate? First in Maine, he replied, moving at his incredible speed to grab the chains and close them around Athan's wrists, who, realizing the situation, tried to bite him as he yelled at him. She is a hybrid. What does that mean? It means that she has the power of not one, but two species and two of the most powerful. Lichens aren't the most powerful, he interrupted, spitting on the floor sarcastically. They're powerful, but nowhere near the most powerful. Seeing his father's annoyed expression, he smiled for the first time so far this day. You're right, it could be worse. You're lucky your dear hybrid isn't a demon, 
he thought aloud to what Athan hissed, showing his dark side and pulling hard on the chains, making himself bleed. She could never be a demon, don't even comper her to those things, he determined, slowly yielding to his confinement. The chains burned so much that he was already smelling the very scent of his burned flesh. Let me out. Second, he continued his enumeration, ignoring him once more. She may be a rookie but believe me when I tell you that she may double you in strength soon, he explained, trying to maintain patience at all times, for the sake of his creation. And even if she doesn't manage to harm you, she could go as far as to harm herself. Ethan blew the air out of his lungs, somewhat surprised at the realization. So if she can't kill me, will she kill herself? In case I spend a lot of time with you, it is what would eventually happen, he admitted, hurt. Fuck. Okay. He fell to the ground, with both arms above his head being supported by the silver. I'll stay here. He had been in that basement all day, ignoring the burning of the chains, just as he was slowly fading away due to the little blood in his system. He would not get dry, for Arthur would never allow it. He began to close his eyes, letting himself be carried away by fatigue, he tried hard to resist, because he could lose consciousness, and at that time his body begged him to shut down. Suddenly he felt a pang in his chest, similar to that same morning but much more painful. It was as if they were setting his heart on fire, burning him with something more powerful than silver. This time his hybrid needed him, and neither the chains nor the lack of blood would keep him locked up, because this time she seriously needed him. Ruby. He muttered, somewhat lost and desperate. He began to tug on his chains, determined not to waste any more time, fighting his own flesh to rip the metal from the wall. He screamed in pain, feeling more the pang that grew unintentionally in his chest than the very flesh of his wrist, threatening to give way and lose them. Arthur he called out to him, his throat tearing with thirst and exertion, even though he knew it was useless. A few hours ago Arthur had gone to meet the powerful witch Demasia to reverse the spell, he was not at the mansion to free him. Without breath or strength he forced the chain once more, his skin complained, resentful at the constant tugging but he ignored it. Thinking of Ruby and all the moments they lived together, and the ones they had yet to live, gave him strength. Thinking of Ruby injured. That was something else because with a bestial growl both chains jumped off the wall, raising a dense cloud of plaster and drops of blood, from what little he had left. He got up dizzy, but determined from the ground and headed without hesitation to the exit, running as fast as his body allowed him. His head was spinning, he could barely discern, and he could clearly hear the chain rattling against the ground. He did not care about anything, he did not feel the burning of the silver, nor the burning of his throat crying out for human blood, he only felt the pang in his chest that was now spreading through his stomach, demanding her presence. Nothing else mattered to him if Ruby was hurt, because that former mundane human, who he believed he would use as some kind of toy to torture Phoenix Hammond, had become his whole life, his entire world, and he would never allow something bad to happen to her. Once outside his mansion, he closed his eyes for a few seconds, concentrating exclusively on the scent of his destiny, which did not cost him at all to find after just a few minutes running. But feeling scent of that disgusting wolf. That really infuriated him. You son of a bitch, you're not spared from this one, you fucking dog, he promised, clenching his jaw as he believed his hybrid's distress was caused by Marcus and not by expert hunters. He ran at full speed, passing by the side of the humans who believed that it was a strong breeze that took them by surprise, it would never occur to them that it was a dark and sadistic vampire, desperate to save the love of his life. Ethan smiled as he got closer, a crooked smile but frightening because the stitches were still in his chest and stomach, twisting his organs as they told him that something was wrong with his soulmate. And he would be in charge of killing whoever causes his love pain. Finally he arrived, and pushed away to the depths of his being all the fatigue that wanted to cover him with its heavy blanket. In front of him he saw two men dressed in black and armed to the teeth, while they rounded up a large man carrying a small woman on his shoulder. Marcus and Ruby, he thought, enraged. Without giving it much thought, he took the chain that still clung to his fucked up wrists, wincing at the pain and the sound of her skin burning against the silver. He was too weakened to risk being hurt by those hunters, so he would use the very chain as a weapon. 
He sidled up close enough to the hunters, and completely taken by surprise, was startled to recognize them. It was Phoenix himself, the hunter boy he orphaned, Damon's brother, one of the vampires from his father's nest. Next to the orphan was his adoptive father, Jacob. If possible, he would be even more enraged when he realized that Ruby's supposed best friend was willing to kill her, as with the werewolf, he did not care if he died, but Ruby would care if he let him die, so he was responsible for both. Being so proud is a sin, don't you know? He broke the tense silence, and both hunters turned on their ankles, too surprised to see a third supernatural being. Ethan watched them with his red eyes and filled with thirst and anger, along with his long fangs almost dripping from his lips. Small towers of smoke rose from the palms of his hands as he held the chain. Believing that you can harm my partner is paid for with death, he added, and without further ado he launched into the attack. It was all or nothing. He kicked Jacob hard, sending him flying, seeing him fall more than ten meters away. He was the most experienced and therefore dangerous. Taking him out of combat first was the most rational decision he could come up with between so much anger and instinct. He turned his neck and faced the shocked blonde who evidently recognized him. What's wrong? Are you seeing the monster from your nightmares? He inquired, snatching the pistol from his hands by whipping it with the chain. The gun fell at his feet and he kicked it away as far as possible. Say hello to your parents, for me. He took a step forward, simultaneously punching him in the center of his face, using the chain on his knuckles to cause more damage. He watched him fall to the ground, looking out of combat, and spun at a sideways movement. Jacob was in front of him, drops of blood running down his face. He watched in slow motion as he tried to kick him between the ribs, but he dodged it immediately and began to hit him with the chain, hearing the pleasant click of his bones as they broke after several impacts. He was so engrossed in hitting him over and over again that he didn't notice the blonde at his back, carrying a longbow, until it was too late, an arrow slammed into his back, piercing him completely. He delivered the final knockout blow to Jacob, watching him fall to, at best, never getting back up. The arrow's tip poked out of his chest, dripping his own blood. The blonde's face of victory made him want to rip off his head, the stupid hunter was proud of having hurt him, as if a paltry arrow were enough to kill him. He laughed in a fake and hoarse way, shaking his head, and proceeded to slowly pull the arrow out. The sound of his flesh separating filled the alley. With every second the pride was fading from Phoenix, being replaced by insecurity and then horror. Oh fuck. He snapped the arrow in half, flinging the blunt end to the ground. You'll have to do a lot more than that to kill me. He took advantage of the disbelief in Phoenix and would have killed him by ripping off his head had he not heard the sound of a pistol charging, so he simply delivered another kick to the ribs. He sent him as far as he could, being surprised at his own resistance, as he believed that being so weakened, he could barely have forced to kick. He faced the more experienced hunter, watching him sprawled on the ground, unable to move from his severe blows, but keeping the silver bullet pistol firmly held between his fingers. He felt a kind of adrenaline rush. He laughed loudly and shrugged. Do you really think that can kill me? Actually, I do. The silver bullets would end his existence in just a blink if they reached his heart, more so now that he was more weakened than ever, but he spotted the werewolf behind the hunter, crouching like an animal. Its eyes were bright yellow, its claws exposed, its long fangs and its furry body. Now. He yelled at Marcus, who didn't wait to attack, biting Jacob's neck at the jugular, but the hunter was faster and managed to fire. Ethan staggered, confused for a few seconds. He felt his blood emanate from the a-hole at the level of his heart. Unable to control it, he took a few steps back. The chain fell at his feet, and this time his world just wasn't spinning, but the whole fucking galaxy. Is this what dying feels like? He scanned the alley, searching for those blue eyes that would bring him back to life, or at least let him enjoy the few minutes he had left. Where is she? His voice barely managed to ring out. Thick black veins began to form paths throughout his entire body, and his eyes lost their reddish hue. He heard Marcus stop hurting the hunter, abandoning the corpse to look at him, undecided, almost as if she was debating helping him or watching him die. Athan. This time he did listen to his ruby. 
He spun just in time to watch her run towards him, tears streaming down her eyes, and it was there that he allowed himself to fall to his knees, completely wrecked. Blood continued to flow from his chest, forming a bloody river down his torso and then to the ground. It was a lot of blood. What the fuck they done? Why did you let them hurt you lick this, Ethan? The questions reached his ears, but he couldn't understand them. It sounded like Ruby was speaking to him in a language he didn't know, and he knew many, if not all. Marcus. He's bleeding to death, we have to do something? His eyes began to close without his consent, but before doing so, he examined her once more, sounding a satisfied sigh at the sight of her, unharmed. The important thing is that you're okay, my love, he admitted, barely reaching to brush her cheek with his blood-covered palm. It is that I have arrived on time, and that nothing happened to you. I am sorry I did not come to your call today, I thought I was protecting you from your nightmares. No no, it's all right, Ethan. Don't close your eyes, stay with me. You will be fine, everything is gonna be fine, she sobbed, clinging as close to him as possible, watching as the dark veins took over his body. I'm not angry, but I will be if you give in, if you allow yourself to leave me. He frowned at her words and shook it confidently. I'll never allow myself to leave you, what are you saying? He snapped, horrified, but realized after a few seconds that he was doing just that, abandoning her when he died. Oh. No, I won't, he promised with a dry laugh and then everything went black. 17 Far From The End Give him time. He'll start drinking. She brought her arm to Ethan's lips, prompting him to drink, but he didn't. His state was too advanced to even consume her blood, so she opted to put him on his back against the ground and part his lips, forcing him to drink. You will leave me bloodless and survive if necessary, or I will stop calling myself Ruby, she growled, helping herself with her own nails to open the wounds on her arms. She remembered how shocked she was when she first saw Ethan making himself bleed because he clenched his fist to hard, she couldn't understand how he could do that without feeling any pain, and how he wasn't even diverted by the sight of blood, and she now totally got it, she has just like him, her emotions for him were stronger than any sort of physical pain, looking him fade away before her, powerless, was all she cared about, and doing whatever it takes to bring him back, dot she did on, t care that it hurt, her anger and frustration were much stronger, she wanted for him to come back so desperately. But regardless, he remained completely still, over a pool of his own blood. Ruby sobbed desperately, and kept opening her wounds as they healed incredibly fast due to her new nature. Ethan, please. Don't leave me. I will be so mad if you do. Please, Ethan. I need you. Don't leave me. I can't do it without you. In that moment, Ruby felt her world falling apart, she was completely shattered inside. She stopped opening her wounds and let herself cry uncontrollably on top of Ethan's body. She couldn't believe someone she met for such a few time could become so important for her to the point where life without him wouldn't make sense anymore. She was broken. She had given up all hope, but just then, amidst the most unreal and painful moment of her life, Dot she could suddenly feel two fangs that prevented her flesh from closing, and the familiar sucking feeling began, sucking her blood like it was the elixir of the gods. She looked down with tears covering her face, meeting her vampire's red eyes staring at her, as thick black veins receded from his body. The two of them were silent, transmitting everything they were feeling through their gazes and their eternal link, which lies beyond this world. Ethan began to pause, so as not to suck too much blood. No, no, she denied, keep going, you have to get stronger, Ethan. His vampire shook his head, struggling to form a sentence. His red eyes stared at her, expressing more emotions than she ever saw in him. Suddenly he felt self-conscious, like a mere human before a deity. I, I'm not, going to weaken you. He tried to move from his place and was about to fall, had it not been for her reflexes once again helping him. Without giving any room for denial, she forced him to keep drinking, and Ethan gave her one of his best crooked smiles. His smile did not last long, as he spotted someone behind her approaching, something that took away his happiness as if he had been slapped. What? She tried to turn her head so she could see who had managed to turn his vampire like this, but Ethan would not allow it. 
Suddenly, her legs stopped touching the ground, and the last thing she heard was a guttural scream that made her bristle to the bone. She woke up feeling like new, having already slept for two whole days, she just didn't know it yet. She barely remembered the last thing she had experienced, only an intense pain that he vowed never to leave her again. She heard footsteps that gave her to understand that two people were approaching the room she was in, which she recognized as his vampires. A little nervous, she sat on the bed and noticed that she was wearing one of Athan's a black t-shirts, and not the clothes she remembered wearing days ago. More confused than before, she saved her place, waiting for whoever was heading into the room. The door was slowly opened and Arthur's head poked out. Can I come in? He asks. Yes, of course. Her S voice was dry from the little use he had given to it, but she ignored it, being careful to cover the nakedness of her legs with the padding of the expensive and comfortable bed. Arthur entered along with a lady who looked like she has gone trough too many experiences, and not exactly pretty ones. She had white hair that was tied up in a disheveled bun, her skin was discolored on only one side of her face, as if it had been burned, and the wrinkles on her body gave Ruby to understand that she must be over sixty. They both got as close as possible to the bed where he was. Ruby, this is Demasia, an incredibly powerful sorceress and a friend of the family. Arthur introduced her, to which Ruby smiled uncomfortably. Hi, she greeted her, feeling intimidated by the wisdom in the woman's eyes. She found a way to remove the spell that was cast on you, he warned, which made Ruby freeze and open our eyes in shock. She had been praying that it would be removed for a long time, she couldn't believe it. She would finally no longer be afraid of her beloved vampire. Are you ready? He asked the witch, who nodded. I'll leave you alone. He smiled and left before Ruby cut him off. Wait. The vampire stopped immediately, turning to face her. Where is Athan? Where he? What happened? All in good time, was the only thing he answered before leaving the room. Demasia gave her a few minutes to process the new information, and once she deemed opportune, she finally opened her mouth. Tell me girl, do you know who cast the spell on you? Feeling the powerful aura emanating from the witch's body, Ruby couldn't help but tell her what she knew, so she replied. Yes, kind of. A few days ago, a little boy named Tristran visited me in what I thought was a dream. He said he was a hybrid between vampire and sorcerer. He put the curse on me so that I would not have any children with Athan since, he said it would be a complete monster. He also said that he would not remove the spell for nothing. Perfect. Just as I thought. In a few hours, everything will go back to normal, dear. She smiled at the surprise. But Marcus, a friend has been looking for a sorcerer who can remove the spell for days, and they all told him that only whoever cast it can undo it. Are you sure it's that simple? She replied, confused. Ha ha ha. Dear. It's a very strong spell, I won't deny it, not everyone can conjure this sort of magic. Those lazy withs probably didn't want to ruin their reputation after they fail, ha ha ha, but don't worry. This will be very easy for someone like me. By the way, you're a lucky girl, being tied to a family as influential and wealthy as Arthur's, and also, in Marcus's case, to the one destined to be the Alpha's successor. You can't go wrong like that. She replied, making Ruby's jaw drop to the floor. So Demasia knew about her two ties. The experienced witch got off the bed and looked for the black bag that was leaning by the door. Say propped it up on the bed and opened it. I'm going to need you to remain calm, can you do that for me, dear? Ruby nodded nervously. W, what will you do? I'll remove the foul spell from you, she murmured with sudden displeasure. She took a long knife out of her bag and Ruby came on guard. Ha ha ha. Calm down little one, relax. It will hurt a bit, but I assure you it will be worth it, and of course it was worth it, it was all worth it if she could be happy with her vampire. Although, where exactly was her vampire? What happened after she revived him? The witch tied her to the head of the bed gently, not wanting to scare her. With the knife she had pulled out a few minutes ago, she began to make cuts into Ruby's body. 
first in her arms, then her legs, and so on until reaching her stomach. She lifted the knife from the skin, then stabbed it hard into her chest, carefully distanced from the heart. Ruby couldn't help but cry out in pain, and began to squirm on the bed, begging for her to stop hurting her. Demasia firmly grasped the handle of the knife, and as she recited words in a language the hybrid did not understand, as a green mist began forming and covering the entire room surrounding her bed. She twisted it in a painful way. Enough, please, she murmured painfully. Tears pooled in her eyes, but she wouldn't cry, for she was doing this for her vampire. We're almost done, darling, she replied quickly and continued reciting the spell. She took a small bottle containing some herbs out of her bag and spilled its contents onto Ruby's open chest wound, who screamed even louder if possible, as her skin burned as if it were being set on fire. It's a very strong spell. I need you to fight it, Ruby, you have to stay strong. Think of your loved one, please, she asked, to which she nodded, determined to follow the instructions as best she could. She thought of when she met him, when he saved her life from the horrible pervs in the dark alley. When she was a weak and simple human. She remembered the night when she had gone to get pizza and found him behind her, cornered her, and kissed her on the neck for the first time, giving her more pleasure than she ever thought possible. When he saved her from the dungeon and cried in front of the wolves, crying for her. When he found her murdering someone, her first victim. When he drank his blood, that blood that was so addictive and made her go crazy. The countless times where he was forced to put aside his responsibilities to go find her and be there for her. When Tristran left and he arrived, he had not been angry with her for being afraid of him, he had always supported her, that day she saw him shedding a tear. She remembered his mouth covered in the blood he sucked from her, the desire she'd had to lick his lips and then kiss him despite her fear of him. She even remembered the worst night of her life, where for a few minutes that seemed eternal, she thought she had lost him. And realized she never suffered so much, and it was because she loved him, she loved him with passion. Afraid of him or not, she always loved him. He was her vampire, and no one could do anything about it. Ethan was hers, and no one would take that away from her. That was when the realization hit her. It really was love what he felt for her, not merely carnal pleasure, not superficiality, but pure deep and selfless love. She screamed once more and saw Demasia smile. She quickly removed the knife from her chest and wiped away the rest of the herbs and blood were on her wounded body. He untied her and spoke. Okay. You are very strong, Ruby. Never forget that. She smiled sweetly at her. She put everything back in her bag and headed for the exit. We're done here. What, so does that mean the spell has been removed? To which the witch nodded with a smile and then continued walking towards the door. Ruby couldn't believe it. Wait, where is Ethan? She asked before seeing her leave, the question left her lips by itself, because even if she had little strength, her lover would always go first. In the next room. Ruby's smile faded and a nostalgic gleam filled her eyes. He ignored the sudden change in the witch's expression and sped off, stumbling a few times, but finally entered the room. There he was. Ethan, asleep on the bed, a little paler than usual. A smile formed on her face but she was spoiled when she remembered. Unless they choose to, vampires don't sleep, Ruby. Desperately, she grabbed a random chair from the room and put it next to the bed. She sat there as she doubted she could stand another minute. She grabbed his hands and felt her eyes crystallize. She never believed that her love for his vampire could be stronger than what she already felt, but there she was, devoid of any negative emotion, realizing how much her love for him was affected due to fear. But now there was only love, one so deep it made her dizzy. Because she could not separate her gaze from his face, she could not not observe the way his thick black lashes covered the edge of his eyes like a thick cloak, she couldn't help but go over the edge of his reddish lips, fantasizing about kissing them. But then reality hit her, he was there but was he really? In that moment she could not stop remembering the feeling of his almost warm blood against sliding trough her fingers that night, nor the burning of the silver bullet that grazed his inert heart, even though he did not remember it explicitly, those feelings were still inside her. She still did not remember the fight, nor the fact that he is responsible for having saved both her life and Marcus's. 
Ethan, what have they done to you? She whispered. He heard Arthur enter the room, so he faced him quickly, standing in front of him in a matter of milliseconds. He seemed upset. She didn't know what was happening, but nothing would stop her love for Ethan now not even his own creator, and if she had to face a vampire who was more than 2,000 years old to be with him, so be it. What happened? She demanded. Her eyes turned red and yellow, but it didn't end up threatening Athan's creator, he wasn't afraid of her. Despite the clear threat, Arthur responded with another question. What's the last thing you remember? I was in an alley, Sahi whispered, feeling a bitter taste in the pit of her stomach as she remembered Marcus, who also suffered because of the spell, she once believed she loved him and Ethan equally. Although now she knew that no matter how much it hurt to accept it, Marcus would never be on the same level as her vampire. I was drinking from humans and Marcus found me. But I don't remember how Ethan ended up involved. Two hunters appeared Ruby, he snapped, hiding his anger that was not directed at the hybrid. Ruby took a deep breath, needing a moment to process it. You lost consciousness because of the spell. It was draining your energy. You couldn't keep up. What? She whispered incredulously. She knew it was going to make it hard for her to be with her vampire, caress him, or even look him in the eye, but she never believed it was literally consuming her. What are you talking about? Sit down, please he asked, as he took a seat in the chair she was previously sitting in, to which Ruby decided to sit on the edge of the bed, brushing her hands against Ethan's leg. It is a miracle that you lasted this much. These spells are designed to last a week at most. You endured it severely, which left you unconscious in the middle of a fight against two hunters, leaving you at the mercy of Marcus. What happened after? She demanded, having swallowed with difficulty. She barely remembered being in the alley, she did not even know if he had a word with the werewolf. Ethan felt that something was wrong. Only that same day I was forced to chain him in the basement so that he would not go in search of you and make your condition worse, but regardless, he came to your rescue without having consumed almost any blood and after having been in silver chains all day. He explained, avoiding eye contact, it's not your fault, she forced herself to say, even though it was a bitter pill. That's the least of it. Anyway, once he got to you, was forced to get rid of the two hunters, who, by the way, you know, they were your best friend and his adoptive father, Ruby. Her world rocked once more, threatening to topple her. Nix? Jacob? Was this what they meant when they went on their hunting trips? She didn't even want to think about it. But despite being incredibly confused, an overwhelming anger began to consume her inside, slowly but surely. Did something happen to them? You're not understanding me, he cursed, getting up from the chair. Shiss. He swallowed hard, trying to keep up, but she didn't remember anything from the night before. Just a strange hot sensation on her fingers and an inconceivable pressure on her chest. Jacob shoot him, a silver bullet entered his chest and he began to dry out. Marcus told me that for a few minutes they thought he was dead, until you lost your mind and ripped the bullet out of his chest and forced him to drink your blood. They almost killed him, Ruby, don't you remember anything? Suddenly all the memories of the last night overwhelmed her without mercy. Ethan, Marcus, he's bleeding to death, we have to do something. The pain, the hot tears rolling down her cheeks, the incessant stitches in her chest, the spitting image of Ethan lying on the floor, covered in blood, his blood. The important thing is that you're okay, my love. It is that I have arrived on time, and that nothing happened to you. I am sorry I did not come to your call today. I thought I was protecting you from your nightmares. I'm not angry, but I will be if you give in, if you allow yourself to leave me. Do not touch me. Stay away from him, you'll spoil his scent. She remembered her anger at Marcus for daring to tell her that Ethan was gone. Please, you said you would not abandon me. Ethan Blackwell, you don't have the right to leave me, not after all the shit you put me through. You can't leave after making me falling in love with you. You are going to live, you will see that I myself will get you out of hell if necessary. 
You'll leave me bloodless and survive if necessary, or I will stop calling myself Ruby. Oh my god, she sobbed, remembering the pain, the despair, all the feelings that gave her no respite, and created the worst minutes of her life. She turned her head, looking at her reclining vampire, who looked almost at peace, I remember everything. As you also remember saving him. I have no words to thank you, Ruby, he honestly gave her a weak smile for the first time. When the wolf called me, I thought that everything was lost, but then I found you, forcing Athan to drink from you, almost all of your blood, and then the blonde hunter trying to finish you off one more time, but of course Athan didn't allow it. What? Where is Nix? She cut him off, startling him. He didn't want to hear it, she didn't want to recall the worst stage of his life. At the hospital, he will be fine. I am not sure if his father survived Marcus's attacks. He's with your friend, the blonde. He replied with a frown, confused by the change in attitude in the hybrid. Good. She got up from the mattress and walked over to her vampire's closet, aware that her own clothes were there, along with many, many more outfits in her own size. How long do you think it will take him to wake up? She asks, picking up a new outfit. Arthur took longer to respond. It's difficult to calculate. I hope it won't be long if you are present, the power of the Your Link is far beyond my understanding. He watched her go to the bathroom, and once she came out in her other outfit, added, Where are you going? Are you going to leave him alone? No. I'll leave him with you until I get back, I won't take long. Ruby, he interposed, grabbing her arm with more force than necessary, thus preventing her from leaving. Don't do anything stupid, nothing that exposes us, because I won't be allow it. I... I don't know if he survived, but if he did. I'm going to murder Jacob myself. Was the only thing she answered before leaving, leaving Arthur with words stuck in his throat, words that he then muttered to his still unconscious son. I see why she's your destiny. She arrived at the hospital in less time than she had planned, having taken Athan's car was a good idea. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and dialed Nix's phone, feeling anger boil inside her chest. Ruby, he answered after two rings. His voice sounded congested, as if she had been crying for the past few minutes. I found out what happened, my mom told me, I'm at the hospital door, what room are you in? Perfect. I'm on my way. Less than two minutes passed, until she found the blonde in his room with a sad and lonely look. Without hesitation, he hugged her tightly, forcing her to suppress the urge to pull away from the man who harmed her soulmate. He was hurt but nothing extreme, just some bruises that would heal in a couple weeks. How is your father? Underscore ah, struggling, he is in the same floor, we can go see him if you want. So he was alive. She just nodded silently and watched as Nick stood up and proceeded to guide him. Ruby's mind was in chaos as she walked D through those halls, wondering what to do with her old best friend. Could she forgive him? It was more than clear that hurting him was not an option. Perhaps she could deter him from the way of the hunters, and push him to live like an ordinary human being. Perhaps if he admitted the truth to her, she could forgive him. We need to talk, Nix, she broke the silence once they stopped in front of a closed door. She could smell Jacob from there, it disgusted her. About what? He inquired, feigning ignorance. You know what, you can't keep pretending you're not what you are, she snapped, uncomfortable and almost let the fury take over. Ah. Come on in. He replied, exhausted, and opened the door to the room. The first thing she saw was the image of Jacob, the man she always saw serious, strong and imposing, lying in a hospital bed, covered in bandages from head to toe and incredibly pale. Dozens of wires were keeping him alive, and he had more than one bag of blood dripping through the IV. At least it would not be difficult to kill him. Although perhaps she would enjoy the challenge more in the future. She might even do it with Athan, although the thought of putting him at risk once again was a bitter pill. Look what Athan has done to him, he pointed at his father, as if it wasn't enough. You know he's not human, Ruby. I know you're smarter than this. I know you know he's not normal. Look how he left him. Look how he left me. 
he exclaimed, lifting his shirt for the first time, showing his entire torso bathed in bruises and cuts. She looked at him, incredulously. How could he step into the victim role, when the two of them sought to harm him? Ethan only did his duty, to defend his soulmate. Nix was speechless and confused. And you, you were the ones who were looking for a fight, armed to the teeth and with a superb attitude that he disliked to the core. Who the fuck are you to determine who lives and who doesn't? Although she couldn't be that hypocritical either. After all, she also murdered humans, but she did it because of the dark nature that comes with being a child of the night, because she was half vampire, and that's her only way of survival. Look how he left him, look how he left me, she repeated with a sarcastic tone, remembering that his vampire didn't hurt him like that. The bites were Marcus's work, but she wouldn't expose him. What about what you did to Athan? Why don't you fucking put yourself in someone else's shoes for once in your life? Why don't you give up your pathetic hunter mentality for a moment? Nix took a few steps back, visibly surprised. He didn't think Ruby knew they were hunters, though after all, he was sure that she knew Athan was a disgusting undead. He is the one who caused all this. We weren't even looking for him. He replied furiously. From the first day he detected the vampire's perfume on Ruby, the night the cops saved her from the three men, he knew chaos would be upon her, but he never thought that in such a short time. He came out of nowhere and attacked us. Do you know why he came out like Thay? This time she took two steps forward, to the point of forcing him to bump his back against the wall. She watched him swallow hard and was delighted to feel his fear tickle her nose. Do you know who you were about to hunt? Silence gripped the room, until Nix broke it, admitting a truth Ruby could never have prepared to receive. Yes. We were about to hunt you down, a hybrid that should never have existed. Her world collapsed, reaching such an extreme that she felt like she was going to faint. Nix stared at her solemnly and pinned her against the wall. One of his hands was hidden behind his back. Minerva came running to me, terrified to the bone, screaming that you were a monster, that you were a werewolf and a vampire, he continued, aware that every word she spoke was creating a hole in Ruby's chest. Why didn't you tell me? We could have looked for some cure, before you consume human blood. You know I can't forgive you for the lives you took. Why didn't you tell me that you were a hunter? After all of these years. She snapped back, but gave up immediately, too exhausted to continue being defensive. He sighed and brought his hands to his head, hiding. I would have, but as you will realize, Minerva wouldn't have taken it well. She cleared her throat and wiped a tear that rolled down her cheek before the blonde saw it. You don't know that, she defended herself, but they both knew it was a lie. A few minutes passed in silence, both deep in thought, until he spoke again. Do you really love him? There are many things you don't know about him. He thought of his brother Damon, the way he was snatched from his arms while his family was murdered. Where could he be? Buried underground? Yes, she did not hesitate to answer. He is my destiny, there is nothing I wouldn't do for his safety and happiness. She moved from her place, ignoring how his former friend's muscles would tense, prepared in case she decided to attack him. I belong to him, Phoenix. His past is dark, Ruby, it's not something you can ignore or deny. You will end up having to fack it, it is only a matter of time. Ethan Blackwell is a very powerful vampire, and everything as powerful is also dangerous. So what? So be it. His past will not us, because we will fight against it. Shit, I don't care if I have to fight all his past enemies at once because I'm not leaving his side. They've already tried. They've already tried to separate me from him, but it's a matter of time before I finish off that son of a bitch myself. Phoenix was still. It seemed like he wasn't even breathing. Her best friend loved the man who had murdered his family. I think you should go, he finished, surprising her. His amber eyes were covered in a layer of water. What? She acts incredulous. That's right, go. If you love Athan, there is no place for me in your life. I want you to leave immediately and never come back. Ruby, undone and broken inside, headed for the door, 
opening it to meet Minerva, who gasped in terror and recoiled until she collided with the hallway wall in horror. Ruby crossed the door, giving Minerva room to enter and hide behind the beefy back of Nyx, who immediately stepped forward in protective mode. Ruby made eye contact with her old best friend, staring at her so hard it gave her chills. Am I still a monster? Because if you think that I am already, you are not ready for what's yet to come, she said, and did not wait for her answer. She headed for his vampire's car, strutting across the hospital hall with her mixed eyes in full display while forcing herself not to cry. She still had two more stops to make before finally going home. She wanted to go to her parents' house to warn them that she would not return, no matter how much they are against it. And finally, she also wanted to visit Marcus to thank him for everything. She had to explain to him that no matter how much her two destined ones meant to her, and even if they both were the owners of her heart, unfortunately Athan would go first. He parked outside her house, sniffing the scent of her parents without the need to get out of the car. Her chest stung with the anxiety of seeing them again after what felt like so long, when it was really only a few days. And the anxiety of saying goodbye to them for an indeterminate time was killing her inside, but it was necessary. She would tell them that she would go live with Ethan, after all they knew her vampire, since the last few months he practically lived with her to feed her every morning. She entered carefully, feeling like a stranger in her own home. She immediately spotted his parents in the kitchen. Her mother was cooking a stew, while her father was reading the newspaper beside her to keep her company. Good morning, she whispered, to which her mother turned immediately and when she saw her, her eyes widened like two inflated balloons about to burst. Ruby, I thought you'd be spending the whole week at Athens, but a call wouldn't hurt every so often. She playfully her on the arm and gave her a short hug, which Ruby took care of turning into a long and deep one. She didn't want to let her go of her because she knew that later she wouldn't be able to do it, who knows for how long. Look who has dared to show up. Her father joined the hug, confused to see his daughter so affectionate but without complaint. Inevitably, a tear rolled down her cheek, thrilled to be in her parents' arms and still moved by the encounter with her former friends. Ruby, what is it? Why are you crying? Her mother broke the embrace, immediately directing her hands to her cheeks, wiping away the single tear. Ethan has asked me to move in with him, she blurted out, realizing that they will need a few minutes to process the information. She noticed that his father was about to say something against it, so she was ahead of him. I know that I am young, that we both are, but nothing you tell me will change my opinion. We want to form a life together, and for that I understand that I must leave my home with my parents," she explained, almost laughing when she said that Ethan was young. You will be able to visit us whenever they want, that's not a problem. She did not resist offering, but she owe knew in a few years they will be forced to fake their death or disappearance, since they would notice that none of them would grow old. Oh, Ruby, you have to give us some time to digest all this, her mother began, forced to take a seat. Her eyes soon became crystalline, an image that made her want to look away from Ruby. I'm not going far, Mom. And neither with a stranger, you love Ethan, you know him, she insisted, crouching down to match her, as did his father who frowned. If you have told us something like this a few months ago, I would have never believed you. He sighed, exhausted. If he was honest, he never believed that Ruby would establish a serious relationship before the age of 30, much less one before the age of 20, and much less one so serious as to live together. So as much as it hurts, he wanted to support her, show her that he was proud. But if that's what you want, I don't see why not. As long as you come to visit us, and we will visit you too, okay? Ruby released all the air from her lungs that she didn't know she was holding, too excited to formulate a logical sentence, so she opted to hug them again for what felt like hours. I just wanted you to know, thank you so much for understanding. I love you very much. I have to go now. I have somewhere to be. She admitted and, after more hugs and promises to see each other often, set off once more to his vampire's car. Ruby, your clothes. She stopped walking when she heard her mother make a logical point. But she knew she had all those beautiful clothes that Ethan had bought for her and that were filling her new closet, so she gave her a crooked smile. 
I'll take care of that later, she replied, not so confident, and before her mom could answer, she got into the vehicle. She started the engine, hearing the familiar roar of it and headed for Marcus's base, nerves gripping her heart. Ruby, I wasn't expecting you, I thought you'd be. When we opened the door, Marcus was unable to hide his surprise. He was wearing training gear, and to make it more apparent that he was indeed training, beads of sweat fell from his temple. He shrugged, his gaze fixed on the ground. You thought I'd be with Ethan, and you're not wrong either, she admitted. Can we talk? It will only take a minute. I know. I know why you came, you don't have to tell me, I feel it, Ruby, he murmured hurt, taking a step forward and closing the door behind him. He didn't see the point of inviting her in when she would be back out in a matter of minutes, least of all, when she was exclusively there to break her heart. Without giving him respite, her eyes filled with tears, reacting to the obvious pain of his destiny that was squeezing his chest, at the height of the noose. You know, it's not easy for me to have you too. I know that I have to choose, we can't pretend that I'll always be able to be in the middle of you too, taking turns on different days of the week as we've been doing. It was hard to find the right words, but there she was, in front of the gigantic werewolf base, facing one of the most beautiful and kind men she ever saw, and breaking his heart. And you've chosen the vampire, he finished his sentence for her with a bitter grin. It's always been him. I'm so sorry, Marcus. She corrected him, feeling the warm drops roll down her cheeks. Irremediably, Marcus wrapped his arms around her, finding himself unable not to react to her pain, despite the fact that he himself was suffering the same. I figured, he admitted, rhythmically stroking her back and letting her feel his scent so he could reassure her. He came into your life earlier. If only it had been me that night. If only, she sobbed, forcing herself to break the hug she wanted so much because she couldn't continue to hope for him, she couldn't be so selfish. Could she? You know I love you, she continued, confessing without further ado. Hearing it, Marcus winced, but it wasn't a physical one. You know that thanks to you I am here, thanks to both. As you also know that I cannot live without you, and neither without Ethan, I need you both in my life, Marcus. I can't live without you. It's like asking a human to stop breathing, you two are my oxygen. Ruby, please stop, he begged with watery eyes, though she knew the wolf would never shed a tear in front of her because he was strong for both of them, he always have been. You know I won't be able to stay here. I have to get away, at least for a while. I can't stay here and see how you make your life next to him, next to a dead man. A gasp escaped her lips, an agonized one, but she understood. Just imagining Marcus with another woman caused her such pain that he wanted to hide underground, let alone imagine that another woman could also be his destiny. I... I understand it, but I need you to come back. Don't abandon me forever, please. You will always be here, she took his hand, forcing him to rest it on her chest, at the level of her heart. He won't get out of there, either. He moved his hand away with a little more force than necessary, and turned his back on her. Right there Ruby noticed that his big strong hands were shaking, as were hers, because they were both experiencing the same near-death pain. Good luck, Runny, I will miss you every day of my existence. She finally reached his vampire's mansion. Throughout the trip she felt lost and disoriented, lost in her unfortunate thoughts, where in all of them the protagonist was the wolf turning his back on her, trembling from the pain. From the pain that she caused him. She got out of the car, maintaining her of catatonic state, and entered, heading without thinking to his vampire's room. She expected to find Ethan unconscious in bed, but he wasn't there. Surprised, feeling how anxiety was beginning to make its presence, she heard the shower water running. She looked into the bathroom, the one where she confessed that she could not live without him, and observed him under the stream of water, looking like a true god. His wounds no longer created a bruise map on his snowy skin, so she took his time to appreciate the incredible power of his vampire, as he had just risen almost from the underworld to take a shower as if nothing had happened. But none of that mattered to her when he looked back at her and didn't feel the overwhelming panic, just a love so strong it took away all the pain, the remnants of last night's terror, 
the doubt of leaving her parents' home, a the thought of Marcus's pain, and even the sadness for losing her best friends, because she would always have him, looking at her with a smile with all his perfect teeth and his dark slanted eyes. She took off all her clothes without thinking twice when she saw how he invited her by raising his eyebrow, and Athan received her with a strong and passionate kiss, surrounding her with his strong arms. Their bodies effortlessly fit together on contact, because it was always the two of them, it was always Athan and Ruby. I suppose I must thank you for having forced me not to dry myself, your voice will resume in my head until the day of my burial, he murmured on her lips. His eyes sparkled under the dim lighting of the bathroom, they did not need any light to shine, just looking at his soulmate was enough. I'm glad you did because now I can be like this with you. She chuckled. If she were human, her cheeks would be red, of that she was sure. I wasn't going to let you leave me, she replied, shrugging and went to take the shampoo bottle, but the strong hand of his vampire prevented her. He took it himself and began to wash her hair gently, spreading affectionate kisses along her neck and back, making her skin crawl. Not after you've fallen in love with me, am I right? He tempted her, admitting that despite being nearly unconscious, he clearly remembered everything her hybrid had said and would never forget it. This old, ancient man, despite all his stupid mistakes managed to make you fall in love, he muttered more to himself than to her, taking her by the waist to incite her to face him, showing a silly smile at all times. Ruby laughed with sheer happiness, giving herself the luxury of gazing across his strengthened body, pausing at each tattoo and each scar, thinking she had all the time in the world to discover the meaning and history of each one. Perhaps Athan did have a dark past that would reach them, one that she will never be able to heal, but perhaps the best thing was not to hide it or heal it, but to know it, from him, to give him an ear and a shoulder where to vent with confidence, show him that she will always be there for him through thick and thin. And in case their past knocks on the door, both will receive it prepared with no secrets involved and ready to fight against it. I missed you so much my dark prince, she admitted, giving him a deep kiss that promised to raise the tone and end all the tenderness of the moment. However, Athan did not allow it to rise in tone by gently breaking it, stroking the back of her neck. Did you think it was my end? He inquired, noticing the train of her thoughts and the way in which they inevitably led to the night in which she almost lost him. That's where you were wrong, little one. I told you that I will never allow myself to leave you, remember? Ruby nodded immediately, to which he smirked, ready to press his lips back against hers. We are nowhere near the end. To be continued. A-T-E-R-N-A-T-E -E -E Ending Part Number 1 What will you do for summer vacation? Nix's question at first surprised her a bit by being so sudden, but she immediately forced herself to smile. I don't know, she admitted honestly. I'm not in a very good mood to say the least, and of course she wasn't. She hasn't seen Athan in months, the last time he saw him was the day he found her in the library, where, crying, he admitted that he knew why she was afraid of him. After that meeting, he never returned, despite the several calls she gave him through their ethereal bond. Strangest of all, is that along with Athan, her fear also evaporated into the air. Tristran never reappeared. Nothing made sense. And what about you? What will you do? I do not know. I think me and Jacob will go spend some time at the beach house. He smiled wistfully. Minerva can't join us unfortunately, I tried to invite her but she said no. He frowned, somewhat confused. Do you know why would she have declined? She opened her mouth, but immediately closed it. It wasn't her truth to admit, Minerva's feelings for him were more evident and strong every day, but apparently the blonde was determined to hide them. I don't know, she lied, concentrating on the road. High school hours were up, and Nix basically forced her to agree to him accompanying her home, claiming they hadn't talked to each other in a long time, but the last thing Ruby wanted was to spend more time with a human, since she hadn't drank for days. Thirst was killing her, and Marcus was busy on a business trip that he couldn't postpone, so he wasn't there to provide her precious soulmate blood. His relationship with the werewolf was going extremely well. Before the trip that separated them, the two of them spent almost every day together, 
Even though Ruby could not leave her disappointment behind, torturing herself whenever she could with the vivid memory of her vampire abandoning her without any notice. The first week Marcus tried to help her find Ethan, despite the two not getting along with each other, but understanding that Ruby would suffer without him. He accompanied her to the vampire's mansion, hoping at the very least to meet Arthur, but it wasn't like that either. The house was abandoned, and a real estate sign glowed at the entrance, stating that the mansion was indeed for sale. Marcus would not be back from his business trip in a week, a week that she would have to face all alone. Yes, she still had Minerva and Nix by her side, but neither knew about her truth, so the feeling of loneliness was always in the pit of her stomach, twisting it painfully. Do you want to come? Nix's offering almost made her lose her balance, but thanks to her good reflexes, she managed to disguise it. I mean, since Minerva doesn't want to. He added, trying to hide the sudden nerves that Ruby sniffed. Of course, why not? She accepted with a smile. Not only would it be the ideal way to remove painful memories of her vampire, but she could also keep herself busy until the return of Marcus, the only one capable of covering up the incessant pain. When are we leaving? I'll pick you up in two hours, he replied with a triumphant smile. Nix? She exclaimed, stunned. With only two hours, she would not get to drink from someone, she would have to travel with his best friend and adoptive father, two humans, by the way, while her throat experienced a sensation similar to the flames of hell consuming it. I need more time. All right, here we are, home sweet home, he pointed out with his eyes, signaling they had already arrived to Ruby's house and shrugged. See you in three hours, okay? Ah, the warm breeze of the sea. Both Nix and Jacob got out of the car to stretch, after more than five hours of driving. Ruby followed suit, secretly scratching her throat. Despite the obvious discomfort gnawing at her inside, she couldn't deny the beauty around her. Everything was tropical, and there was a stunning view of the sea, it was beautiful. What are we going to do now? She walked over to Nix, thinking maybe they should unpack their bags. Would you like to go into the sea? Shouldn't we sort everything out first? She looked at the loaded car, feeling a bit guilty. It'll take care of it. You two go ahead and have fun, it's an order, Jacob anticipated, maintaining a serene expression at all times. Suddenly Ruby felt something behind her, so she turned covertly, but there was nothing but lush vegetation. For some reason she felt that someone was watching them, perhaps it was an animal. She turned to his friend's adoptive father, and found that Jacob was also staring at some point behind him. It did not comfort her at all. Come on, Nix insisted, unaware of the tension in the air, as he stripped off his clothes and ending up in nothing but his bathing suit. I'm not wearing my bikini, she forced herself to shake off the feeling of paranoia, concentrating on enjoying herself, just as the werewolf had asked her to. Before leaving she called him to keep him up to date, as she did at all times. Unlike Ethan, who Ruby was sure would not have allowed her to leave, Marcus was pleased and happy for her. We don't have much hours of sunshine left to find your bikini among all the clothes you brought, Nix complained. Get in with your underwear, he suggested. Ruby shrugged, not minding being in a bra and panties in front of her best friend of all life. Seeing that Jacob was gone, she quickly stripped off her clothes and ran into the sea with Nix on her heels. I'll catch you. He yelled at what she genuinely laughed for the first time in what felt like years. Since Athan's departure, each smile cost us twice to show up, and if she weren't with his wolf it was almost impossible. He grabbed her by the hips and lifted her off the sand, carrying her on his shoulder like a sack. They both laughed as Nix moved from side to side with Ruby on top. The timing was perfect and they both enjoyed it. The blonde-haired man always wanted to ignore the feelings he had towards the beautiful brunette, but it was becoming more and more impossible for him. It was undeniable. He couldn't help but be in love with his best friend. He had really tried to fall out of love, but couldn't. He only had the option to declare his love, but when he found out that Minerva, his other best friend, loved him, everything became more difficult. He was acutely aware that Ruby would now have an excuse to reject him. 
He wasn't an idiot, he noticed the way Minerva looked at him, and the way her cheeks turned red every time they were alone, but decided to turn a blind eye and focus on their friendship. With Ruby everything was different, because he could not ignore his own feelings until they disappear, he already tried for too long. He dispersed his cloud of thoughts and threw himself into the sea with Ruby still in his arms. For several minutes, he forgot everything, literally. It was just him and Ruby in the sea, happy and laughing at everything that happened. He wished the moment would never end, he didn't want to part with her, ever. Without anyone noticing, the sun fell and the moon replaced it. They came out of the dark sea and built a warm fire in the sand, as if it were a movie. Nix brought her a towel so she wouldn't get cold, although if he knew what she really was, he would know that that was impossible. After giving it to her, he told her that he also was cold, and also wanted to cover himself, so they both ended up sharing it, with their bodies held tighter together than it would be comfortable for a normal pair of friends. You brought alcohol, right? She inquired, keeping her gaze fixed on the fire. She was trying not to be uncomfortable at the idea of having their bodies almost glued together, but all she could think of was that she was betraying Marcus in a way. And Ethan. Of course I did, he nodded and with a smile headed toward the cabin at a brisk pace. Once alone, she took the opportunity to examine the area. Since they arrived, she felt a discomfort in her chest, a warning that could not be good. She knew they were not alone, that someone or something followed them from the city. Who's there? She acts, keeping her voice steady despite the tightness. Come out already. After a few minutes where she did not perceive anything else, she was convinced that she was losing her mind and the absence of her two destinies was bringing her to insanity. In addition, she was a hybrid, she could face any being or any danger. She would keep the two humans safe. Finally Nix arrived with two bottles of vodka in his hands and a gigantic smile. How much do you think I can drink? She axed amused as she grabbed one of the bottles and took a sip, gratefully receiving the burning that immediately mimed with the burning of her thirst at the lack of blood. I literally never know. I promise you I'm not drunk, she assured with a crooked smile. And her tone of voice would have convinced the blonde if it hadn't been for the fact that as soon as the words left her mouth, her butt slipped off the trunk they used as a seat, causing her to fall straight into the sand. They both burst into silent laughter, they were too drunk to even profess laughter, but little chokes that made them laugh even more. The fire separated them, located between the two, and both appreciated the warmth it gave them. The star-covered night welcomed them with gratitude, as did the warm weather that enveloped their bodies. Suddenly a silence settled in, silently silencing their laughter. They both stared into each other's eyes through the orange and yellow flames, seeing beyond their eyes and bodies. What do you think Minerva will think? Nix's serious voice threw her at first, and she didn't understand what he meant either. About what? He asked with a frown. In front of her, Nix let out a short sigh and got up from his trunk, walking slowly and unsteadily up to her, sitting awkwardly next to her. The amber of his eyes appropriated her sky blues, to the last bit. Suddenly Ruby forgot how to swallow, as having the addictive scent of human blood so close to her wreaked havoc on her thirsty being. The flames reflected against the shine of her friend's eyes, and she licked her lips almost imperceptibly. That I'm in love with you. Without a doubt, Nix took her by the waist and pulled her closer to him. Their foreheads met gently and they both held their places, waiting for what was to come next. Ruby's mind went into chaos, considering the possibilities and possible outcomes. Was she about to kiss Nix when he had her second destin at his fingertips? Was she willing to betray the werewolf? Although she didn't consider it treason since they weren't really together, she wasn't ready for a relationship yet, and he knew. Not after Athan's betrayal that burned her chest more than thirst burned her throat. To do it. The word left her lips almost without her consent. The thought of the vampire managed to ignite an almost sick desire in her. A desire for revenge, to show the universe that she did not need Athan Blackwell to be with her. Phoenix's full lips enveloped hers without further ado, deepening his grip on her waist, leaving the mark of his fingers on her for a few seconds 
which would remain for days if she had been human. Their tongues were gladly received, playing with each other, and she took it as input to bring her hands to the blonde strands and tug at them. Suddenly her butt was no longer supported on the trunk, but on the air, being held by the calloused and strong hands of Nyx. Acting without thinking, she wrapped her legs around her friend's hips and tightened her grip, holding his hair even tighter. She smiled when she heard him gasp despite keeping his lips busy on hers. Nyx broke the kiss and began to move down her neck, trailing wet kisses and licks along it, concentrating on the curve of her neck to make sure he created a small but attractive bruise. Ruby allowed herself to give in, enjoying the touch of her slim body against Nyx's stocky hard-working muscles, closing her eyes when she felt the moisture against his skin, and even smiling when she heard the agitated beat of his heart, because she knew it was thanks to her. After a few seconds, he returned to her lips, leaving her neck aside and continued kissing her, with the humans breathing being restless. They continued their kisses in an awkward way as they lay down on the sand, and their clothes began to get in the way. Nyx meekly stripped her of her top, and so as not to be left behind, she directed her hands to the knot of his bathing suit, ready to remove it. It was there, when the human understood, that they were about to enter an area that would have no turning back. Wait wait. He broke the kiss but still held on to her, keeping his own weight in his arms on either side of her face. Are you sure you want this? No. She wasn't even a bit sure. In fact, she knew she shouldn't do it, and that as soon as she meets Marcus again, the guilt would eat her alive. Because she was only doing everything to forget about Ethan, even when she could do so by giving Marcus a chance. I should say no. She thought. Yes. She answered, throwing all of her doubts away from her mind in an instant, and to put the uncertainty behind her, she started a kiss between them again. Wait. Nyx broke the kiss again, hating himself for being so insecure when it came to her, but they had a problem. I have no protection. Ruby swallowed hard. That would be a problem if she had been human, because there were sexual diseases and the enormous probability of getting pregnant, but she was no longer one. Now he was an immortal being incapable of catching any disease, and above all, to conceive a child. I take the pill, she snapped, surprising herself to realize because she really wanted to do it with Nyx, even if only to get Ethan out of her mind for a few minutes, and I don't have any desis. Do you? A smile that seemed too happy for Ruby's answer appeared on Nyx's lips, who denied, sure, and proceeded to resume the kiss. In a matter of seconds they were both stripped of all kinds of clothing, Nyx still on her, kissing every part of her body and Ruby letting herself be carried away by the moment, refusing to think about her vampire, even if it was the only thing she could do. She loved the feeling of his hard erection rubbing against her entrance, it was inevitable not to moan. Finally the moment came, and the moment he introduced it deep inside her, she felt full, genuinely enjoying the contact her best friend provided. Nyx was gentle and slow, trying not to hurt her, even though they both knew Ruby was everything but a virgin. She was a woman who was always enjoyed herself. But this somehow felt different. It felt amazing, it felt real, so tender and passionate. After a few minutes, the movements of both began to be more erratic, desperately seeking pleasure. Their kisses became obstinate, Nyx's breathing became unbalanced, his own gasps escaping his lips uncontrollably until they both managed to climax. Nyx collapsed on her body like dead weight, but it didn't bother her at all. She actually enjoyed it. They were both silent for a few long minutes until he was next to her, both of them lying on their backs, appreciating the stars in the sky. So, he started to say, with her not knowing exactly what he meant. Why did she feel so guilty? For Minerva? For Marcus? Because of Athan? Do you regret it? Nyx watched her with an open heart. She was unable to tell him the truth, although what was even the truth? No. Of course not. She denied, admitting to herself that she was partly unremorseful. She was always fond of him after all. Suddenly he hugged her tightly and helped her up, wrapping her body with the towel they previously shared. Come on, let's sleep under a roof at the very least, he murmured with a weak smile, and they both left the dark beach, leaving the fire to burn itself out. 
If only the feeling of being watched could be removed. She woke up with a terrible headache, which made her laugh since she was dead. How was it possible not to be alive and still have to deal with something that annoying? She linked it to not drinking human blood since long ago. She found a glass of water with an aspirin, along with a little note. For the hangover nix, she read aloud, unable to help but smile. She drank the aspirin along with the water and left the room. She was wearing a red t-shirt that she immediately guessed was his, since she only wore dark clothes. She met Nix in the kitchen, with only a pair of sweatpants covering his nakedness. He was reading a magazine or the newspaper, extremely concentrated. She was prepared to scare him, but he beat her to it. Ruby, I know you're after me. Don't even try it, he growled, amused. He turned, setting the journal on a table and gave her a chaste kiss on the lips, surprising her. Good afternoon. Very good, to be honest, he replied, to which they both laughed. They walked to the dining room, where a tempting breakfast awaited them, or so it looked to the human. Ruby, on the other hand, had to resist nausea at the sight of it. Did you cook this? She acts stunned. Of course I did, now eat, you must be hungry, he replied, never losing his smile, and they both sat down. Ruby forced herself to eat breakfast, suppressing any kind of grimace at all times so as not to raise suspicions. Incredibly, she was not uncomfortable, and the guilt bug seemed to have taken a break, letting her enjoy the moment despite the discomfort that thirst provided. After a few minutes, she broke the silence. What are we going to do tonight? What do you think about going to one of the bars in town? They're only half an hour away by car, and I'm sure Jacob won't mind, he suggested as he took a long sip of his coffee, two bags of exhaustion showing under his eyes, a symptom of last night's strong hangover. Ruby cursed under her breath and pushed away what was left of her nearly full plate. I didn't bring proper clothes, I didn't think there was a town that close much less with bars, she admitted, a little sad. It's okay he was quick to say, ignoring the fact that she barely ate her breakfast as she attributed it to a hangover. Honestly, Ruby didn't look good at all, but it was because she was thirsty, a slight detail that he was unaware of, but whatever it was, he would let her rest. I have to go to town to help Jacob buy the groceries, I can stop by a clothing store and buy you something. I know your clothing size and your taste, I don't think there will any problem. You stay to rest, okay? That would be very nice, she agreed, exhausted. She couldn't risk going out to drink from someone because she didn't know how long it would take for them to come back, but at least she could rest for a couple of hours without the need to pretend that everything was fine. I'll be back in a couple of hours. Don't miss me too much, he joked as he put on a t-shirt and left the house. It had already been more than two hours and Nix was not showing up, and neither was Jacob. Ruby was slightly concerned, but she knew both men were more than capable of taking care of each other. The feeling of being watched never disappeared, but she forced herself to convince herself that she was hallucinating, consequences of having suffered so many supernatural events throughout her short life and, of course, her insatiable thirst. She used the time alone to talk to Marcus and catch up. The werewolf told her that there was little time left for him to return to the city, explaining that the deal he was to make was one of peace with another pack and that it was close to reaching its end. When he asked how things were going with Nix, it was impossible for her not to choke on her own saliva, but despite that, she managed to hide her guilt, narrating that she was having a great time on the beach enjoying the sea. Then came the inevitable time to ask her if she had fed, where she had to repeatedly explain that she was fine, and lie to him, by telling him that she did not feel the overwhelming symptoms of thirst. It took him longer than she thought to leave her alone, but he was able to do so after a few long minutes. Suddenly a series of steps took her out of her reverie and she smiled, as she was getting too bored with her own thoughts, it was about time for the humans to return. She walked quickly towards the main entrance, but did not find what she expected. A tall man with dark brown hair and wide stunning eyes, with a thin beard of a few days, stood in the doorway. He was not an stranger, but one she hadn't seen in months, one who specifically left her when she thought he loved her. Athan. The vampire smiled, but it wasn't one of the smiles she remembered, but a much worse one, a dark one. 
It was then that the smell hit her, the characteristic sweet and manly aroma that made her so addicted in the past. But it was not only that, but a rusty one accompanied it. Blood. She looked at the clothes he was wearing and gasped as she recognized stains of the crimson liquid throughout his clothes, soaking through his shirt, pants, and jacket. Athan. She began to say cautiously, as if it were a wild animal out of control. What have you done? Silence. He touched you, Ruby. I couldn't let it go without doing something about it. He shook his head, his fangs protruded from his lips and his eyes turned red. You are mine, don't you remember? We are destined, forever. He nodded to his right, where a corridor led. Ruby took a few steps forward so she could see what he was pointing at, no matter how much she didn't want to. Something inside her told her that she won't like whatever it is she finds at all. No. No, 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 she began, her gaze fixed on the spot where Nix's head was on the ground, separated from his body and covered in blood. Beneath it, a huge pool of crimson liquid stained the surface, corrupting the white marble tiles. Despite the fact that his eyes were white, his expression showed genuine terror. What the fuck have you done? He took one, two, three, and even four steps toward her. Only one meter separated them, but it felt like so much less. He touched you, Ruby, you know I don't let others touch what belongs to me. He gave a soft laugh, as if the situation was entertaining him. Say it. What do you want me to say? You are a fucking psycho. She snapped, making two fists with her hands at her sides. If only she had her full strength, she could run away or face him. Say you belong to me. He exploded, hitting the wall on its side and smashing it into dozens of small pieces. Ruby shrugged into herself, crying now, heartbroken. All her mind could think of was her friend, the horrible way he died for her stupid mistakes and the werewolf, because she was sure Athan would kill her and she couldn't say goodbye to him. Jacob will get out of the car in a few seconds, say it if you don't want me to kill him too, he threatened. Immediately they both heard the keys click against the lock, and Ruby wanted to die. Phoenix, Ruby? Are you there? Questions rose, digging into her heart and twisting her stomach. Ethan took her from behind, exposing her body towards the entrance where Jacob was beginning to enter, and dug his fangs into her shoulder, in case the threat wasn't enough. She gasped in pain loud enough to alert Jacob and for him to escape. Although she knew he wouldn't. You know I'll finish him off if you don't say the magic words, he whispered in her ear. His breath gave her chills and not a good kind. Ruby, what happened is... Jacob's voice trailed off when he saw his son's head at the end of the hall and Ruby in front of his eyes, tears rolling down her cheeks as well as blood dripping from her shoulder and the powerful vampire holding her from behind. The same vampire who wiped out Phoenix's family so many years ago. You, you, you. No, Ruby yelled desperately. Get out of here, Jacob. She begged, but the human kept his position with one hand on his back, probably taking our gun or a weapon. Tell me what I want and I will not murder him, he insisted, but when he saw that Ruby showed no signs of fulfilling his whim, he released her, and in just a blink he was already holding Jacob from behind, brushing his fangs against his jugular. Say it, say you belong to me or I will slice his neck. No, Ruby, don't say it. Despite the tremor in his voice, Jacob's assurance was unshakable. He knew vampires' nature was to be possessive, and that beyond the reassurance it gave them, it created a contract between them and their slaves. If Ruby said the words to him, she would become his property. He has killed Phoenix Ruby and without him. I don't feel like continuing. My death won't be on you, this is my choice, so don't tell him. I can't, Jacob, she sobbed. I. I, despite wanting to save his life, the words didn't want to come out. She looked into the eyes of the man who used to be her vampire, seeing black patches within the red, what was that? He didn't used to have them before. Time is running out, Ethan urged her, visibly jaded. I. She closed her eyes, as if not seeing him would change something, so she forced herself to open them and stare at Jacob. I belong to you. He heard the breath leave Jacob's lips, relieved, but it didn't last long. In fact, it didn't last at all because Athan took it upon himself to break his promise. 
Thank you. I just wanted to hear that, he muttered and dug his fangs into the hunter's neck brutally, and then ripping his head from his body, just like he did with Phoenix. Jacob fell to the ground with a loud crash, followed by his head, which bounced and slid next to his son's body. No. You said you wouldn't kill him. She screamed uncontrollably, both eyes transformed and fangs threatening to pop out. Her chest stung so badly that it didn't take her long for Marcus's to feel her stress. The werewolf knew something bad was going on, and would soon be looking for her. True, he replied, amused and poorly wiping the blood from his chin. I lied to you. A-T-E-R-N-A-T-E -E -E ending part number two. Where are you taking me? She was inside Athan's car, in the passenger seat. Her hands were tied by a silver chain that despite her wolfish part, she couldn't help but resent the contact. They had been driving for a few hours, and her bond with Marcus would not stop haunting her, letting her know that the werewolf was losing his mind, searching for her even under the rocks. What happened to her old vampire? Who would be able to do something to a vampire as powerful as Athan? Because she was sure of one thing, that he was not her true vampire, the man who cried at the possibility of losing her and learning her fears, the same man who fed her every morning for months, which he tolerated without ever losing his smile, even in the presence of her parents, who did not seem to give him a break. A place where the wolf can't find you, he replied, surprising her since he was mired in the road and seemed to be interested in nothing else. His arms were tense at all times, despite carefully holding the steering wheel, his tendons stuck out, sticking out under the snowy skin. She swallowed hard, weighing her future as he was still alive. Athan had no intention of murdering her, and that terrified her even more. You know Marcus will find me anyway, she found herself struggling to say, defending herself, thinking of the security Marcus made her feel, and the way he cared for her when the vampire seemed to tear her apart from the inside. Ethan didn't seem upset. He shrugged, always showing a lopsided smile, and increased his speed. What do you want me to tell you? That I care what you think? He snapped, to which Ruby resisted the urge to cry. What have they done to you? You are not my vampire. Suddenly the car stopped suddenly, taking her by surprise as the belt choked her neck, wounding her skin. Ethan took her tightly by the chin, forcing her to look into his eyes, those already red with the new rain of black, and he smiled broadly, revealing his extensive fangs. What do you think? He acts sarcastically. They have improved me. He grabbed her by the nape and slammed her face against the car window, knocking her unconscious. Everything in Ruby went dark. Wake up, we don't have all day. Ethan's deep, demanding voice managed to wake her suddenly. She shifted in the seat, ignoring the burning in her wrists, and almost lost consciousness again when she saw that they were no longer in the coast, but in the middle of mountainous terrain. Where we are? She asked reactively, without much thought. Ethan got out of the car and stood in front with his arms crossed. Ruby realized that he was waiting for her to come downstairs, that he wouldn't deign to open the door for her, even though her hands were handcuffed. She swallowed the knot as it dawned on her, no one would find her, not even Marcus. Do you really think I'll tell you? He gave a dry laugh that only made her hair stand on end. Come into the house now. He pushed her, forcing her into the small house, which was far from a home despite the appearance. She entered the hut, Ethan dragging her away, giving her no room to appreciate the coldness of the bare walls or the lack of furniture that indicated that it used to be abandoned. The vampire yanked open one of the many doors and threw her inside, throwing her on the queen bed covered with a dark duvet. Ruby fell on it, not understanding what was happening. She felt weaker than ever. She tried to focus her vision, but it became impossible. She couldn't even appreciate the movements of Athan who in front of her was taking off his clothes. What are you doing? She mumbled, confused. Her throat was so itchy that she was barely able to ask the question. I'm tired of smelling the blonde in you, he replied as he stripped off his last garment, leaving them on the floor as if they were just dirty rags covered in blood. Ruby froze in place, understanding despite the pain Athan's intentions were showing. Clear intentions. No 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 please. You're not like that, she began, 
desperate as she tried to make the task of removing her clothes impossible, but nothing seemed to work. He was stronger than her, and besides, he wasn't thirsty. Let go of me, Athan. She screamed as a last resort, telling herself that the vampire she knew would never have forced her to do something she didn't want, not after all the moments they had lived together. The vampire you knew is deeply buried, my dear, he whispered in her ear, and she could perfectly feel his hot breath that was only heated by Nick's and Jacob's blood that he drank hours ago. Finally she was left wearing nowhere but her underwear, and tears sunning trough her face uncontrollably. Ethan started biting her all off fear her body uncontrollably and wounding her with his fangs so we could see the blood flowing out, he was in ecstasy. She could only cry, thinking of the werewolf and feeling the bond squeeze her chest, because Marcus never stopped feeling his incessant pain, both physical and emotional. At that moment, as in response to Ruby's prayers, Ethan received a phone call. He ignored it at first, but it kept ringing to the point he forced himself to stop and check who was calling him. He immediately changed his expression and frowned th moment he saw who was calling, and left the room without a second thought. And there was Ruby, resting on the bed like a used and useless object, without even bothering to cover her nakedness or to heal the countless bites he took. She did her best to stand, and left the room with a slam of the door. A soft click was all it took for Ruby to understand that the main door was locked, she was Athan's prisoner. Help! She woke up in bed after a few hours, gradually entering the real world and hating herself for having regained consciousness. She wanted to stay in her dreams, imagining herself together with Marcus and the real Athan, traveling back in time to the time where she was happy with her two destinies, except that she didn't know it. The pain in her entire body hit her, letting her know that she possessed dozens of violent bites throughout her entire anatomy, and to make matters worse, less blood as Athan not only bit her, but drank from her. She tried to get up carefully, but a sharp pang in her abdomen stole the air from her lungs, leaving her lying there with her gaze clouded with pain. For a few eternal minutes she was frozen, crying in silence, lamenting for all the events that had happened in the last hours. She couldn't believe her new life, a prisoner of one of her destinies who had disappeared from her life. After trying several times trying to get up, letting out agonized grunts, she accomplished her task and headed towards a small bathroom that was connected to the room. She needed to shower and wash off the scent of the vampire, which with each inhale reminded her of what had happened the night before. She showered quickly, constantly fearing Athan might enter the room, and once she was bathed, she found a set clothes placed over her bed. She did not know if the vampire entered and left it, or if it was someone else. She dressed slowly, trying not to cause herself more pain, and when she finished, she checked her body. She couldn't prevent worry from setting fire to her being, she was not healing. The bites continued on her body, laughing at her weakness and submission. She no longer even had the strength to heal. Why did Athan do that to her? What happened to him to make him behave like this? Did someone induce him into such a state in her time of disappearance? She didn't know it, and the tears didn't give her any respite either, making her feel pathetic. The only comfort she had was the fleeting moments when she felt Marcus looking for her. She supposed that the werewolf was trying hard not to continually send her concern through the bond, since she was hardly feeling it, and she was grateful that despite the situation, he took care not to worry her even more. Suddenly soft knocks sounded against the front door of her room, straining her entire body without any remedy. Her alarms soared through the sky, and she forced herself not to tremble. Can you come in? A manly but familiar voice echoed through the structure, and he recognized it immediately. Arthur. Come in. She warned since she could not open the door, and the friendly vampire leaned out. He looked tired and alert. He entered with surprising speed and immediately closed it behind him without making a sound. Look Ruby, I don't have much time. His words came out rushing, but she managed to understand. She pushed herself up to be close to him, and his arms went around her in a fleeting hug. We both know that Athan has been missing for months, it's not new news. He left to find someone who could remove the curse from you, but he never came back. Until a week ago, but as you may have realized, he is not himself, 
he explained, and Ruby wanted to die when she heard that his vampire changed after he went to find a cure for her nightmares. He tried to comfort herself with the fact that Arthur was there, and he knew Athan wasn't the same, but even he didn't know what had happened. He's acting like he did before he met you, maybe even worse, and I don't know why. You may also have noticed his eyes, they are almost black. Yes. I noticed, she stammered as best she could to let her know he was following him, that she noticed him too. You see, I tried to help him, and that made him stop trusting me. I have to regain his confidence to sort out this mess, but you have to stay alive for him to do it, Ruby, he begged, his eyes wide open. Ruby never saw him lose control before, he always looked so put together, she didn't know how to react. You cannot let him end you. Nor you can decide to end it yourself. W what? I'm not following you. I mean, Ethan is out of himself. He is his past self. If he kills you, he won't be able to go back to normal because you are what changed him, but also the spell, it was never removed, and it is supposed to cause one of two outcomes, he either ends up killed by you. Or he makes you kill yourself. Ruby stared at him, tears once more making a triumphant entrance. What should I do? For now. Survive. All you have to do is survive Athan's past, he replied. He gave her a bottle full of what seemed to be fresh blood. It wasn't much, but it would be enough to let her regain most of her strength. He gave her another short hug and bolted, locking the door behind him. Once alone, Ruby dropped to the ground, closing her arms around her legs and crying inconsolably. Athan's past did catch up with them after all. But as she once promised herself, she would be there to face it. To be continued.